Murder and Marinade, written by Tegan Marr, narrated by Merritt North. Chapter 1 I stood up, stretching the kink from my back, and checked out the display of my handcrafted furniture and display pieces. We'd been loading and unloading for most of the morning, and I was willing to call it good enough for the time being. Let's take a break for a minute and go see how Bobby Sue and Earl are doing. Hunter rolled his eyes, cracking his neck and wiping the sweat from his forehead with his forearm. The late morning sun glinted off the Ferris wheel in the distance behind him, and people hustled all around us, setting up their own booths in preparation for the fair that started the next morning. That sounds great, he said. Maybe they already have something on the grill. In the interest of getting our tent ready for the craft fair, I'd been trying to ignore the mouth-watering sense of barbecued meat and carnival food wafting on the breeze. At his suggestion, my good intentions flew out the window and my stomach rumbled. Our good friends Bobby Sue and Earl owned Bobby Sue's Barbecue, or BSB, as folks had started to call it, and they were competing in a competition over the weekend. While Hunter closed up the trailer, I dropped the sides of the tent, then he slung an arm around me, and we followed our noses to the far end of the fairgrounds where the barbecue competition would take place. Max, I called. We're going up to the BSB truck to grab something to eat and see how Bobby Sue and Earl are doing. You going? Max was my miniature donkey, though there was much more to him than that. I'll touch on that in a bit, but for now, just know that he rarely turns down food and never turns down good scotch. He pushed to his feet from where he'd been sunning himself and shook, then trotted to keep up with us. Of course, I'm coming. I leaned my head on Hunter's shoulder as we walked. Thanks for helping me set everything up. I couldn't have done it without you. Since we'd met, Hunter had stuck around through ten times what most men would have. In the first three months of our relationship, he'd learned witches exist, because I am one, and ghosts are real. Then, as the months progressed, he'd kept not one, but two of my friends, and one of my enemies, out of jail, and he'd embraced the craziness that was my life. I was the first to admit I wasn't always great at showing appreciation, but it wasn't because I didn't feel it. I just had a bad habit of assuming he knew how awesome I thought he was. I was making an effort to remedy that because some things should be vocalized. He wrinkled his nose at me and gave my shoulders a squeeze. It's my pleasure, sweetie. I'm proud of how far you've come in less than a year. I'd opened my upcycling store, reimagined, several months before when I'd gotten an unexpected and desperately needed windfall. Hank Doolittle, Keyhole Lake's crooked sheriff and D-bag extraordinaire, had dropped dead at our annual 4th of July celebration, and the county had returned the excess in taxes that he'd inflated for his own profit for nearly a decade. I also got a hefty reward for solving his murder. At that point, I'd been waitressing for my friend Bobby Sue at her barbecue place. I was struggling just to keep the lights on and put food on the table for my kid sister Shelby and myself— and was driving a beat-up truck that ran on a hope and a prayer. I always hoped it started, and prayed it got me where I was going. I'm a kitchen witch at heart, and happily provided the baked goods for my friend-slash-cousin, Rayanne's coffee shop, but I had zero interest in turning something I loved into something I had to do. So, I'd thought long and hard about what I wanted to be, and decided to combine my passion for saving old furniture and doodads with my love of creating something with my hands, and reimagined was born. I'd finally managed to make enough pieces that I had an inventory, but was hoping that wouldn't be the case by the time the craft fair was over. Bobby Sue and her husband Earl competed in the barbecue portion of the regional fair every year, but I'd always stayed behind and kept the restaurant up and running for them. This year, though, she had a great manager, and I was able to come along. I was pretty torqued just to be there and was looking at it as a combination business venture and vacation. Since Hunter had taken the week off to spin with me, it was a slam dunk in my mind. 
we finally made it to the competition grounds and Bobby Sue's distinctive flag, a grinning, hot pink pig holding a knife and fork, wasn't hard to spot. Earl's beast of a cooker, Susie Q, was bellowing smoke, and Bobby Sue was managing the more mundane task of organizing the food truck. Their son, Justin, was standing on a footstool at a stainless steel counter inside the truck, mixing up another batch of Earl's secret herbs and spices. I don't know what was in there, but the man made the best barbecue I'd ever tasted. Where's Earl? I asked. Bathroom, Justin snickered. He won't use porta potties, so he went up to the main hall. I couldn't blame him for that. Just a few seconds later, Earl came lumbering down the aisle toward us, retying his apron. I peeked under the edge of a piece of foil covering a stainless steel pan, and the delicious smell of the steam pouring out about made me drool. Peeling it back a little more, I was ecstatic to see it was pulled pork. Earl worked his way back to a pan full of raw meat and started pouring his rub over it. He was a big man, with a full beard and arms the size of small trees. But once you got past his scary biker appearance, he was a teddy bear. As long as you were on his good side, anyway. Hey, Earl, Hunter said. Hey, Hunter. Noel? He motioned over his shoulder with his thumb. If and you're hungry, the buns are in the truck. You'll have to ask Bobby Sue where the slaw and beans are, but I'd say the top shelf of the walk-in is a good bet. Just like Earl had built his smoker-slash-grill to best suit his own needs, he'd customized the food truck so it had everything they needed and nothing they didn't. That included a small walk-in fridge in the front with locking shelves that closed during transport to keep it orderly. Bobby Sue dug a key out of her pocket and tossed it to me and I nudged Justin on my way past. Hey, brat, what you doing? I glanced over his shoulder, and he shielded his project with his body and scowled at me. I'm making the rub. You know, you ain't allowed to see what's in it. I rolled my eyes. I know, you'll have to kill me. I scooched his stool in a hair so I could squeeze behind him and was surprised to find little bowls of pre-made slaw and beans when I pulled open the fridge. I shot a questioning glance at Bobby Sue as I grabbed a couple. Her typical method was chow line service out of pans. She shrugged. I decided to mix it up. Lost what amounted to a whole pan of slaw last year because of the darned flies. She pointed with a pair of tongs toward a rack beside Justin's station. There's the buns. Help yourself. She didn't have to tell me twice. I had four sandwiches made in no time flat and grabbed a bottle of Earl's sweet and spicy sauce on my way out. After handing Hunter his, I drizzled the sauce over my meat, then took a huge bite and groaned as the seasoned pork juices and sauce caused a flavor explosion in my mouth. The man was a magician with meat. When's the first competition? I asked. He tipped his head toward a flyer tucked under a bottle of sauce. First thing in the morning, we got a hand in the brisket at nine. I glanced down the schedule. They were going to be busy for the next three days. There were competitions for brisket, ribs, pork butt, steaks, chicken, sausage, burgers, and even beans. There was even a kids' competition. Y'all enter in every one of these? He nodded. Most of them. We gotta, if we want to win the overall. Well, except in the kids' part, but Justin's set to win that one hands down. They'd taken home the championship three out of the last four years, and they weren't planning on leaving empty-handed. Bobby Sue and Earl had adopted Justin several months before, and the kid had settled into the world of barbecue like he was born to it. He'd been talking about this competition for months and was every bit as serious about winning as his new folks were. Hunter looked at the schedule over my shoulder and whistled. Man, you're going to be cooking for three days. Earl shrugged. It ain't as bad as it looks, especially since this one starts on Friday instead of Saturday. We usually pack it all into two days. Lot of downtime with most of it while it cooks. We'll have time aplenty to see everything and take Justin over to the carnival. He glanced at me and grinned. And I'll finally get to see all your fancy-schmancy pieces of furniture and whatnots I've been hearing about. 
I swallowed the last bite of my first sandwich and opened my mouth to respond when a woman's high-pitched scream tore through the air, nearly bursting my eardrums, even though she was nowhere in sight. Hunter transformed instantly from happy vacationer to serious cop and jumped to his feet. We set our plates down and ran in the direction of the shrieks. Whoever she was, she'd taken a couple of breaths but hadn't let up. We rounded the corner to find a middle-aged woman screeching and pointing at a spot a couple of feet to the right of a tent. Hunter and I pushed through the gathering crowd and headed in the direction she was pointing. Before we made it past her, though, she grabbed my sleeve. Don't go back there, she said, gasping for breath. He's, he's dead, she wailed. Hunter had gone on without me, and when I approached, he held his hand out, then turned to me, attempting to block my vision. I peered around him before he could get to me and wished I hadn't. There was a paunchy man with graying hair and a bald spot lying face down in between the tents. Under any other circumstances, it would have been the ten-gallon hat with the huge 80s-style feather band lying next to him that caught my attention, but the wooden-handled barbecue fork sticking out of his back trumped that. Hunter looked at me and heaved a breath. Really? he said as he pulled out his phone and turned back toward the man. My eyebrows shot to my hairline. What? It's not like I did it, I said as I turned my back to the body and did my best to keep people back as he checked for a pulse. He joined me, one hand holding his phone as he gave a brief rundown to who I assumed was the 911 operator. His other arm spread wide, trying to keep the looky-loos back. He flashed his badge, though he had no authority here. Stay back, folks. The police and ambulance are on their way. This is a crime scene. A woman, roughly the size and shape of Big Bird, hustled toward us holding a clipboard. Hunter blocked her path. The bright yellow outfit she was wearing went a long way toward the resemblance. I demand to know what's going on here she said in a high-pitched voice that would have given an outraged school marm a run for her money. Ma'am, Hunter said, taking her by her upper arms. I need you to stand back. I most certainly will not, she said in a nasally voice, shaking him off. I'm Gregoria Stanton. I run this fair and oversee the grounds while it's underway. You'll step aside right now, young man. Ma'am, he started to say as he stepped to the side to block her again. Since she was at least as tall as he was, he didn't block her nearly as well as he had me. She sucked in a breath and pointed. That's Mac Moore, she said, trying to push her way around him. Bobby Sue had caught up to us by then. Huh? she said, glancing around me at the body. Looks like Mac no more to me. Chapter 2 Gregoria Stanton trudged to a nearby picnic table in a daze, and people started paying attention to Hunter's badge as the scuttlebutt started making the rounds. Speculation buzzed through the crowd as folks craned their necks for a better look. Within just a couple minutes, two cruisers and an ambulance pulled between us and the crowd, and a rangy, middle-aged guy with a sweeping mustache stepped out of his cruiser and headed our way. Hunter Woods, Keyhole Lake County Sheriff, Hunter said, holding out his hand. The other man took it. Blaine Scottsdale, Sheriff of... He waved his hand toward the body, then the crowd, and sighed. This mess. What happened? Hunter shook his head as the emergency workers rushed toward Mr. No More. I was pretty sure the name was going to stick. We were at a friend's booth, and we heard a woman scream. We were first here, and this is how we found him. No offense, but did you touch anything? Sheriff Scottsdale asked. None taken, and nope, Hunter said. The other man motioned toward a couple of deputies who were standing beside the other cruiser, looking lost. Murder in those parts was rare, and it was likely that... As young as they looked, this was the first one they'd seen. Tape this whole area off, 
Sheriff Scottsdale told them, and they jumped to work, happy to have something to do. He turned back toward us. Did you see anybody leaving or hear anything besides the scream? No, I said, motioning to the screamer, who had taken a seat at the same table as Gregoria. Just her. She was standing about where your cruisers are, screaming bloody murder. I realized what I'd said a moment too late, as usual. Sorry, I muttered. He pretended he didn't hear it. Anybody know who he is? Bobby Sue stepped up and crossed her arms over her chest. I do. His name's Mac Moore, and he's one of the most miserable old coots the good Lord ever stretched a hide over, and a cheat to boot. A cheat, the sheriff repeated. What do you mean? Bobby cocked an eyebrow at him. I mean he was a cheat. He played favorites. He took bribes. He threw contests. You mean he was a judge, I said, picking up what she was laying down. Oh, well, of course he was a judge, she said, looking at me like I'd lost my senses. Everybody knows that, but the only thing he ever judged was the number of old Benjamins it'd take to buy a contest, and if the man ever had a kind word to say, I sure never heard it. I rubbed a hand over my face. Let's go check on Justin. I said, wanting to get her away from the sheriff before she became prime suspect number one. Justin's just fine, she replied, waving me off. He's back at the truck with Earl. You better make sure, just in case, Hunter said. Sheriff Scottsdale held his hand out. Now, hang on just a second, Mrs. Bobby Sue, she answered, taking his hand. Bobby Sue Baker. Okay, Mrs. Baker. How well did you know Mr. Moore? Well, enough it don't surprise me he's laying there scoured like brisket, she said, and I took a deep breath. But still, she added, just because he deserved it don't make it right somebody up and did it. Gregoria had caught her second wind and pecked the sheriff on the shoulder, making demands in that horrid voice. While he was semi-distracted, I gave him a hasty goodbye, then herded Bobby Sue away, shooting a small smile to Hunter as we left. As soon as we were far enough away that nobody would hear me, I said, You know, telling somebody the murder dude got what was coming to him isn't the best way to keep your name out of the hat. Out of what hat? she asked. The suspect hat, I said, and her mouth puckered. Folks here don't know us from Adam. It's probably a good idea to keep your opinions a little less public, especially considering the guy was spread eagle with a giant fork sticking out of his back. I should have thought of that, she said, a line of worry creasing her brow. She didn't care a whit what the world thought of her and spoke her mind regardless. It was one of her best qualities, as far as I was concerned, but she also had Justin to think of now. I'm sure it's no big deal, I told her, nudging her with my elbow. I was just hoping to get you away before you said whoever did it deserves a medal. She tipped the corners of her mouth up in a small smile. Well, odds are at least even I'd have said it, so thanks. By that time, we'd made it back to their truck. Earl was his typical stoic self. I'm pretty sure Armageddon could happen right around him, and he wouldn't break a sweat. Max lay by his side, scarfing down a couple of brats and some coleslaw. Earl closed the lid to the grill and turned to us, dabbing his forehead with a bandana. So, what was all the ruckus about? Somebody up and stabbed Mac Moore in the back with a barbecue fork, Bobby Sue said. Earl stuffed his bandana back in his pocket and nodded. Bound to happen eventually. Whoever done it deserves a medal. Bobby Sue smirked at me. Told you so. Yeah, I said, wondering how many other people felt that way. You sure did. Chapter 3
There were upwards of 50 teams participating in the cook-off, and each team had at least two members. As far as I could tell, Mac Moore didn't have a single fan among them. The mood around the barbecue tents seemed almost cheerful, especially among the rubbed is better than sauced group. I don't think I ever seen him place a rub over a sauce, Earl said as he loaded more wood into Susie Q. Of course, that don't make no difference to me, but I'm one of the few. It wasn't a problem for him since he swung both ways, but he was the exception rather than the norm. His barbecue was the best I'd ever had either way, so I didn't see the big deal. Learn from my mistakes, though, and don't ever say that out loud at a barbecue competition. Apparently, it's the smoked meat crowd's version of insulting somebody's mama. He rubbed his whiskers, thinking. You ask me, they're barking up the wrong tree, looking at folks that won or lost. Hunter, who was helping Bobby Sue with the awning on the truck, frowned. Then who do you think they should look at? Lots of money up for grabs here. It seems like following the money's the way to go. Maybe so, but they're following the wrong money. Or at least, they're not following all the money. Way I see it, there's two things they ought to be considering when it comes to more. First, we ain't all in it for the money. That's nice, but for most of us, a couple of grand ain't that big a deal when you look at what we put into it. No, we do it for the bragging rights. He waved his tongs toward a truck parked a few spaces down on the next row over. Take me and Jimbo over there, for example. We been doing this for near 20 years now. Some years, he gets lucky and wins, and some years, the chips fall where they should, and I win. He shook his head. The man put cinnamon in his rub for crying out loud. That's for pies, not meat. He snorted as if the idea was ludicrous. Anyhow, he said, laying a few briskets on the rack. The thing is, me and Jimbo got us a long-standing grudge match, but we respect each other. The man knows what he's doing, and when he beats me, I know it was fair and square. However, he said, holding up a finger, there's been some competitions where fellers who don't know hickory from apple made it to the money, and every time they had checkbooks bigger than Susie Q here, and Moore was a judge. Rumor has it, he didn't always follow through, even after getting his money. Man was a shyster and a cheat, plain and simple. I wasn't sure what to say as the implications settled in, because I hadn't considered it from that perspective. But Earl wasn't just a cook. He was an artist of sorts. He took his craft seriously. Looking at it from his perspective, it made sense. Pride was one of the seven deadlies for a reason. Hunter hung the last menu sign on the truck and grabbed a beer out of the cooler, then plopped down in one of the camping chairs. I hate to say it, but I'm glad I'm not the one in the hot seat this time. That man's looking for a needle in a haystack. Bobby Sue twisted the top off her own Bud Light and shook her head. Nope, he's looking for a needle in a stack of needles. Hunter raised a questioning brow as he took a pull off his beer. She's right, Earl said, closing Susie Q's lid and adjusting the vents. Barbecue is a fairly small community. Better than half the teams here, including us, have either been screwed or think they've been screwed by more. And ain't a one of them I'd point to faster than another. Justin, sweaty and smiling, ran up to Bobby Sue. Can me and Billy go see the animals? He said, with all the exuberance of a ten-year-old on an adventure. Billy and I, I automatically corrected. Billy and I, he parroted. Another boy about his age hung back a little, waiting for the answer. They reminded me a little of hummingbirds, hovering midair just long enough to get what they wanted. Bobby Sue glanced at the other boy, then back at Justin. And who, pray tell, is Billy? He lives here, with the carnival, I mean. His mom's the psychic, and his dad runs the games. And where did the two of you meet? Aren't you supposed to be at the Miller's truck hanging out with their boy? Justin hung his head a little. Yes, ma'am, but they had to leave for a while. I was on my way back here and met Billy on the way, and we got a little sidetracked. 
He says there's a llama and goats that fall over like they're playing possum when they're startled over at the petting zoo. Sherry Lynn, a good friend of ours who happened to be enjoying her post-life, popped in, hovering over the other boy. He about jumped out of his skin when she appeared beside him. Hey, he said, smiling at her. You look sort of like my mom. She floated back from him, startled, then narrowed her eyes. You can see me? Despite what pop fiction liked to portray, the living impaired community didn't like to show themselves to strangers unless there was a darned good reason. They didn't want their peace interrupted by a glory-hunting people with silly equipment hanging around with a ton of TV cameras any more than the rest of us did. They showed themselves to folks they trusted, and even then, it required a consensus. "'Course I can see ya,' Billy said, huffing out a breath. "'I don't know why every single ghost I run into is always surprised.' What Justin had said about Billy's mom ran back through my mind— and it clicked. Ah, I said. Your mama's a real psychic. He looked offended. As well, he should have, I supposed. Course she's a real psychic. What'd you think? She was one of them phonies that wears a turban and tells folks they're in terrible danger or something? I deserved that. You have to admit, there are a lot more of them than there are of your mama. I said. He drew his brows together. I reckon you're right. We run into some real loonies on the circuit. No doubt that was the truth. Turning to Sherry, who had inherited her exotic looks from her own gypsy grandmother, Justin said, Sherry Little take us over to see the llamas and stuff, won't you? Sure, she said. As long as it's okay. I've never seen a llama either. She turned to us. I came to talk to y'all, though, and I'm about bursting at the seams to hear if the scuttlebutt that's made it back to Keyhole is true. That's okay, Billy said. You don't have to stay right with us. My mom's tent is close to the zoo. She helps with the animals. We can play with them and maybe get a corn dog while mom sets up her tent. Bobby Sue smiled at Sherry. If you're sure you don't mind, meet his mama, and if you get a good vibe, ask if she minds. She turned to Justin, digging in her pocket for some cash. I want a text every 15 minutes, you hear? He grinned, bouncing on the balls of his feet. Yes, ma'am, I promise. Get then, she said, handing him a tin. Take a picture of the llama for me. She was smiling, and I was glad all over again that fate had seen fit to put Justin in our path. I'll be right back. Sherry Lynn said, holding a finger up to us as the boys tore off in the direction of the carnival. Coralie sent me, and you know she wants details. Coralie was the owner of Keyhole Lake's Beauty Parlor and the president of the town's information dissemination circle. Most people just call it the gossip mill for short. Chapter 4 While Sherry Lynn was gone, I ran back to my tent to make sure everything was all right, then grabbed our extra camp chairs so we didn't have to sit on the coolers. There really wasn't much left to do other than to set out the smaller clocks and accent pieces that I'd made, but that would wait until morning. The atmosphere around the campground was festive, likely because news of the murder either hadn't made the rounds yet, doubtful, or because it had. Nothing brings folks together like the chance to gather more details as events unfold. I was almost back to Bobby Sue's when my phone dinged with an incoming text. Anna May, a good friend of mine who owned an odds and ends shop, wanted to know if I had room for a few of her items in my tent. When she'd first opened her shop, she'd been a little out of focus and had taken the the spaghetti-against-the-wall method. Sure enough, some of it stuck. She'd expected the antique jewelry and knickknacks to be her biggest sellers, but while they did well, it turned out that vintage clothing was her biggest seller. She'd found some old poodle skirts at an estate sale that just needed a little mending, so she fixed them up and sold most of them to a group of gals going to a Halloween party as the cast of Grease. That was a little specialized, but she had to tailor some of the skirts to fit and it didn't take long to make the rounds that, if you were looking for period-specific clothing, Anna Mae was the gal to see. 
Her jewelry did well, too, and she was carving out her niche. I was glad, because she was Hank Doolittle's widow, and her life had been miserable when he was living. It had been almost a year since somebody had done the town a favor by poisoning him, and she had a successful business and a budding new relationship with another dear friend of ours who happened to live in the apartment above my barn, Matt. I told her to bring whatever she had and laughed when she replied they were already on their way with their camper. I figured, worst case scenario, you'd send me packing it all back home. (laughs) You knew I wouldn't. It works out because I have plenty of space and your stuff will add some diversity. I gave her the site number and told her we'd either be there or at the BSB truck and we disconnected. When I made it back to the barbecue truck, Sherry Lynn was already hovering, getting the details. She was making sure she got every one. Otherwise, Coralie would just send her back with any questions. Any updates? I asked, handing Hunter one of the chairs as I snapped mine open. Earl shook his head. Not really. Officials came by just to let us know they'd found another judge and the competition is still a go. Bobby Sue pulled a jug of tea from the fridge and poured me some in a solo cup, then took a seat in her own chair. We did hear that the good Mrs. Moore wasn't getting along so well with her mister, but nobody seems to know why. Somebody heard him arguing in their camper this morning. She waved her hand. You know how that goes, though. They could have been arguing because she forgot to put the ham in the fridge. Or maybe he was having an affair, Sherry Lynn said in a conspiratorial whisper. The memory of him lying face down, his bald spot shining, made me shudder. He'd had roughly the same shape as a fallen penguin. Combine that with the slimy personality, and just the idea of willingly sleeping with him gave me the willies. Bobby Sue apparently had the same thought because she wrinkled her nose. I haven't heard anything about that, but if he was, I can't imagine anybody's going to confess. I sure wouldn't own it. So what were his credentials? Hunter asked, stepping over a sleeping Max. Did he own a restaurant and maybe some competitor would have wanted him dead? Earl snorted. From what I could see, the only thing he was good at was eating. From what I hear, He flunked out of some fancy cooking school and went on to become a critic instead. I reckon it's just like everything. Them that can't, teach. Or in this case, judge. The day had become warm, and I was glad for the tent. Many of the competitors had no shade, and it wasn't long before a few of them joined us. Bobby, Sue, and Earl had quite the group of friends in that circle, and I was surprised to see the camaraderie. I was used to the horse show circuit, and though folks were polite, the competition was often fierce, and folks tended to stick with people from their own barns. It was a nice change of pace. Of course, the talk didn't take long to turn to Mac, Mac Daddy Moore, and there wasn't a person there who had a good thing to say about him. I heard he was about to lose his card, one grizzled older man said, referring to his judge's card. Earl nodded. I'd heard the same. Seems the higher-ups were catching on to what us little folks have known for years. He was dirty. Even if there wasn't money changing hands, he was still pro-marinade. Could have been tough as shoe leather, but if it was soaked and sauced, it didn't matter. It just ain't right to see bad meat win over good. The statement was met with mumbles of agreement, and even I knew enough to concur with that. You know, he had it out with the girl from Meet and Greet, right? A young woman wearing a Porky Pig for President t-shirt said. I had to ask, what's Meet and Greet? All eyes turned to me. Realizing I wasn't officially part of the club, she said, Meet and Greet is an online organization meant to bring the world of barbecue together. You can find teammates, talk about new equipment, arrange competitions, and talk about just about anything barbecue-related. Okay, that made sense. So, who did he get in a fight with? Apparently, the woman said, he was trolling the forums, trying to give advice to folks he favored. The moderators intercepted some messages where he was telling folks privately what the judges of this or that competition looked for. Bobby Sue shrugged a shoulder. 
Not much you can't learn if you do your own research and know the world, but it sure did give a heads up to the noobs who hadn't earned their stripes yet, or to the lazy ones who just ain't got the skill. Sides, she said, that's twisting the spirit of things. I mean, she grinned and looked around. Everybody knows me and Earl got the best barbecue in three states, so we don't have to change it all to kick butt, nor should we. There were a few good-natured whatevers, but it seemed recipes were a point of pride, just like in any other area of cooking. I had my own recipes for pies and my other goodies that I'd worked to improve for years, and I could see why it would be irritating to lose to somebody who jumped online for a cheat sheet to pander to what judges wanted. There was an old haunched man who had sat on a cooler drinking a beer, and he spoke for the first time. That ain't why he was in trouble, he said, and all eyes turned to him. Then why, Earl asked. He wasn't just telling them what the judges like. He gave them recipes, he said. The grizzled guy lifted a brow. So we just said he couldn't cook a marshmallow over a candle. What's it matter if he was trying to set somebody up to fail with something he cobbled together? The old man took a long pull of his beer, then wiped his forehead with a black sweat-crusted bandana. Twarn't his recipe he was spouting, and he wasn't giving it away. Chapter 5 What in the Sam Hill are you talking about? Bobby Sue barked so loud that Max picked up his head, a little wild-eyed. When he realized nobody was being killed, he dropped his nose back to the ground and closed his eyes. Whose recipes were they, and who'd he try to sell them to? Bobby Sue asked, her eyes hard and glittering. The mood in the crowd had gone from festive to fuming, and it wasn't hard to imagine that had the self-appointed Mac Daddy of Barbecue been standing before us, there would have been way more than one barbecue fork sticking out of him, and they wouldn't have been just in his back. The old man took a deep breath and slumped. One of them was mine. There was a collective gasp, as if he'd said his granny had run naked down Main Street, but I didn't understand the big deal until Bobby Sue pulled on my sleeve and whispered, That's Pappy Davis of Pappy's Smoking Pit. That's all she had to say. Pappy's was legendary in our parts. He was a couple counties over from us, but he was carrying on a family tradition that had been around for at least four generations. He was almost a household name, and the fierce way he guarded his family's recipe was just about as famous as his food. He waved them off. It wasn't my main recipe. I don't have that wrote down anywhere. It's all up here. He knocked on his noggin. But it was one of my sauce recipes. Of course it was a sauce recipe, Earl muttered. The girl in the Porky Pig for President shirt asked, How'd he get his hands on it? Pappy shook his head. The only thing he could have done was bribed one of my staff. We don't know which one, but we're stingy with who has access. But you're not sure, said a bald guy, wearing nothing but jean shorts, an apron, and cowboy boots. For those of you who know Bobby Sue... You know she's sharp as a tack, and she'd picked up on the one thing nobody else had. You said one of them was yours? Who else? Pappy shook his head. I don't know everybody. My granddaughter, who's in line to inherit the pit, found it in some forum. Didn't list it by name, but she recognized the ingredients list right down to the quarter teaspoon. Well, did she get a list of the other ingredients? I reckon if yours was there, might be some of the rest of us there, too. Justin, who had slipped back into camp while we weren't paying attention, stepped forward. I don't know any of you yet, but I will. I'm Earl's boy, so I got a stake in this, too. Earl beamed with pride and put his hand on Justin's bony little shoulder. Justin turned to Pappy. 
Do you know the name of the site? If you do, I can find that list faster than you can spit. Pappy nodded and gave it to him. Justin whipped out his cell and started tapping so fast his thumbs were almost a blur. While he was searching, I reached into the cooler. It was five o'clock somewhere, and I was ready for a beer. I got something, he said after just a few minutes. He scrolled through, and his eyes got wide. He glanced toward us. Earl, didn't you say we won the rib competition at the 4th of July cook-off in Keyhole last year? Earl nodded, and Justin frowned. Then, if this is right, they got our Georgia gold recipe. Earl leapt forward to look at the phone. Justin scrolled back up, rereading it. They're listed in order the competitions over the last year. Top three recipes for each division. Some's missing, but there are still a lot. He continued to read, then touched the screen and turned the phone around so everybody could see it. I touched the link for ours, and here's where it directed me. There was a pay page asking for credit card information with instructions that access to the recipe would be granted as soon as payment was made. Unless you want to pay a hundred bucks, there ain't no way of knowing whether it's actually ours or not. He glanced up at Earl, who waved him off. I ain't paying to see my own recipes. His expression was thunderous. Sides, only way he could have got my recipes was to get in my kitchen, and ain't no way that happened. There are more than twenty listed here, Justin said, handing his phone to the nearest person. All sauces. Y'all look and see if any of them are yours. Porky for President spoke again. Wait, there are comments underneath. Spoilers, so to speak. Somebody's posting them so folks can see without paying. She passed the phone on. When somebody growled a couple of minutes later, I assumed another of the recipes was claimed. That's my Cajun sauce down in the comments. The whole thing's listed scripture and verse, said a man with a Mississippi accent. Two others were identified as the phone was passed around, and Earl was the only one who held back his outrage, which was terrifying in and of itself. Okay, so now we know a bunch of us have been had, Pappy said. I bring my recipe books with me to the competitions in case something happens and the team needs them. But what about the rest of you? Bobby Sue puckered her lips, and I tried to figure out a rational explanation. As far as I knew, our recipes weren't written down anywhere except at the store. Even then, they were in the safe. Earl was serious about that. The only reason they were written down at all was in case something happened to him Bobby Sue could carry on. Mr. Cajun Sauce spoke up. How many of you were at the Pit Masters and Pets benefit last fall? Earl Pappy, I know y'all was there. I remember. He turned to the other two who had recognized their recipes, and they both nodded. If you remember, there were break-ins reported, but nothing stolen. What do you reckon the odds are they stole our recipes then? Bobby Sue nodded. Somebody got into our trailer. I had to run the show the first day because Earl was at his mama's for her birthday. She sighed and looked down. I had the recipes with me. Pappy nodded. That explains it then. Moore was a judge. Looks like he robbed us of more than some trophies and bragging rights that time around. Maybe so, Porky Pig Girl said. But this is an anonymous forum. Thinking it, even knowing it, is one thing, but... Proving it is another. Kiddo, the man from Mississippi said, that may be the point. Whoever killed him couldn't prove it, but they sure did stop him from doing it again. Chapter 6 It was astounding to me that somebody would kill over a recipe. But seeing the visceral reactions of those guys when they found theirs had been put out there for all the world to use left no doubt in my mind it was possible. Still, 
stabbing him in the back with a barbecue fork in broad daylight? Ballsy. And stupid. Since the fairgrounds was also used for 4-H camp and fair week, there was a pavilion and a huge fire pit, so the guys built a campfire and just hung out after they put their briskets on to smoke in preparation for the first contest the next morning. There was a great hall where other food contests would take place the next day, and many of those folks joined in, too. That meant there was a ton of bread, pies, cakes, jams, and just about any other food you could imagine. The competitors had all thrown something toward a giant kickoff meal, and the longer the night went on, the more I realized just how serious they were. They ribbed each other over meat that was too salty or tough. I heard a dozen different ways to cook a brisket, all of which were the only right way, depending on who was doing the telling. For a while, the talk turned to Mac Moore and the murder, and it didn't take me long to realize just how many suspects they were actually dealing with. I didn't hear a single kind word said about the man. In fact, Hunter cringed a few times because folks flat out stated they were glad he was dead, or that he got what he had coming to him. A few even said they thought he got off easy. He leaned into me at one point. I've heard at least 20 statements that a judge would consider suspicious enough to issue a warrant, but this is as bad as the Hank debacle. Half the people here have motive, and all of them have the means. You can't arrest them all. Lordy, better him than me. Well, I guess the best case scenario is that it wraps itself up as neatly as Hank's did, except without somebody trying to blow me up. A pang of guilt shot through me as soon as the words left my mouth because Sherry Lynn had died during that investigation. Though she swore her post-life was much better than her life, I was sorry she'd been collateral damage, killed before she even had a chance to turn things around. Matt and Anna Mae got there just in time to eat, and we spent the evening around the campfire. The kids did what kids used to do before video games turned them into couch potatoes, played tag, hide-and-seek, and made s'mores, and we adults kicked up our heels a little, too. Somebody broke out a guitar, and there were half a dozen variations of shine and homemade wine going around, along with beer. What started out as dinner turned into a shindig. One of the best parts was that most of the women were down-to-earth chicks who enjoyed playing as hard as they worked. The only time a manicure was mentioned was when somebody joked about throwing away a whole vat of coleslaw because she'd lopped off the tip of an acrylic into it. I answered a ton of questions about riding a motorcycle and was surprised to learn that many of them rode too, either their own or with their men. I was the only one who rode a sport bike, but that was a minor detail. Talk turned to the competition, and the smack talk began. It was all in good fun, but there was no doubt these folks were serious about it. All fun then, but the next day, the gloves would be off. So, who here has kids competing on Monday? Bobby Sue asked. Justin had been honing his skills for months and was excited when he'd learned that the judge's meat of choice for the kids was steak. That boy might have only been ten, but he cooked a mean ribeye. I was surprised by how many people held up their hands. The boasting began. Oddly enough, there wasn't a single worry or weakness expressed. At rodeos, it was standard to hear, Oh, Mary loves the new horse, but she has problems getting her in the gate. Not with those girls, though. To hear them talk, each of their kids was the next Bobby Flay. After a while, we drifted apart and I found my way back to Hunter. We sat by the fire and talked about everything and nothing and just mingled with whoever happened to be standing next to us at the time. We spent some time people-watching, trying to decide if anybody looked guilty, but nobody wore their I Killed Mac Daddy Moore t-shirt, and I was left to wonder which person I'd talked to that night had murdered a man earlier in the day. Chapter 7 Anna May and I were smart enough to stick to wine, but Hunter and Matt were not. Max had quite a bit of scotch, but to be fair, he was a daily drinker, so what would put me under the table was less than what he had as an after-dinner aperitif. 
That was why, at seven the next morning, when Anna and I were up getting the booth ready to go, and Max had already had breakfast and was deep into his first nap of the day, the guys were still sleeping it off. Aunt Addie, my living-impaired aunt, who'd served as a surrogate mother to me, showed up to help. She'd always been a stickler for how things should be done, but since she'd lost her human form, she'd taken bossiness to a whole new level. Those skirts need to be hung up on that pegboard so some people can see them, and those clocks need batteries in them, she said. Ain't nobody gonna buy a clock without seeing it work. During one of my buying expeditions, I'd come across a barn full of treasures, including old signs. Many of them weren't worth more than 10 or 20 bucks a piece, if that, and I'd had a hard time finding buyers for them as they were. So I did what I do. I'd taken something old and put a new spin on it. I turned a few of them into clocks just for kicks, and before I realized it, I was getting orders for them from everyone from garages to private collectors. Anna Mae and I stood back and considered her suggestion about the dresses. She was, as usual, right, so we made the adjustments. Thankfully, I'd picked up a box of batteries at one of my most recent flea market expeditions and had plenty. By the time Matt staggered out of the trailer wearing dark sunglasses and carrying a huge bottle of orange juice, we had everything ready to go. I slipped on my server apron and handed Anime my extra one. I figured it would be easy enough for somebody to walk off with a cash box, but another thing entirely if they tried to reach a hand into my apron pocket. Folks started trickling through, and we had a few nibbles, but no bites. I'd done a few craft fairs before and knew a lot of people went through on the first day to find items they liked, then came back on the last day to try to get a bargain. Sure enough, I had a couple interested in a set of four bar stools I'd reupholstered and painted with apples. She made a ridiculous offer, and when I countered with something more realistic, he reached for his wallet, but her eyebrows about flew off the top of her forehead. She held out a hand over his wallet and shook her head. Uh, We'll just walk around a bit and think about it. I was a haggler way before I was a business owner. That was my cue to either offer a lower price or let her walk. I considered for a moment. Okay, I'll be here. Enjoy the fare. It was early, and the price she offered was way too low. Anna Mae elbowed me as she walked away. Way to go, girl. Maybe I should let you bargain for me. I smiled. Anna Mae had plenty of money, but she worked hard on her projects. She was also a bit of a people pleaser, so that kind of hamstrung her when it came to haggling. It wasn't for the faint of heart. Something shiny caught my eye in front of her display, and I moved closer to see what it was. A pretty heart-shaped purple crystal on a silver chain was lying on the ground. I picked it up and handed it to her. It was unique, with a tiger's eye in the middle of it. It looked almost like a heart-shaped marble. Thanks, she said. Some lady was just looking at it and a few other pieces, she said. I must have dropped it when I was putting them back. Within another half hour, the weather had gone from pleasant to almost too warm, and I was glad we'd opted to use a tent rather than just set up in the open like many others had done. Hunter finally stepped out of the living quarters, looking like death warmed over. I gave him a kiss on the cheek and almost caught a buzz off the smell of alcohol emanating from his breath. I don't have any hooch, but there's some leftover wine you can have for breakfast, I said, smiling when he turned green. I took pity on him and dug through the cooler for a bottle of vitamin water, then dug four Advil out of my bag and handed them to him. Thanks, he muttered, squinting against the sun. I'm going to grab a shower. You okay out here? Oh, yeah, we're good. Matt, who had already showered and made bacon and eggs on our camp stove, looked like he felt much more human. Clapping Hunter on the back, he said, Morning, man. I saved you some bacon and fried potatoes. I'll have eggs waiting for you when you're done. Despite the fact that he no doubt felt like hammered crap, Hunter's stomach growled. That sounds amazing. I'll be out in a few. 
I'd had more than my share of moonshine mornings and knew exactly how he felt. In fact, that's why I'd skipped out on that part of the revelry the night before. He disappeared back into the trailer just as the barstool guy meandered back to our tent, looking over his shoulder as he went. Glad to see you again, I told him. He glanced into the tent and smiled when he saw that the chairs were still there, then checked over his shoulder again. I assumed he was looking for his wife, because she was nowhere to be seen. Martha's a bit of a spendthrift, he said in a low voice, but she really liked those chairs, and she was admiring that table over there and the butterfly brooch in the case, too. Can you cut me a deal on all of them? Better than what she offered, obviously. Anna May had stepped up to listen and named a price for the jewelry that was fair, considering it was both antique and made with real stones, and I came down some on the chairs, too. He peeled the money off a small roll he had in his pocket, and we shook on it. We brought her car, and there's no way they'll fit. Can I come back tomorrow evening and get them? Sure thing. We'll mark them as sold. I'll be here through Monday. Oh, that's perfect then. If I can't make it tomorrow, it'll be Monday for sure, he said, glancing over his shoulder again. It's a surprise, so if she comes back through asking about them again, can you just tell her they're sold? I smiled. Sure thing. Anna May put the brooch in a little jewelry case and bagged it, then handed it to him. He gave a little salute, thanked us again, and left in the direction he'd come. I divvied up the money with Anna, and we bumped tips. It was the first sale of the day for either of us, and we'd covered the cost of the tent right out of the gate. He was already gone by the time I realized I hadn't even gotten his name. Chapter 8 After wolfing down his breakfast and drinking a couple more bottles of water, Hunter was almost back to himself. Rumors had started trickling through about the murder, and the pretty middle-aged woman running the tent next to us asked if we'd heard anything about it. I didn't want to admit we'd been there, so I just told her we'd heard about it because we had friends who were in the barbecue competition. I wasn't willing to offer up any additional details, though. Isn't it just awful? She said, fluttering a hand to her chest. Do you think the murderer's still here? Are we in danger? She looked over her shoulder like somebody was going to jump from behind one of my bookcases with a lethal grilling tool at any moment. I think we're fine. From what I understand, it was probably a crime of passion rather than a random murder. By all accounts, he wasn't a nice man. Though they have a million possible suspects, I'm not worried about it a bit, and you shouldn't either, I told her. She didn't look convinced. Hunter had overheard the conversation and stepped up beside me. I'm a police officer, ma'am, and I was there when it happened. I worked homicide in Indianapolis before I moved here, and trust me, whoever did that had a specific target, and unless you're a danger to them, you're good. He gave her a smile that was both compassionate and confident, and I could tell she'd fallen victim to it just like I had. She blushed and batted her eyes a little, then handed him a business card from her pocket. Well, I have to say I feel better now that I've heard from an officer with knowledge of the event. If you need any information about the venue, I'm Nancy Ward, and I'm on the board of directors. I made a peach pie and would be glad to help in any way you need me to. I bit my lip and smiled as her gaze focused on his dimple. I bet she would. Glad to be of service, he said, putting his arm around my waist and applying a little pressure to turn. Honey, I think you have somebody interested in your shelving. Though I thought he was just escaping, it turned out there really was somebody looking at the shelving units I'd made out of a couple old curio cabinets I'd found. I elbowed Hunter and grinned. Methinks you have a fan. Blushing, he squeezed me and kissed my temple. Hush, I already have a fan, and she's a handful. I don't need another one. Now, go make some money, woman. I laughed and headed toward the millennial couple checking out my wares. 
She was pointing at the smaller accent pieces hanging on the pegboard and chattering about where they could put them. She had a plate with funnel cake covered in powdered sugar and strawberries, and that's all it took for Max to rouse himself from a sunny spot where he'd been sleeping. A pretty girl and a plate of junk food were just too much for him to resist. Aww, the girl said, bending down to scratch Max behind his ears. Aren't you adorable? He sniffed her plate, and she grinned. Do you like elephant ears, little guy? He gave her the biggest brown-eyed mini donkey eyes you could imagine and blinked, his long, silky eyelashes catching the sunlight. That did it. She ripped off a piece of the strawberry-coated deliciousness and fed it to him. Good Lord, Matt said, shaking his head. There's no way he had that much luck with the ladies when he was a man. Or maybe he did, Hunter replied, arms crossed as he watched. That is, after all, what landed him in his pickle to begin with. Max had been a 16th century noble and had taken an Irish witch as his mistress. She'd been a tad upset when she caught him with his hands on another corset and cursed him into a body she felt more accurately reflected his true self. The young couple in the tent with us ended up buying one of the shelving units, along with a couple of smaller things, and I was feeling pretty good about myself. You're welcome, Max said, flicking his tail and licking powdered sugar off his lips as he walked by. For a what? I asked, brows raised. For softening them up. He trotted back to his spot in the sun, circled, and lay back down. I rolled my eyes, but couldn't really say anything, because even though the only prize his eye was on was the food, chances were good he was right. A few minutes later, Justin came barreling down the aisles between tents, dodging people as he made his way toward us, waving a blue ribbon almost as big as he was. We won the brisket, no? Anime, guys, we won! He was vibrating with excitement and grinning ear to ear. No way, let me see, I said, as we made a fuss over the giant three-tailed ribbon and listened as he gave us a play-by-play. We were worried. He made three, but two of them looked like they might have had just a little too much bark. But when he cut into the third, we knew we were at least in the money. Then he let me carry it up, and I almost tripped. His eyes were wide with the memory of the retelling. Bout gave him a heart attack, but he caught me before I went down. Boy, would that have sucked. But we got it there just under the wire. I knew he'd win. Earl's got the best brisket in the state, and now we got the ribbon to prove it. He pointed to the center tail on the ribbon, where it clearly said, Best Brisket. Yep, Anna Mae said, running her fingers over the gold letters. Says it right there. Okay, I gotta go show Billy. He left us in the dust before we could even say goodbye, and Anna Mae smiled. It sure is good to see him so happy, when I think where he was a year ago. She shivered. We'd rescued Justin from a horrible foster home, and he'd stayed with me at the farm for a while, until Bobby, Sue, and Earl were approved to adopt him. Now, nine months later, you'd never guess he wasn't born to them, and it made my heart happy. He still hung out at the farm at least a day or two a week and was one of the best-hearted kids I'd ever met. Kids are resilient. Anna Mae rearranged some of her items and brought out a few more to fill the empty spots. We both had a good sales day, and I hoped Bobby Sue was having the same luck. She brushed her hands off after arranging a washboard she decorated with ribbons and flowers. I'm super glad we decided to come up, she said. It seems like we haven't spent any time together lately, and Matt was going stir-crazy. Let me guess, the boss man's driving him crazy? She dropped a piece when she was refilling the case, and I bent down to pick it up and handed it to her without really looking at it. Tilting her head, she took the jewelry from me, and I paid closer attention. It was the same piece that had dropped earlier. That's just weird, she said 
putting it back in the case, but higher up, where she couldn't accidentally catch it and pull it out again. So, I said, resuming the conversation. Boss man's being a P-I-T-A? She nodded. Matt kind of created a monster when he suggested they expand into doing new builds instead of just remodels. He had no idea it was going to take off the way it did, and now he feels pressured to step up into a foreman's job. I shook my head. He shouldn't. They knew when he signed on to help them get it back up and running after Max died that he had zero interest in dealing with clients. I'm sure M's fine with that. Emily Wheeler, of Wheeler Construction, had needed somebody to get her company back up and running when her husband Max was murdered. Even though Max had hung around to enjoy post-life with his family, rather than crossing over, at least after he bugged the crap out of us until we solved his murder, he was a lot like Addie. No body meant he had plenty of time to be bossy. Matt was an Iraqi vet who had a nasty case of PTSD, but a head full of valuable information about the construction industry and was as honest as the day is long. He'd agreed to help as a consultant as long as he could remain behind the scenes. She sighed. Yeah, but you know how he is, sugar. He thinks the world sits right square on his shoulders, and it's his responsibility to carry it. I hummed in agreement. He was the same with the farm and with the people in his life. When Gabby, another good friend who'd moved into the farmhouse with us a few months back, had been attacked on the property, he'd blamed himself just because he wasn't there at the time. Work around that, then. If they're making that much money, convince them to hire another foreman. M's son-in-law, Jared, had stepped up to the plate and was willing to run the company, but he didn't have the know-how Matt did so they worked in tandem. Matt was teaching him what he could, and Jared was taking classes and working as the front man when it came time to deal with clients and employees on a more than cursory basis. In other words, they were both stretched thin. Max is fighting doing that because he says it's a waste of money, she said, but they're going to have to, especially since Louise is about to pop. Louise was Jared's wife, M and Max's daughter, and had found out she was pregnant right around the same time her dad was killed. That was another reason he'd chosen to stick around. He wanted to see his first grandbaby. It was great that our extended family was going to extend a little further, but it added a couple of complications. First and foremost, she was Bobby Sue's general manager, Bobby had hired her on when she moved back to Keyhole Lake, and now that she and Earl had adopted Justin, they no longer wanted to spend 12 hours a day, seven days a week, at the restaurant. Fortunately, Sarah, a girl who'd worked there for nearly five years, was a great backup and knew the store inside out. In fact, she'd taken a vacation with her family that week so she could pick up the slack when Louise went on maternity leaving the following week. All the details were ironed out and the plan was in place. There was only one problem. Nobody had bothered to ask the baby if the plan suited him. Chapter 9 By the time we wrapped it up for the day, I was beat but wanted to go to the carnival. We hadn't gone to bed until 2 a.m. because of the party. Then, the day had gotten hot. Anna Mae and I had taken turns going up to see how Bobby Sue and Earl were doing, and they were kicking butt. As the crowds thinned, Anna Mae started pulling her jewelry from her display case. What are you doing? I asked. You're not leaving, are you? She looked at me, surprised. No, but I don't want to leave it out overnight in case somebody gets a case of the sticky fingers. I cocked a brow and humphed. You're kidding, right? I glanced around to make sure we were alone, then twirled a finger at the ties on the tent. The sides slipped into place, obscuring us from view. With a few words, a shimmer settled over everything in the tent, and I smiled. Now, nobody's going to bother anything. It's locked down tight as a drum. They may try, but trust me, there's nothing leaving this tent. As a final measure, I pointed toward each gap in the flaps, running a finger from top to bottom, leaving only one open so we could get out. 
Once we were outside, I said a few words and sealed it, too. She grinned. Fine, Miss Smarty Pants, but what if I need to get something? I motioned toward the flap Vanna White style, and she pulled up the flap easy peasy. I don't get it, she said, her brow knitted. I thought you just locked it. Laughing, I nudged her with my elbow. I did, silly, but only against people who aren't us. It's hard to explain, but it's something Addie taught us as kids because we kept losing our house keys. Instead of locking the door, she just warded the house so that only people who were supposed to be there could get in. Oh, she said, slick. You reckon you could do that to the store? I've lost my keys half a dozen times since I opened up. Sure, sweetie. Just remind me when we get home. Hunter and Matt had been off checking out the car show that was happening on the other end of the grounds, but came around the corner of the tent just as we were gathering our purses from the truck. Hey, handsome, I said, bumping him with my shoulder. How was the car show? Is it worth the walk? Only if you like a ton of old muscle cars and rat rods all in one place, he said, grinning. Oh, then that sounds just terrible. I rolled my eyes. If you don't mind taking a second look, maybe we can check it out tomorrow. Tomorrow will actually be better, because they're bringing more in. Judging is at four. Anna May sighed. I just don't get it. A car is a car. I gasped in fake outrage, and the guys smiled. You hush your mouth and take that back, I told her. She lifted a shoulder and smiled. You're hopeless. I've given up on girlifying you, but you still like ice cream and some chick flicks, so I'll let you keep your girl card another day. Speaking of eating, I said, did you guys fill up on junk, or do you still have room for dinner and funnel cake? Hunter slung an arm around me as we turned toward the carnival. I'll have you know we didn't have any junk food. We had a couple hot dogs. I pinched his ribs. Yeah, those aren't junk at all. You know they're made of chicken lips and pig butts, right? Matt coughed, hiding a laugh. First, they were all beef, so it was probably cow tongues and eyeballs. And second... I was in the army and lived through ranger training, then spent three years in one desert or another. I've seen the day when I would have killed for something that didn't have wiry little legs that were still squirming when I bit into it. Junk food is subjective. How could I possibly argue with that, especially considering I loved a good hot dog, chicken lips and all? Fair enough. Anna May was cringing a little, apparently still stuck on the thought of eating bugs, He squeezed her. What, he said as she shivered. I brushed my teeth. A week later, she laughed and wrinkled her nose. Hmm, he's hot, eats bugs, and brushes his teeth at least once a week. My dream man. Zip it, woman, he said as he leaned down and gave her a quick kiss while we walked. You're lucky to have me. She blushed and leaned into him, her eyes gleaming. Yep, bug breath and all. Hey, you bunch of mannerless heathens, wait for me. I looked back at Max's voice and laughed as he trotted toward us, ears flopping and bouncing every which way. Sorry, dude, Hunter said. We didn't realize you wanted to come. You were out like a light in the trailer. He donkey scowled at us his furry eyebrows creating a ridge over his eyes. Yes. Well, you didn't bother to ask, though, did you? No, leave the donkey behind. I pulled in a deep breath and blew it out. Cut the drama already and let's go. We didn't leave you behind on purpose, and we're sorry we didn't wake you to ask. He humped as he slowed to a walk beside me. I suppose you're forgiven if you buy me a candy apple. Food. I should have known. Of course, we'll buy you a candy apple, I said in an attempt to smooth his feathers. And some of that delicious fried dough the young lady gave me this morning. Fine, I said. But when you're sick, I don't want to hear about it. 
and no scotch if you do the funnel cake. I'm not staying up all night with you because you're colic. Just the candy apple then, he said after a brief pause. Yeah, I figured. We slipped through the rows of closed tents and covered tables, following the scent of cotton candy and fried foods until we came out on the carnival side of the fair. The neon lights were flashing around the rides and games, though it wasn't as bright as it would be in another hour once full night descended. Where first? Anime asked. I want to ride the Ferris wheel. I snorted, eyeballing the giant wheel of death. Knock yourself out. I'm not getting on that thing. Matt gave me a sideways look. You don't like the Ferris wheel? Nope, I said, popping the pea. I'm not sitting six stories in the air in a bucket held onto a spinning wheel by a couple of bolts that were probably tightened or not by some stoned teenager. I had a cousin who dropped out of high school to be a carny worker. The minute he called me while simultaneously smoking a joint and assembling one of the rides, I'd sworn never to ride anything that came off the ground again. Anna May looked at me, amazed. But you ride your motorcycle at a hundred miles an hour. Yes, I do, I said. But I know every inch of that bike. I wear safety gear. I drive it myself. I do regular safety checks. None of those factors apply to anything you see here. So it's a control thing, she said, giving me a knowing glance. I lifted a shoulder. Call it whatever you want to call it. I ain't getting on the Ferris wheel, or that bullet thing, or anything else that can drop me eight stories or sling me into the next county when something breaks loose, I said, casting a wary glance at the topmost swinging bucket. When the controller started it again, the one on the bottom squeaked as it pivoted on its bolts. Hunter shuddered beside me. I knew we shared our distrust of rides, so when he said, you guys go on. I don't want to talk her into anything she doesn't want to do. We'll catch up to you later. I couldn't help but tease him a little. I shook my head and gave him my sweetest smile. Aw, you're so sweet. But I don't want to ruin it for you. Go ride with them if you want. I'll chill with Max. He tried to hide his glare while Anna Mae and Matt waited. No, I'd rather spend the evening with you two. Once they were gone, I gave him a little shove on the shoulder. You hate those things as much as I do. He grinned, I know, but there wasn't any need for both of us to look like a chicken. Well, come on then, man and donkey of mine, I said, looping my arm through his and laying my hand on Max's head. Let's find something fun to do on the ground. Maybe we'll try our hand at a couple of the games, then chow down on some healthy chicken on a stick. For what it's worth, Max said, glaring at a woman who nearly pushed her stroller over him. I wandered out here while you were setting up the tent this morning, and your distrust is well placed. There was a distinct lack of supervision during assembly. I glanced down at him surprised that he hadn't taken the opportunity to rib me. Did you just say I was right? Max, I think it's time for a candy apple. Chapter 10 After losing a buttload of money, Hunter finally won me a multicolored teddy bear, and we decided to check out the petting zoo, since Max had never seen a llama either. It looks like a cross between a donkey and some kind of bird, he said. I suppose I could see that if I tilted my head just right and squinted. When we walked past the fainting goats, Max laughed out loud, which of course came out as a bray and made the goats fall over. That caught the attention of several of the kids who were checking out the other animals, and two little girls of about five rushed up to him. Be nice. I warned when he gave them the stink eye. He wasn't exactly a kid person, not that I could blame him. Look, Mommy, one of them said, putting her cotton candy hands on Max's neck, 
a baby donkey. Her twin sister actually laid her caramel apple on Max's rump before trying to climb on. That was more than enough, especially considering poor Max was gritting his teeth but taking it. I picked up the wannabe cowgirl and set her back several feet from him. Honey, he's with us. He isn't part of the petting zoo. Rushing up to us with a double stroller filled with stuffed toys and half-eaten bags of cotton candy, the frazzled mother apologized and scooped the red-faced future rodeo queen up by the waist. I'm so sorry. Katie, Kimmy, leave the nice lady and her donkey alone. Both girls puckered up and Katie, the one who tried to ride Max, started howling and reaching for her apple, which was now a gooey, hairy mess. Max was glowering at the mother and, in a fit of pique, twisted so that the apple fell to his feet, then proceeded to chomp into it. That sent the kid into a red-faced screaming fit. She stiffened her spine, busting her mom square in the nose with the back of her head. The blood flowed almost as fast as the stream of curses that accompanied the pain of a busted nose, and she reflexively dropped the kid, head first. Before I even knew what I was doing, I flung my hands out to catch the little brat, and the entire place froze except for Max, Hunter, and me. Utter silence surrounded us. Well? Max said, around a mouthful of caramel apple. This is new. Baby, what did you do? Hunter asked. I snapped my attention to him at the tentative note in his voice. I was grateful when his expression reflected confusion rather than fear, because, to be honest, I was terrified. Then I noticed that people weren't exactly frozen. They were just moving super slow. It reminded me of the scene in X-Men, Days of Future Past, when Quicksilver moved so fast he managed to arrange all the bullets and projectiles so nobody was killed. I don't know, I said, watching as a blob of Slurpee floated up out of a cup she'd dropped. Either we're moving super fast, or I slowed down everybody else. Hunter proved once again why I loved him when he shrugged and reached for Katie before she could face plant into the asphalt. There wasn't much I could do about her mom's nose, but I did grab a wad of napkins from a nearby food cart and stuff them in her hand. I shoved it up and put it to her nose so she wouldn't walk around looking like she just killed somebody. Rather than put Katie on her feet, I motioned toward the stroller. In for a penny, in for a pound. We're not going to be able to explain it anyway, and it's not like the woman's not going to go home and drink half a bottle of wine after they're asleep anyway. Or at least I would. We buckled them into the stroller while Max finished the caramel apple, and I muttered a whopper of an anti-anxiety spell over both of the beet-red precious little dolls. Yes, that was sarcasm. In about five seconds, in real time, they should be out like a light. I did it as much for the rest of the people at the fair as I did for the mother. Okay, Hunter said, scooping the Slurpee back into the cup and shoving it into a trash can. He'd tried to toss it, but it just hovered mid-air. Now what? I took a deep breath and chewed my lip, looking at all the fairgoers inching along around me. I honestly don't know. I have no idea how I did it to begin with let alone how to undo it. Movement out of the corner of my eye was accompanied by tinkling laughter. A woman wearing a colorful peasant's dress, a ton of jangly bracelets, and a long flowing skirt strode from a tent not too far away. She bore a resemblance to Sherry Lynn, except the heavy makeup made it hard to determine her real age. She righted a cup of coffee a man had knocked over at a nearby table, then looked at me, her eyes twinkling. You must be Noel, she said, then turned to the guys. And you must be Hunter and Max. I narrowed my eyes at her, wondering if this was some of her hoodoo rather than mine. How do you know our names? 
She flapped a wrist. Not the way you're thinking. I'm Billy's mom. He told me he met a witch with a talking donkey. Then I had a wonderful conversation with Sherry Lynn yesterday. She looked around. Since you've managed to freeze the entire carnival, and the donkey commented about it, it wasn't hard to figure out. Oh, yeah, I said, feeling silly because I hadn't put much thought into the question before I'd suspected her. I'm Serena, she said, holding out her hand. I shook it, but shivered when a little jolt of electricity shot up my arm. She jerked back, too, and rubbed her hand down her skirt. Searching my face for a moment, she said, That's not a typical reaction. There's something special about you. If possible, I was even more freaked out than I had been a couple of minutes ago. Something in her gaze made me feel like she could see my soul. Rubbing her hand, she said, you and I need to talk, I think. But for now, put everything back on track. It's dangerous to mess with time. Hunter stepped up and slipped his arm around me. She didn't mean to. She was just trying to catch the kid, I think, and this happened. He motioned around us. She heaved a deep sigh. Well, whether she meant to or not, she did, and she shouldn't do it again. I threw up my hands, frustrated. I didn't mean the sounds and bustle of the fair erupted around me again, causing me to jump backward into Hunter. Good thing he was half a foot taller and 50, okay, 40 pounds heavier than me, or I would have knocked him over. Serena just smiled and turned back toward her tent, calling over her shoulder, Come see me. The little heathens in the stroller let out a couple final ear-splitting screams, then shoved thumbs in their mouths and crashed. Their poor mama pressed the napkins against her nose and looked from them to me, confused. How? Glancing at the sleeping kids, she said, uh, Never mind. Just, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, thanks. And turned the stroller with one hand and her hip then hustled toward the parking lot. I still had my back pressed to Hunter, and he wrapped his arms around me, giving me a comforting squeeze. So, Max said, does that count as my candy apple? Or can I have another that wasn't gnawed by a brat and rubbed in my hair? Chapter 11 I think maybe talking to Serena is more important than getting you more candy, I said, heading toward her tent. Max trotted along beside me. They're not mutually exclusive. Besides, look at the line. He was right. There were at least ten people lined up waiting for Lady Serena to tell them their fortunes. I turned on my heel, feeling a little discombobulated. On second thought... I said, wobbling a little. I think I need to sit down. Hunter put his arm around my shoulder and led me to a picnic table. Let me get you something to drink, he said, moving toward a food truck a few yards away. He brought us both large, fresh-squeezed lemonade and set mine in front of me. After sucking down a few big gulps of the sweet, tart drink, I regained a little bit of my equilibrium. Better? Much, I said, unwrapping the candy apple he'd gotten for Max. I have no idea what happened. I didn't even know such a thing was possible, let alone that I could do it. He shrugged. I'm not even sure what really happened. Why weren't Max and I affected? You'll know as soon as I do. I tried to think of a single, rational explanation for what had happened, but came up blank. I don't mean to be cynical. But I don't know if it's a good idea for you to talk to this Serena chick. At least, until you've talked to Addie, he said, holding the stick so Max could bite off a chunk of his apple. Max nodded. I agree, he said, around a mouthful. I've seen some crazy magic over the centuries, but I've never seen anybody do what you just did. He chewed thoughtfully. Though, 
It's hard to say whether I have or not, considering it may happen all the time and I just don't know about it. I considered what he meant, looking around at the people surrounding us. They seemed oblivious to what had just happened. But I do agree with what the seer said, though. It's not something you should mess with. You could have just altered the entire timeline, he said. How so? I asked, snorting. No, he's right, Hunter said, rubbing his chin. Look what we did. You gave the woman napkins to staunch the bleeding. You stopped the kid from landing on her head on the asphalt. I moved the Slurpee, which she could have slid in, and we knocked the girls out, thus keeping them from doing any number of things before their mother could have wrangled them all the way back to the car. Plus, they'll sleep all the way home and not distract her while she's driving. I failed to see a single downside until all of the superhero movies I'd ever seen came crashing down on me. The ripple effect. Even the slightest change could affect the world as we know it, if it was the right change. You guys are right. Let's go back to the trailer and find Addie. Max scowled as the llama stretched its neck toward Hunter in an attempt to steal the rest of his apple. Watch it, you giant bird donkey, he snapped, pulling the remainder of his snack from the stick. We stood, and Hunter tossed the stick in the can. I took another gulp of my lemonade and thought about what exactly I'd done when I'd slowed down time, then fixed it, or I assumed I'd slowed it down. I wasn't even sure about that, but it seemed that if I'd sped me up, then Hunter, Max, and Serena wouldn't have been affected. And why wasn't she caught up in it? Hunter and Max, I could sort of see, because my psyche would possibly apply different rules to them. But why Serena? Just thinking about it was giving me a headache. I texted Anime and told her we were going to go see Bobby, Sue, and Earl, but she didn't answer. Hopefully, they weren't stuck upside down on some godforsaken ride, waiting for a half-tightened bolt to snap and hurtle them to their deaths. The barbecue grounds backed right up to the carnival, which gave the vendors the chance to catch the overflow of hungry people looking for something that wasn't deep-fried or served on a stick, and some of the competitors from other categories, such as baked goods, had even brought food trucks and were selling their wares. We stopped on the way and bought a mixed bag of turnovers and a couple funnel cakes that were twice the size and half the price as the ones at the carnival, so we could at least contribute dessert to the free barbecue dinner we were planning to beg. It was fully dark by then, and the atmosphere was festive, though it was much less chaotic on that side. That is, until we were almost to Bobby Sue's. Two pint-sized forms came crashing toward us, one chasing the other, and the one in front hooked Hunter by the arm and swung in behind him. Justin darted to one side of him, then the other, using him as a human shield so that Billy couldn't tag him. Hey, Hunter said, sloshing his lemonade, but they'd already streaked off down the aisle and were almost out of sight. I remember those days. I said, thinking back to the parties Aunt Addie and Uncle Calvin used to throw at the farm for one occasion or another. We always hosted the entire town for Halloween and Labor Day, and sometimes just had random get-togethers in between. We always spent those times doing exactly what Justin and Billy were doing, playing with other kids, and having the time of our lives. Of course, we also hosted the summer and winter solstice parties for the regional councils, which was another crowd altogether. Those were fun because we could use magic to disguise ourselves or otherwise enhance our chances. It ended up being a wash, usually, because one gift would counter another. Not always, though, and the smaller kids would get mad because they hadn't come into their magic yet. We rounded the tent just as Bobby Sue snatched up her ringing cell phone and stuffed a finger in her ear. She motioned toward the fridge and the food, implying that we should help ourselves, then walked out the back door, listening close to whoever she was talking to. I made a couple plates, and we'd already sat down to eat at the end of the truck by the time she came trudging back. What's up? I said, after I washed down a mouthful of food with the last of my lemonade. She scowled, then plopped onto a cooler and rested her elbows on her knees. What's up is that Louise just went into labor. 
I managed to get a hold of Ray, and she's closing for me tonight, but she doesn't know the store and couldn't run hers and mine both anyway. She took a deep breath, then huffed it out. It looks like we're going to have to pull up stakes and head out early. Probably ought to leave tonight, truth be told. Wait a minute, Hunter said, knowing how important the competition was to them. There's got to be a way around it. She dropped her head between her shoulder blades. If there is, I sure ain't seeing it, she said. Y'all are here, Sarah's still on vacation, and Louise is in labor. The new girls I got are good, but I don't know them well enough to trust them yet, and even if I did, they don't know what they're doing. There's one person you haven't thought of, I said, and she'd do a bang-up job for you. Who? Bobby asked. Because I sure would like to stick it out here. We're in the top three right now, and Justin's had his little heart set on the kids' competition for months. Shelby, Hunter and I said, together. She knows the restaurant inside out, I said, and she works with Will. So I'm sure he and Cody can do without her for a couple days, Hunter added. Will, our local vet, and Cody was his nephew, as well as Shelby's boyfriend. For the first time since she'd sat down, a little hope colored Bobby's face. That's right, and she knows how to do the paperwork and has the combination to the safe, too. I nodded and picked up my phone. She should be finished feeding. Let me call her. It only rang a couple times before she picked up and I explained the problem. Hang on a sec. She didn't bother to put her hand over the phone as she asked Cody if there was anything they'd need her for over the next couple of days. He said no, and she returned to the phone. No problem. Who has the keys? And is the schedule full besides Louise? I handed Bobby Sue the phone so they could discuss the details. When she handed it back to me, she actually had tears in her eyes. Thank you, sweetie. You don't know what this means to me. She wiped the corner of her eye with a knuckle, then mumbled something about onion juice. Lifting one corner of my mouth and a half smile, I handed her the funnel cake and pretended like I didn't see a thing. Chapter 12 with all the stress of this murder, that would have just done me in, she said. Why are you stressed about it? Hunter asked, sucking the last of the meat off a rib. She looked at him, brows drawn down, like he was half simple. Then her expression cleared. That's right. You haven't been down here today. They up and told Earl he couldn't leave. I about choked on a mouthful of beans and took a swig of Hunter's lemonade. Say what? Twisting her lips to the side, she said, Yeah, somehow they got wind of those recipes, even though they're not even sure they're the right ones, because nobody wants to shell out a hundred bucks to find out. They said it was still enough, given his temper, for them to consider him a suspect. They even talked about pulling him from the contest because of it. Hunter scowled. That's not right. There's a whole campground full of people who figured Moore got what he deserved. What drove them to narrow it down to them? Hunter heaved a deep sigh and tossed his empty plate into a nearby garbage can. He was introspective for a few minutes, munching on the funnel cake. Max, who'd flopped down by a fan Bobby Sue had set up, said, Why don't you see if you can learn anything from that sheriff, Hunter? Maybe he'll tell you, if you offer something in return. Quid pro quo, if you will. What do I have to offer in return? Your inside track, of course, Max said, as if it were obvious. But I don't have an inside track, Hunter said. Sure you do. You're sitting in it right now. Offer to listen around and see what you can learn from the inside. That's how we did things in my time. We knew everything about everybody, and it was all via a group of us keeping our ears open. Otherwise, we'd have been overthrown in no time. Bobby Sue's glance was eager. That's right. He'll trust you more because you're a cop. He'll tell you stuff he wouldn't tell us. Hunter shook his head. It doesn't always work that way. When I was investigating Hank's murder, I didn't tell anybody all of the details. 
I raised a brow at him because there were some things the rest of the town knew before he did. And how did that work out for you? He turned his hands over, palms up. I'll talk to him, but I'm not making any promises. If I were him, I wouldn't be turning loose of any details that hadn't already made the circuit. Grinning, I said, that's just it, though. I have no doubt it's already made the circuit. It just hasn't made it all the way down to us yet. I thought back to how overwhelmed he seemed at the scene. Besides, he may welcome the help. The guy was a small-town sheriff like Hunter was, and he probably hadn't dealt with too many murders, if any. One this scale had to be taxing his resources as well as his brain, just because of the sheer number of suspects. I patted him on the leg. You do what you can with him, and I'll keep an ear out, too. As a matter of fact, maybe we should call in some backup. I need to talk to Addie anyway. We finished eating and said our goodnights. By the time we made it back to the camper, I was whipped, but knew I couldn't wait till morning to talk to Addie about what had happened. Considering I didn't know what I'd done to make it happen, I didn't reckon it was a good idea to risk doing it again. Once we were in the camper, I called to her. It took a couple minutes, and when she popped in, she was wearing a Hawaiian print shirt and khaki shorts. What on earth are you doing? I asked before I could stop myself. She looked down at herself and giggled. We're having a luau party over at the old Holsteader place. He just died after being sick for years and was so happy to pop up on this side healthy. He threw himself a welcome back party. Last I saw him, he was doing loop-de-loops through the windows and hitting on the widow Stevens. I blinked a couple times at the visuals. Really, what was I supposed to say to that? Well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I had something weird happen to me today, and I thought you could help. She brought her brows together and lowered her voice. You didn't find no rash or anything, did you? What? No. Oh, my God, Addie. Why would you even think that? She shrugged. Toilet seats. Shaking my head in disbelief, I said, no, I'm talking about witchy weird. With that, she became serious. What kind of witchy weird? I explained the situation to her, and she scrubbed a hand over her face. After a few seconds, she still hadn't said anything, and I was getting impatient. Well, what do you make of it? What did I do, and how do I not do it again? Baby doll, I have no idea. I've only heard tell of one witch in our family, at all, in fact, that had a handle on time, and she refused to use it after she royally mucked things up. Okay, define mucked things up. There's no way to know for sure, but she thought she set a murder, free. She held up a hand. Before you even ask, I don't know the full story or why she thought that, because it was way before my time. But I think maybe it's time you learned about our history. She floated back and forth, pacing with her hands behind her back. Maybe this was one of the reasons I was chosen to stay. I thought maybe it was just because you needed my help with Shelby and everything else, but it's not turning out that way. First, Shelby gets an angel kiss. Then you go all mind control -y. And now, you've messed with time. It's not like either of us meant to. Well, Shelby had kind of gotten herself into her own mess, but she hadn't intended to. It had been a situation brought about by teenage hubris. Still, Addie was right. She'd come back from a place nobody had ever come back from, with the direct involvement of a full-fledged, honest-to-God, wings-and-all angel. I thought back to the mind-control incident she'd mentioned. I'd always been telepathic, Shelby too, though her magic had been blocked. But when Justin was kidnapped by a murderer, 
I'd had to push my abilities further than I ever had to save the kid. I'd found a gear I hadn't even known I'd had. And now I'd stopped, or at least slowed down, time. Her words had taken a moment to sink in. Oh, what do you mean, it's time I learned about our history? She sighed. When you get home, we need to have a family sit down. Me, you, Shelby, Ray, and your Aunt Beth. You should probably get a hold of Camille and Aurora, too. Tell them what happened. They're the best ones to help you get a handle on whatever it is you've got going on. And don't dawdle about it. Time ain't nothing to mess with. Camille was one of my good friends and worked for our regional witches' council. She'd helped Shelby to control her unwieldy powers before she'd broken through her block. Aurora was the president of the council. But there's nothing you can tell me in the meantime that may help? Yeah, she said, fading out. Figured out what exactly you were thinking and what your intent was when you slowed time and do your best not to do it again. For a minute, I could hear steel drums. Then she disappeared altogether, leaving me with more questions than I'd had when I'd called her, and I'd forgotten to mention Bobby Sue and Earl's situation altogether. Chapter 13 I needed a good night's rest before I could even think about talking to Camille about it, so I decided to call it a night. I curled in beside Hunter, afraid my mind wouldn't slow down enough to let me sleep, but it had been a long, strange day, and my brain and body were both ready to shut it down. The next morning, I woke up feeling much better. Hunter was already up, and I hoped the smell of sausage wafting through the window was from our grill. I dressed and pulled my hair through the loop in my ball cap, then slipped out the door. Hallelujah! It was him cooking. Morning, sunshine. I gave him a peck on the cheek and reached around to swipe a crispy sausage link off the plate. Morning. How'd you sleep? You tossed a little early on, but settled down after that. He flipped a couple over medium eggs onto a plate along with a few links and handed it to me, then made his own. Better than I expected, I said, mashing my eggs. I mean, there's not much I can do about it right now, other than make an effort not to do it again. I learned to control my other magic, so I don't see why this should be any different. Matt popped around the corner right then, balancing four giant cups of coffee in a carrier. Oh, my goodness, I said, as he handed me a cup. You're my hero. Hey, Hunter said, elbowing me. I made breakfast. I know, but Matt brought coffee. Anna Mae popped out of their camper. Did somebody say coffee? I grinned at Hunter. See, it's not you, sugar. It's the caffeine. Oh, and sausage links, Anna said, grabbing one as she passed. You guys are spoiling us this weekend. Matt gave her a quick kiss as he handed her a cup. So, did you guys feel that weirdness at the carnival last night? He asked. Swallowing half a sausage link whole, I said, Weirdness? Yeah, he said, crinkling his brow. It's hard to explain, but it was almost like a bad photo editing job in a movie. Sort of like a skip. Nothing obvious, but it was just weird. He lifted a shoulder. I don't know how else to explain it. Actually, I said, grimacing, that was me. Matt and Anime knew all about me. For that matter, there'd been rumors flying around the entire town of Keyhole Lake for decades, but only a handful of people knew the truth for sure. She'd found out for sure while we were investigating Hank's death. She'd busted me when, in a thoughtless moment, I'd turn the oven off from across the room. Before then, I'd always liked her, but we hadn't been close enough because I could never understand why she stayed with such a tool. It turned out she'd had her reasons, and we'd become friends. Matt tilted his head. You? 
I explained what had happened, and in true anime fashion, she just shrugged it off. Matt wasn't quite so lighthearted about it and gave me the whole ripple effect warning. We ate for a few minutes in silence, taking time to enjoy the food, the company, and the great weather. Oh, I forgot to tell y'all, Louise went into labor last night. Anna's eyes brightened. No way! That's awesome! But wait, who's running Bobby Sue's? Shelby, I said. She's taking a few days off from Will's and holding down the fort until we get back. I'd no sooner mentioned her name than I felt a rap on the mental door between Shelby's mind and mine. Speak of the devil. S. Hey, you awake? You're not answering your phone. I checked my pockets and realized I'd left it in the trailer. Yeah, what's up? Louise had a boy. Oh, wow. I bet Max is torqued. Yeah, she named it after him. The cantankerous old fart actually cried. Oh, and make sure Bobby Sue doesn't worry. Everything is fine here. I want her to have a good time. Will do, and thanks, brat. I smiled as I nudged the door shut, happy that the Wheelers finally had some happiness in their lives. I relayed the info to the rest of the crowd, and Anna Mae teared up, then started waving at her face. Oh, I just love babies, she said, and they deserve it. She didn't notice, but Matt gave her a speculative look. I couldn't figure out if it was good or bad and resisted the urge to take a tiny psychic peek to see. My golden rule, I never invaded anyone's privacy without a darn good reason. That's not to say that sometimes strong emotions didn't ping my radar, but I made it a point to never look on purpose. Folks were starting to trickle through the fair, so we made short work of opening the booths. I lifted the protective spells, but decided to leave the anti-sticky fingers one in place. If something wasn't paid for, it wouldn't leave the tent. Turns out, it was a good thing, because we got so busy there was no way we could have kept an eye out. Anna May sold a ton of her jewelry, along with several of her period pieces and decorative items. Just for kicks, we decided to arrange a couple of displays on the pegboard that combined her stuff and mine and ended up selling both of them as whole units rather than individually. Well, well, look at this. Two of our favorite ladies knocking it out of the park. I was surprised to find TJ in the tent, smiling and admiring a vanity I'd made from an old bureau. She elbowed Moira, her best friend. Wouldn't this go great with my bedroom suit? It would, Moira replied, picking up the price tag and raising a brow. But you'd have to talk her into giving you the friends and family discount. I had met the women on one of my very first picks while they were selling off the contents of her recently deceased aunt's home. She'd had no idea at the time that she was a witch or that her Aunt Nora wasn't as dearly departed as she thought. The girls had decided to move from Virginia down to Eagle Gap when the local council had been less than welcoming, despite Moira's pull with them. We'd become friends right off the bat. Hey, ladies, I didn't know you were coming, I said, grinning at them. I'll cut you a heck of a deal on the vanity. TJ snorted. I bet you would, considering the profit you made off that old door and end table I gave you, thinking they were trash. Don't be a hater, I told her. Your trash, my treasure. Anna Mae squealed when she saw them and rushed up for hugs. I squeezed an eye shut. Her enthusiasm was sometimes ear-splitting. What are y'all doing here? she asked. TJ shrugged. We figured since half the people we know from Keyhole are here, we might as well make a day of it and pop over. Eagle Gap was a little town halfway between the fair and Keyhole Lake, so it wasn't too far. Putting her nose in the air and drawing in a deep breath, Mora said, not to be in a rush, but the smell of barbecue is convincing my belly my throat's been cut. I'd kill for some ribs right about now. A where's Bobby Sue and Earl set up? Anime and I looked at each other, and I raised a brow and coughed. Uh, 
unfortunate choice of words, maybe. Moira didn't miss much, and she picked up the change in my tone. How so? One of the judges was murdered Friday. They found him with a barbecue fork sticking out of his back, I said. And on top of it, it seems like everybody in the campground had a reason to do it. Max trotted up to TJ, who happened to be one of his favorite people on the planet, mostly because she always gave him food and scratched his back whenever he wanted. Yeah, it's tough. They've been grilling everybody, he said, waggling his furry eyebrows. Anna Mae groaned. Really, Max? That's what you came up with? Moira smothered a laugh. Yeah, Max, that's forked up. I shook my head. Enough with the gallows humor. Earl's one of the ones they're looking at. The smiles slipped from their faces. Earl, TJ said. Why? Earl's not exactly the backstabbing type. Max snickered, and Anna fixed him with a glare. He cleared his throat. I'll just be over here till the smoke clears. I sighed, wondering for the umpteenth time what I'd done to deserve such a smart-mouthed donkey. The crowd had thinned, so I pulled them to the side out of hearing range of any customers and explained the whole recipe situation. After that, I filled them in on the bribery accusations and sauce versus rub drama. TJ whistled. Wow. So how, out of all of that, did they pick Earl as a prime suspect? Running a hand over my face, I said, I don't know. My sticky fingers alarm triggered, and the hair on the back of my neck stood upright before a muted clang sounded from the other side of the tent. Anna Mae had her back turned to that corner while she was dealing with a customer and spun around. We'd locked our petty cash money in my cash box overnight after we'd divvied out the profits, and I'd accidentally left it on one of the tables after we took the money out and put it in our aprons. Glancing up to catch the culprit, all I saw was a few people scowling and looking over their shoulders. Whoever tried to rip us off had gotten away. Chapter 14 We'd had such a great sales morning that we decided to close up long enough to go check on Earl and grab a bite to eat. When we got there, everything was a mess, and Earl was digging through the cooler like there was gold at the bottom of it. I poked my head inside. Earl, is everything okay? He spun around and flung his hands in the air. Sure, if you consider my chicken burning to a crisp and my sausage disappearing being okay. Wait, what? I asked, confused. You heard me. I had to drop out of the chicken competition this morning because Susie Q burnt mine to a crisp. Now I can't find my sausage. He rubbed his chin, looking through the small fridge they kept the sauces in. It takes too long to make, so I had it made up already. He scratched his head, scowling, and looking at the racks of bread like the meat was hiding next to the garlic toast. Nothing he said made sense. Sausage links weren't prone to meandering off, and Earl sure as heck didn't burn meat. Did you lock the truck last night? TJ asked, and regret flitted across her face as soon as the question left her lips. Earl slammed his fists on his hips and glowered at me. Why on earth would I be silly enough to lock up fifteen grand worth of equipment and supplies? He huffed out a breath and shook his head, grumbling. Of course I locked the truck and double-checked before I went to bed, and Noel put some hoodoo on it, too. Okay, TJ said. Was the truck unlocked at any point today when y'all weren't here? He collapsed down on a cooler and dropped his chin on his hand. No, except when we went up to watch the chicken judging. Glaring at his grill, he went on. And I don't know what happened to Susie Q. I set her to where she should have cooked that chicken perfect just like always, and 20 minutes later, it was burnt to a crisp. Bobby Sue popped around the corner. 
Earl, she said. She pulled up short when she saw us. He tell you somebody up and stole our stuff? I looked between the two of them. I think we passed a grocery store a couple of miles before the grounds. I don't mind running up and getting whatever you need. He shook his head. Won't do no good. I already called them and they don't carry lamb. I ain't got time to remake it anyway. Moira didn't know Earl that well, so I put my hand on her arm and shook my head when she opened her mouth to speak. She'd been ready to suggest he just skip the lamb. The question had popped out at me loud and clear, but Earl's head would have exploded. With him, you do it right or not at all, and his idea of right was way stricter than most, especially when it came to cooking. She snapped her mouth shut, and a heavyset guy in bib overall shorts and a white apron strode into camp, looking panicked. Earl glanced up at him, and the man must have read the look on his face because he slumped. You too? I came to borrow lamb, but you look like a kicked pup. They got yours too, huh? Yep, sure did, Earl said, propping his elbows on his knees and dropping his head between his shoulders. Anybody else having problems? Bobby Sue asked, or is it just us? Jimbo held his hand up. They got me for my sausage meat, and I was entering my beans, too. They're gone. I suppose I could enter what we've been serving, but they ain't the recipe I was planning to use. Even if I had what I needed to start over, them beans take at least eight hours to cook right. Earl pulled off his apron. I'm going to grab a shower. Ain't no need to do any more cooking today. Got plenty of pulled pork to get us through the evening. Then as far as I'm concerned, I'm ready to go home tomorrow after Justin competes. Bobby Sue scowled. Now, you know we can't do that. What kind of example would we set for Justin if we skipped the closing celebration? Earl frowned. I reckon you're right, but it's going to grind a little knowing we could have won and didn't. Well, us and most of the other folks here, she said. We cleaned up in brisket and ribs, and Justin's got a good shot at his division tomorrow, so we done better than most. Plus, we got away from the weekend as a family. Things could have been worse. He reached up and grabbed her around the hips and pulled her onto his lap. Woman, you sure do know how to make a feller feel better. She humped and gave him a kiss on the temple. Well, if you wasn't so used to winning, I wouldn't have to take it down a peg or two every now and again. I always loved watching the two of them interact and hoped someday I had the kind of relationship built on years of living through the ups and downs together. Glancing at Hunter, I couldn't help but wonder if he'd be the one I'd build it with. He met my eyes and gave me a half smile. Jimbo untied his apron, too. I reckon you're right, but Earl's right, too. It'll burn not winning when I should have. Earl grinned at him. You mean it'll burn not taking home the second place prize money like you would have. His friend and competitor barked out a laugh as he headed back toward his trailer. I reckon we'll see about that at the 4th of July celebration over in your neck of the woods. I don't mind beating you in your own backyard. I waved to him, and when I did, Max fell into my line of vision, pulling a half-eaten pulled pork sandwich out of the trash can. Max, spit that out. You have no idea who had their mouth on that. He grumbled something about wasting food, but dropped it and wandered over to plop down by Earl. Patting his head, he said, Don't worry, big guy. I'll feed you. And I think I still have some Glen Levet in there, too. Matter of fact, I'm ready for a drink myself. Bobby Sue slid from his lap so he could get up. A man after my own heart. Max said, climbing to his feet and doing a full body shake and following him toward the truck. 
For some reason, Earl had taken a shine to Max pretty much as soon as they'd met, and even when I was poor, he'd made sure Max had his scotch. Now that they had a little spare time, they often spent time at our farm, and Max and Earl would play chess on a giant floor version that I'd had made just for my wayward donkey. I had no idea what the appeal was. Bobby said it was the stubborn streak they shared, and maybe the love of good scotch. Chapter 15 Looking around, I realized Justin was nowhere to be found and asked Bobby Sue about it. Billy came over right after the chicken incident, and Earl was so miserable I figured Justin may as well go play. No need to make him stick around and listen to us piss and moan. She glanced at TJ and Moira. What brings you ladies over? We figured we'd come over and make a day of it. Eat some food, check and see how y'all were doing, and maybe go to the carnival. They're having more food stuff in the Great Hall, too, aren't they? A neighbor of ours mentioned she was entering some of her jams, TJ said. Yeah, Bobby Sue said, but I haven't even been up there yet. Been too busy here all weekend. Then maybe there's a silver lining, Anna Mae said. Why don't y'all close up the food truck and we'll close up the tent and we'll spend an evening pretending we aren't here to work. This is supposed to be fun, after all. Bobby glanced at her phone. It was almost three. Give me an hour to get the food put away and clean up a little and uh, we'll do that. She turned her head. Earl? We're calling it a day, sugar. Let's have us some fun. I was glad to see they were both bouncing back because I knew they had to be crushed. Oh, wait, I said to her. Aren't you entering your beans? You always do. She advertised them as award-winning, and they were. She waved me off. Psh, I wouldn't feel right winning today when Earl took such a kick in the ass. She winked. And you and I both know I'd have won. Besides, the only real competition I ever have is Jimbo over there, and he's out. Everybody else uses pork and beans. Oh, the crime against humanity, I said, putting the back of my hand to my forehead. You laugh, Missy, but it's because you've been spoiled by the good stuff. Valid point. I couldn't remember the last time I'd had any baked beans besides hers, or bushes, but no way was I going to say that to her. She'd wash my mouth out with soap. Now get, she said. Go on down there and close up, and we'll meet y'all back up here. I want to go check out the pies and then go over to the carnival. I wiggled my fingers. You want me to help? No, I can have it done in no time. Max decided to hang around with them, but the rest of us cruised back to our spot. Using the same method we'd used the night before, it didn't take us long to close up. Anime pulled one of her bins out of her camper and counted the quilts she had left. They'd been a hit so far. It's kind of a good thing we're closing up shop early, she said. I don't think I brought enough stuff to get me through another two days, if we don't. Yeah, same here, I said. I figured I'd be taking a bunch of stuff home, but at this rate, the trailer's going to be mostly empty. I only had four big pieces left, an entry bench I'd made out of an old church pew, and a dresser, the vanity that TJ had admired, a wrought iron patio set I'd rescued, and a kitchen display case I'd made from some oak cabinets. I decided to mark the vanity sold and give it to TJ for her birthday. I think grouping them helped, too, Anna Mae said, while we consolidated what we had and made up a couple more displays. Seemed like those sold as soon as we put them together. She snapped the lid back on her bin. The guys were relaxing in the camp chairs, talking about motorcycles. That reminded me that we hadn't seen the antique cars yet. We still have 45 minutes before we meet Bobby Sue. Want to walk over to the cars? The guys were all about it, and even Anna Mae was down. Just because I don't know jack about horsepower and motors and stuff doesn't mean I can't enjoy the nostalgia, I guess. 
She looped her arm through Matt's, and we set off in that direction. The cars were impressive, but the owners were sort of testy, likely because they'd been trying to keep girls in miniskirts and kids with cotton candy on their hands from touching their cars for two days. I couldn't say that I blamed them, but it did keep the guys from getting hung up talking shop. We met back up with Earl and Bobby Sue and did a tour through the Great Hall, sampling every type of pie, jam, jelly, and bread you could imagine. I grabbed some different jams that would go well in some of my recipes, and Earl picked up some jalapeno jelly from TJ and Maura's neighbor that he wanted to try as a marinade. By then, I was used to just trusting him when he said something would be good, no matter how weird it sounded. Justin had been good all afternoon about texting every 15 minutes like he was supposed to, and I thought about how excited he was about the competition the next day. I decided to swing past and put an extra charm on their trailer to prevent any more mishaps that would ruin it for him. Many of the crafters still had their booths open, so we cruised a couple of aisles through there, then made our way to the carnival. The weight seemed to have lifted off Earl by the time we got there, though we did make it a point to avoid the sausage trucks when we decided to get something to eat. No need rubbing salt in the wound when corn dogs were better anyway. Max was the star of the show most of the night, and I was proud of what a good sport he was about it. Of course, he'd had a couple of nips with Earl earlier, so that may have paved the way a little. It probably didn't hurt that he was fawned over by almost as many cute women as he was adoring kids. Justin met up with us when we finished eating and talked anime, Matt and TJ, into riding some rides with him. Since Bobby sued never seen a llama, we headed over to the petting zoo. As we neared the place, I got a case of the heebie-jeebies when I remembered what had happened the day before, and I cast an anxious glance towards Serena's tent. Maura noticed my discomfort and raised a brow at me. She waited till Bobby Sue and Earl were fawning over the llama before sidling closer to where Hunter and I were standing with our elbows propped on the aluminum fence that circled the zoo. Something you need to talk about, sunshine? She'd been involved in the uppermost workings of the Virginia Witches' Council before she'd moved to Eagle Gap, so maybe she could explain what had happened and how I could control it so it didn't happen again. Yeah, I shifted my weight and sighed. I sort of stopped time yesterday. Or slowed it down, I guess would be a better word. Or at least, I think that's what happened. Her eyes about popped out of her head, and the fence rattled when she jumped back to stare at me like I had a third eye growing out of my forehead. You what? A couple standing several feet away looked our direction, curious to see what the fuss was about. I scowled at her and pulled her back to my side. Holy cow, keep your voice down. Her cheeks went pink, and she cringed. Sorry, but you did what? I'm going to need a little context. I gave her the condensed version, and she rubbed a hand over my face. Hunter said, If it helps any, Max and I weren't affected. He took a deep breath. Except, now I'm wondering if the Slurpee I rescued would have caused a woman to slip into the love of her life, or something, had I let things happen the way they were supposed to. That wasn't helpful, because I could literally see her pulse pounding in her temple. Yeah, you said it exactly right, the way they were supposed to. Love, or maybe she was assumed to be a serial killer, and fate planned for her to slip and die from a blood clot in her brain or something. She hissed. Oh my god, you actually changed things when it happened, rather than just restarting it when you realized what was going on? Yes, said a voice from behind us. I'd only heard it once, but I recognized the husky Cajun accent. She did, enough that I felt the ripple. Mora whipped around, and when she did, her face split into a grin. Serena! The psychic smiled and pulled Mora into a hug. 
It's good to see you, Sherry. Hunter and I glanced at each other, then at the two women. He spoke first. Maybe some introductions, then some explanations are in order. Serena smiled at him, her ebony eyes sparkling. That's what I've been trying to say, honey. Noel, Hunter, this is Serena Trahan, one of the most talented seers I've ever known or even heard about. Serena dipped her head. Serena, this is Noel Flynn and Hunter Woods. Understanding crossed her face. Ah, a Flynn witch. That clears things up a bit. Clears what things up? I asked, feeling like I'd missed a critical part of the conversation. Moira looked as confused as I did, and Serena tilted her head toward Bobby, Sue, and Earl, who'd finished feeding the llama, and were heading our direction. We'll talk more later. Come see me before you leave. I nodded as Bobby, Sue, and Earl reached us, grinning like a couple of kids. You must be Billy's mama. Bobby said, holding her hand out. Sherry Lynn told us all about you. I'm glad our boys met. It's been good for him to have another boy to play with. Serena was warm and welcoming in return, and I sensed zero bad will or fake congeniality on her part, though she did shoot me a look when I tried to take a superficial peek into her melon to make sure. My rule usually applies to everybody but I'd make an exception in a heartbeat when it came to my family, or to someone who knew more about my magic than I did. Not that it would take much, apparently. Chapter 16 Running into Serena had shaken me up a little, but I had to admit Moira was a shrewd judge of character. If she trusted the seer and thought I should talk to her, then maybe she was right. After all, it wasn't like I had to take what she said as gospel, but if she could shed some light on my new gift, then it would be dumb not to at least hear her out. I decided to do as she asked and talk to her before I left. After we'd gathered the group up, we'd gone back to the barbecue truck and hung out for a bit. TJ and Mora had a meeting with the local werewolf pack the next day. Apparently, they were getting drawn into local witch-slash-pack politics, so they didn't stick around for long. Justin claimed to be too excited to sleep, but dozed off sitting in his chair. Bobby Sue shuffled him to the camper, and while she was gone, Jimbo came over, looking madder than a wet hen. Earl, you need to see something. He motioned down the aisle between their two trailers. We all got up and followed him to a dumpster not far away, the smell of rotten meat growing so strong as we approached that it was all I could do not to gag. Earl was making a conscious effort to breathe through his mouth as Jimbo pointed at the contents. I edged around him to peer over the edge, and there, partly covered with half-eaten sandwiches and paper products, was a mountain of sausage, chickens, and a steel serving pan of baked beans. Looks like I found our missing food, Jimbo said, pulling up the strap on his denim bibs. And unless I miss my guess, your cooker was messed with too. We were set to take first and second in the chicken, sausage, and beans. Growling, Earl turned away from the dumpster and we headed back to fresh air. But why go about it like that? Now, it's going to be easy to figure out who done it. Just look at who did win. I shook my head. I don't know about that. Too obvious. Hunter agreed. One thing's for sure, though. We need to let the sheriff know what's going on. In case it's connected to the murder, he needs all the pieces he can get. I still think we need to find out who won, Bobby Sue said, scowling with her hands stuffed in her pockets. And I'd like to taste their entries, too. After... We talked to the sheriff, Hunter insisted. We probably need to talk to the competition officials, too. Earl looked like his head was about to explode. 
I don't know what we'll expect them to do about it, he said. They sure didn't seem to care a whit when we told them it was all stolen to begin with. For some reason, I'd expected them to cancel those sections of the competition, but according to everybody else, that wasn't how it went. The show goes on. Whoever can present a dish gets judged, period. Bobby Sue pulled out her phone. Who you calling? Earl asked. Ain't gonna do you no good now. It's done too late. The officials are probably done gone to their hotels. Actually, Hunter said, I saw one of them coming out of a trailer over by the Great Hall earlier today. I think he's camping here. Jimbo hitched the strap of his bibs back onto his shoulder and squared himself in that direction. Well, if we had to lose out on the competition, they're at least going to listen while I tell them why. Sides, they need to know there's monkey business going on around here. Ain't never in all my years on the circuit had any problems like these. Earl was right behind him, and I pitied the judge if he wasn't willing to come over and take a gander into a dumpster at midnight. I snapped a couple of pictures of half-rotten, bean-covered sausage with my phone just in case, then turned to follow Bobby Sue back to camp. It only took a few minutes for them to return with a grumpy-looking man in a bathrobe, whose comb-over was sticking up in all directions. This better be good. I was having the most marvelous dream about... Bobby Sue held up her hand. I don't think I want you to finish that sentence. He gave her a sour look. I was gonna say T-bones. I hope these kids tomorrow know what they're doing. Makes me nervous handing over that quality of meat to youngins. Even worse, I gotta taste it. Taking in his rotund form, I wasn't convinced that he was all that particular, but I kept it to myself. This won't take but a minute, Grundy, Earl said, pointing to the dumpster. Take a gander in there. The judge made a concentrated effort to breathe through his mouth as he poked his head over the edge, then heaved a big sigh. We're gonna have to have a meeting tomorrow. Jimbo frowned at him. So now that you have proof, you'll consider it? What, you thought we were lying? No, he said. But the rules say that we judge what's submitted. Who submits is beyond our control. You know that. But it so happens me and another judge, who I'm not naming, know both of your styles well, and thought we'd sample your meat during the tastings today. Earl scratched his head. What do you make of that? Furrowing his brow, Grundy said, Because one of the samples in each category was your fellers, plain as day. But when we announced the winners, it wasn't you two that turned them in. Jimbo growled. You're saying our meat conveniently ends up in a dumpster and somebody else submitted entries using our recipes and you didn't find that fishy? Course we found it fishy, Grundy muttered. We dug through the rules but couldn't find anything to hang them with. He motioned toward the dumpster. This changes things, though. I'll be convening with the other judges in the morning before the kids' competition. Earl, I assume your youngin's competing? Earl jerked his head in a nod. Using our rub. Grundy held up a hand. I didn't need to know that. He rubbed his jaw. Though it does help if we get duplicates. I lost track of what he was saying when the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. One of our security wards I'd placed on Bobby Sue's trailer had been triggered. It was in my line of sight, but the side entry door wasn't. I ran toward it, hoping to catch whoever had set it off. Hunter followed, but by the time I skidded around the side, there was nobody there. Mind telling me what's going on? Grundy asked as he puffed around the corner. Hunter looked at me, not sure how to respond, because all he'd done was follow when I took off. I thought I saw somebody messing with the trailer, I said. Well, there ain't nobody here now, so I'm going back to bed. He turned to Bobby Sue, Earl, and Jimbo, who'd followed me too. I'll let you know what we decide tomorrow. Ain't you at least gonna tell us who it was that turned in our recipes? Jimbo asked. Grundy shook his head. I can't do that. He narrowed his eyes, thinking. But if it makes you feel better, Earl, 
they didn't place as high as you would have. It wouldn't be honorable to mention who used your bean recipe or sausage either, Jimbo. Earl and Jimbo looked at each other, understanding running between them. Okay, Grundy. Thanks for doing what you can, Earl said, reaching out and shaking his hand. Once the judge was gone, robe and comb over flapping in the wind, Bobby Sue said, He's a good egg. He used to compete before he moved up to judge and was always in the running for the money. Lucky for us, he knows his seasonings and recognized ours. And now we can figure out who submitted our recipes, Earl said. Uh, what? I asked. How? Bobby Sue grinned. He emphasized place, which means third. Then honorable mentions are fourth. So the folks who submitted Jimbo's recipes came in fourth in the divisions. Once she explained it, I felt kind of silly because that's how many smaller local horse shows did it too. Now we had a place to start. Chapter 17 I woke up groggy the next morning. I'd tossed and turned all night, plagued by weird dreams about stopping time and not knowing how to start it again. Reasonable, I guess, and it cemented my decision to talk to Serena. I stumbled out of bed and grabbed a bottle of OJ out of the fridge. My mouth was dry as a bone. Anna Mae knocked on the door, then poked her head in. Knock, knock. Come on in, I said, drinking half the bottle of juice in one slug. You're up early. Yeah, she said, puckering her lips and pushing them to the side. Matt just got a call. Something went wrong on one of their jobs, and Jared doesn't know how to fix it. We gotta go. Aw, oh, that's a bummer. Jared was Emily Wheeler's son-in-law. He knew a lot and was slated to take over the company, eventually, but he's still had a lot to learn. I know. Do you want me to pack my stuff and take it with me, or do you mind bringing it back with you? I figured I'd ask since we made up those displays last night and they've been selling so well. For that matter, if you want, I can stay and ride back with you all. I flapped a hand at her as I took another drink of the OJ. No, you don't have to do that. Go on with Matt and just leave your stuff. I'll bring back what I don't sell, and we'll divvy up the cash when I get home. Do you have to leave right now? She wrinkled her nose. Yeah, they're already behind on this job, and the owner's having a conniption. Okay, let me know when you get home. I gave her a brief hug and got dressed. Hunter had gone to get coffee, so I set about opening up the booth. Not that it took much. By the time he got back, I was ready for the caffeine. Then, as predicted, folks started pouring in, looking for Sunday bargains. Three times I had people offer me a hundred bucks for a piece I had five hundred on. Then they had the nerve to act like they were doing me a favor. Hunter had gone to see if there was any news with Bobby, Sue, and Earl when my phone dinged with an incoming text. It was Shelby. S. Came home to change clothes and ma'am let the geldings out. Ranger's missing. In. Missing? Probably out in the back pasture. S. Yeah, because I didn't check there or everywhere else. He's not on the property. Hoof prints to end of drive, then nothing. Ma'am was Gabby's horse, and though he had a ton of personality and was great, he was also a pain in the ass. His skill as an escape artist made Houdini look like an amateur, especially considering he had no thumbs. I took a deep breath. Ranger was our problem child. He was a rescue that we'd taken in a year and a half before and was just starting to come around. When we got him, you could see every bone in his body, and his feet were so overgrown he could barely walk. He was also terrified of people. It took us almost a year to get him healthy, and even though he was relatively young, he had some serious phobias. 
For one, he was tough to catch. You'd get within five feet of him, and he'd run in the other direction. Saddles touching his head or face and picking up his feet were all points of terror for him. But he had a half dozen smaller quirks to go along with them that we hadn't managed to help him through yet. Of all the horses that could have gone on walkabout, it was horrible luck that it was him. My palms were sweating just thinking about him being loose. His fears could get him into all kinds of trouble, stuck in fences, shying sideways into a ditch and breaking a leg. My mind spun with worry, and my first instinct was to rush home. However, that wasn't possible. I still had to wait for the guy to come pick up those stupid bar chairs. If only I'd taken Anna Mae up on her offer, then I wouldn't be in such a pickle. In. I'm stuck here waiting on some guy to pick up stuff he already paid for. He said today or tomorrow. S. It's not like you could do anything we're not already doing. Cody and I are going to split up, and Will's going to help too. N. Keep me posted and let me know the minute you find him. S. Okay. I checked the time on my phone. It wasn't even noon yet. After looking up and down the aisle like I could make the man magically appear, no pun intended, I puffed out my cheeks and looked for something to keep me busy. Fortunately, several more customers flitted through the tin and kept me occupied for the better part of an hour, but I checked my phone every ten minutes to make sure I hadn't missed a text. Hunter came back just as I was finishing up with a customer who'd bought one of the last big pieces I had. I was down to just a couple big pieces, anime stuff, and my smaller accent pieces. I gave him the rundown on what was going on at the farm, and he frowned. Surely he'll come back when it's time to eat, he said, in an attempt to talk me off the ledge. I shook my head. Maybe in the winter, but right now he's got all the grass in the world to gorge himself on. Thinking of all the nooks and crannies he could be hiding in, I cringed. It had been years since we'd had a problem like this, and even then, it had been one of our rock-steady horses that had ended up in the neighbor's pasture. Hunter wrapped his arms around me. He's gonna be fine. I'm sure he's just grazing the time away in one of the back pastures. You know how easily he spooks. If he heard them coming through the woods, he probably ran the other way long before they saw him. Puffing up my cheeks, I blew out a breath. He was probably right, but I was kicking myself for not investing more time in him. Come on, he said. I brought you something to eat. Hopefully your guy will show up today and we can head home. I ran into the sheriff while I was up there. I can't believe I didn't get the guy's information. Lesson learned there. I let him lead me to our chairs, then collapsed into one. Did you learn anything about Sheriff Scottsdale? He pinched his lips together. Not really. They got the preliminary report back from the coroner. They say the killer was at least 5'11", with significant upper body strength. He still thinks Earl is a viable suspect, and to tell you the truth, if I were in his shoes, so would I. Still, he seems fair, and he's been thorough, so I'm not worried about him tossing him in jail without solid proof. Yeah, I said. But the contest is over after Justin competes today. They're staying for the party tomorrow, but does he expect Earl to stay here until he untangles it, or can he go home? Hunter chewed his lip as he handed me a to-go container with a Philly cheesesteak and fries, then set down a container of Chinese veggies and rice for Max. If it were me, I'd probably let him go home. He's not a flight risk. Shoot, he's never left the Tri-County area, except for competitions, and he's about turning himself inside out worrying about the restaurant. He lifted a shoulder. I assured Blaine I'd take responsibility, but it's up to him. I hadn't realized how hungry I was until I lifted the lid of the container and the smell of meaty, cheesy goodness wafted up to me. I took a huge bite and contemplated while I chewed. Chasing it down with my tea, I said, What about the stolen food? Any idea who was behind that? Hunter held up a finger as he struggled to swallow a quarter of his sub whole. Now, there is a problem we're making progress on. Bobby Sue tracked down a list of winners, so they know who they're dealing with. 
two rookies who have never competed before. Crinkling my brow, I asked, So, two separate competitors, obviously, because one used Earl's recipe and one used Jimbo's. So what, they worked together to still the meats? Is there a connection? He shrugged. That was my first question, too. So far, there's no connection between them, but we agreed that it's too big a coincidence for there not to be. They're from two different towns, though they're close to each other, but there doesn't seem to be any common factors at all. They claim they don't know each other. He polished off his sandwich and dragged a fry through his ketchup. I rubbed my chin. Off topic a little, but I wonder what it is that Earl uses to make his rubs and sauces so unique. It's probably not one thing, but rather how he pairs the ingredients together. Max, who had been quiet while he ate, agreed. I've watched him this weekend, and at cookouts, and he does something else I find odd. He uses different rubs during the cooking process. What do you mean? Hunter asked. So do I. I season it when I put it on the grill, then add more as I go. Max shook his head, grains of rice falling off his muzzle as he did so. He twisted his upper lip, running his tongue over his big yellow teeth, dislodging even more rice and a chunk of water chestnut. I wrinkled my nose. No, he said. I mean, he has an order that he uses. An initial seasoning, then he sauces it and adds another layer of different seasonings. Oh, I said. When he means layers of flavor, you mean he's being literal. Quite, Max said, as he tried to root a piece of broccoli away from an onion with his upper lip. I flicked a finger toward his food, clearing the onions out, because the last thing I needed was for him to get onion bubble guts. The donkey could clear a room just from a few slices. Sorry, Hunter said. I forgot to tell them to nix the onions. Max tilted his head toward me. She's the one who complains when the natural result occurs, though I do have to say they give me a bit of indigestion. I snorted. Yeah, your indigestion is the least of the problems. Warping the aluminum inside the trailer is what I worry about. We'd just finished eating when Justin came barreling around the corner, sweaty and out of breath. Y'all need to come quick. Bobby Sue done went and popped some girl in the nose. Chapter 18 It only took us a minute to run to their food truck, but by the time we got there, I could barely breathe. Good genetics gave me a fast metabolism, but I still had a little junk in the trunk and wasn't big on sweating for the fun of it. Bobby Sue was nose to nose with the sheriff himself, and I rushed forward. I ain't gonna let her talk about Earl like that, especially without proof, she growled, stretching her neck to view the blonde woman behind him. I recognized her as the girl who'd found the body, the screamer. I didn't remember much about her from that day, and right then she had a wad of blood-spotted napkins shoved against her nose. All I could see was a pair of narrowed brown eyes hovering beneath orangish blonde hair, glowering at Bobby Sue. What's going on here? I asked. Mrs. Busted Nose pointed a chubby finger with long, fake nails at Bobby Sue. She bunched me in the dose for no reason. I shook my head, but I'd socked Olivia, my arch enemy since grade school, in the schnoz enough that I spoke broken nose. What'd you do to her to deserve it? Bobby Sue didn't just throw punches for no good reason. As a matter of fact, I could only remember her doing it one other time. She laid a girl out who was sticking up for her bully of a kid, then called Bobby Sue a nosy bitch for getting in the middle of it. The woman pulled the napkins away from her nose. She smirked at me, and I could see the meanness in her eyes, but it was quick. Before I could even register it, her expression turned to one of a wounded lamb, and she batted her eyes several times, threatening waterworks. 
I didn't do anything. I was just walking by, and she said it was my fault her horrible beast of a husband was suspected of killing Judge Moore. She did not, barked Bobby Sue. She called Earl a murderer and said he was going to get what was coming to him. Sheriff Scottsdale looked back and forth between the two women, trying to decide who to believe. I don't know what started it. I do, I said, shaking off Hunter's attempt to restrain me. Bobby Sue just told you, in case you haven't noticed in your first couple interactions with her, she calls it as she sees it. She's no liar. If she says that's what happened, then that's what happened. Busted Nose started to protest, but the sheriff held up his hand. It doesn't matter what was said, Mrs. Baker. You can't just go around throwing punches. Bobby Sue crossed her arms. Oh, but she could go around calling good folks murderers? Sheriff Scottsdale heaved a sigh. No, but being a loudmouth isn't against the law. The woman humphed in victory, but he glared and facepalmed her. On the flip side, if you shoot your mouth off, you better be ready to get popped in it. Mrs. Baker, do you think you can control yourself from here on out? Bobby Sue scowled, but Earl stepped up. Uh, yes, you can, he said, lowering his brows and giving her a squeeze around the shoulders that was more prompting than comforting. Can't you, darling? Narrowing her eyes for a moment at the woman, she said, I reckon I can, long as she stays away from me. She keeps... Earl cleared his throat and glowered at her, and she snapped her mouth shut. The sheriff turned to the blonde. You're going to stay away from the bakers. They have official business here. You do not. Steer clear. Consider this sort of an informal, verbal restraining order. Because any more problems, and I'll arrest you for being a public nuisance. Bobby Sue stared at the woman, her eyes triumphant, until the sheriff turned to her. And the same goes for you. You got some places you have to go for the competition. Otherwise, if you see her, steer clear. And the fine for simple battery in this county is 200 bucks. If you want to write the check to pay your fine now, I'll do the paperwork when I get back, rather than making you come down to the courthouse. 200 bucks, she said, outraged. For 200 bucks, I... Earl stepped in front of her, eyebrows pulled down. For two hundred bucks, she counts herself lucky to be out of jail, he finished for her. Give me a minute to get the checkbook. I went to stand beside her while he went inside, just in case she decided to get her two hundred dollars worth. That seemed a little high for just a bloody nose, so I couldn't blame her, but it was what it was. I was just thankful that we lived in Podunk, USA, where paying a fine was still an option to sitting in jail, waiting for days to get a court date. Sheriff Scottsdale didn't have to do that, and I gave him a nod of thanks. Don't make me regret it, he told me. Blondie wasn't pleased with the turn of events at all, but when she opened her mouth to say something else, the sheriff shut her up with a glance. You're on thin ice, too, Mrs. Babcock. As a matter of fact, I have some questions for you. Earl came back, check in hand, and held it out to the sheriff. Glancing down at it, Sheriff Scottsdale gave one sharp nod and turned back to Bobby Sue. I mean it. Pretend she's the plague. Same to you, he told Busted Nose. She shot him a withering look, but teetered away on leopard print heels so high they defied physics. I'm no fashionista but between the shoes and the blinding gold lycra straining at the seams across her backside, I had to wonder if the woman owned a mirror. With another warning glance, Sheriff Scottsdale turned on his heel and walked away. And stay out, Bobby Sue muttered under her breath, watching the Babcock woman wobble away. Jiggling worse than two possums battling it out inside a gunny sack. Once they were gone, I turned to her. What the hell? I asked. She narrowed her eyes and planted her hands on her hips. Don't you sass me like that, young lady. She came over here running her trap about Earl being a murderer. And why would she say that? 
because she happened to be walking by when the sheriff was talking to us earlier. Somebody says they saw Earl over in that direction a couple minutes before somebody stuck that fork in more. But he wasn't. He was right here. She shook her head. No, he wasn't. Remember, he was at the Great Hall using the little boy's room. I closed my eyes, fearing the worst. I would forgot about that. So, what did the sheriff say? Earl, who'd been quiet, said, I ain't the onlyest one who could have been there, so right now I'm just a person of interest. Plus, I was talking to old man Atkins in the john, so I have a sort of alibi. I arched a brow, and he frowned at me. I mean, I was talking to him when I was washing my hands. He was coming as I was going. Weren't like we were having no gab session. So that clears you? I asked, reaching around Bobby Sue to grab a mint out of a plastic container she had sitting out. He shook his head while he was loading more wood into the grill. They were still doing a heck of a business out of the truck. It don't clear me exactly, but puts me back far enough in the line that I don't stand out any more than four or five other people do. Hunter nodded. Scottsdale can't share a lot with me for obvious reasons, but he did say Earl wasn't the only suspect. Well then, Bobby Sue said, we'll just have to figure out who did do it so as we can put it behind us. Yeah, if only. Chapter 19 Since there was nothing else to do, I headed back to my tent. When I got there, a mirrored sconce I'd made out of an old horse collar was on the ground right at the perimeter of the tent, and I smiled. It took Hunter a minute to figure out what had happened, but he grinned when he did. If you were allowed to market that magic, you'd make a mint in the anti-theft business. Smiling, I picked up the sconce, glad that I'd left the Sticky Fingers charm up on the tent that morning. Unlike most of my pieces, I'd paid a pretty penny for the collar because it was in near mint condition, and the profit margin on it was slim. I shook my head as I hung it back on the pegboard. Some people. I texted Shelby to see if they'd found Ranger, and they hadn't. She was beside herself, but had to get back to Bobby Sue's because it was Sunday and she had to waitress as well as manage. Gabby was at the show, but Will and Cody were going to keep looking. Will had put some calls into the neighboring farms, but they hadn't seen him. Hunter went into the trailer to watch NASCAR, since he'd seen about everything on the grounds two or three times already. Justin wasn't set to compete until three, so we had some time to burn. Sighing, I pinched the bridge of my nose. One more worry to add to the pile. A few more customers trickled in, but my mind kept wandering. I'd played it off as no big deal, but the whole time thing bothered me. I didn't particularly want to wait till I got home to talk about it, but I didn't have much choice. Besides, there were bigger fish to fry. Addie popped in right as an ample woman wearing a floral polyester dress held up one of Anna Mae's period gowns. It looked like it was probably circa late 1800s. Like most dresses from that period, it was made for a tiny woman. There was no way I could have worn it, even had I been inclined to shoehorn myself in with a corset, which I wasn't. She snapped her fingers at me, even though I was talking to another customer about one of my clocks. Do you have this in another size? I looked at her, annoyed. Surely she wasn't serious. Uh, no, ma'am, I don't think we do. I'll be right with you. I'm in a hurry and don't have time to dawdle. Check and see, she said, as if she were in Target. She looked down her nose at me when I didn't hop to. Well, don't just stand there. The customer I was with, a friendly lady whose husband collected old signs, rolled her eyes and smiled. Go ahead, I'll look around. I became more irritated at the insufferable old bat just because the sign lady was being so nice about it. Do you have a fitting room? The Southern Belle wannabe asked, looking around. Addie cracked up. Yes, please do. Show her to the back of the horse trailer, where she can split the seams clear out of that gown. 
She mimicked the woman, holding an invisible dress in front of her and making a fish face. Chop, chop, darling, she said, clapping her hands. I have a bowl to get to right after tea and crumpets and my pumpkin awaits. She twirled around in the air like she was waltzing with an invisible prince. I lowered my brows at her and bit my lip to keep from laughing. Sometimes she got to have all the fun just because people couldn't see her, but I decided I was going to outdo her this time. I turned to the woman who was tapping her foot and looking at me like I was a half-wit. I'm sorry, ma'am, but this isn't Macy's, and uh, I'm not your lady's maid, nor is that dress, which was made for an 18-inch waist, going to fit either of us anytime soon. That being said, even if I had a dressing room and thought it would fit you, I have neither the time nor the inclination to deal with rude people. I gave her my biggest fake smile when her jaw dropped. Have a good day. She sputtered and, well, I niffered a bit, but turned and left after tossing the dress onto the counter. The woman I'd been talking to grinned. Ain't it great working for yourself? It sure is, sugar. It sure is. The woman ended up buying three of the sign clocks and a washboard and a maid turned into a memo board. When she left, I decided to close it up for the afternoon so I could go poke around a little before Justin's competition. A familiar, honeyed voice said, I decided to come see you since I had a few minutes to spare before I open up my booth. I took a deep breath and turned around to face Serena, a half-smile on my lips. Actually, I was planning on coming to see you, I said, Time's just gotten away from me, between running this, I motioned around me, and the murder that happened up at the barbecue competition. She raised a brow at the time reference. Poor choice of words, I said, dipping my head, uh, but still accurate. Do you have somewhere we can talk? She asked, running her fingers over some of Anna May's peasant skirts. And then maybe I'd like to take a better look at these. The bright colors suited her. In fact, she was wearing one at that very moment. Sure, I said, motioning toward the chairs. Uh, Let's sit down. Do you want something to drink? I have a gallon of tea and Cokes, too. A bottle of water, if you have one, would be lovely. I grabbed her a bottle of water and me a Coke from the cooler, then joined her in the camp chairs, arranged under the trailer awning. She examined me for long enough that I started to fidget. Do you have any questions you are wanting to ask me, Sheer? Or should I go first? I pulled in a deep breath and let it out. I have about a hundred questions, but don't even know where to start. Let's start with the easiest one. What did I do? She smiled. That's not exactly an easy one, but you're right. In this case, it's one of the simpler ones to answer. You slowed time. Nobody can completely stop it because of physics. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't even be able to slow it down. Temporal magic is rare and dangerous, as I'm sure you've already realized. Nodding, I said, Yeah, I have. I'm already wondering if I changed the course of things yesterday and put us on the track for World War Three or something. She smiled a little and waved a hand. It's not a light thing, but it's a done thing. You can't undo it, so the best thing you can do is think positive. Maybe you took us off the track for war. The important thing is that you don't do it again. Yeah, that would be my preference, but considering I don't know how I did it to begin with, I'm not sure how to avoid it. It's all about intent, she said, shaking her head. But you know that already, girl. That's what all magic's about. I do, I said. So you're saying I just need to be hyper-aware and it won't happen again? She pinched her lips together. I hope for your sake it comes that easy for you, child. The way she spoke made me think she was 
much, much older than the forty or so she appeared to be, and she smiled as if she knew an inside joke. You're not wrong, she said. This isn't my first century on this planet. Scowling, I said, Hey, don't crawl around in my head. What, like you tried to crawl around in mine last night? I looked down. I was busted. I was just trying to see if I could trust you. Oh, girly, lesson number one is that skill there is only as dependable as the power of the person you're using it on, and on your own power and control. I show what I want to show, and if that means I want you to trust me, then that's what you'll see. Wow, uh, that made me feel much better. She waved a long, slender finger with a large turquoise ring on it at me. That don't mean I didn't show you the truth. It just means I didn't have to if I didn't want to. And you shouldn't trust that so much. You're powerful, but unfocused, given your new gift. The way she said it made me believe she didn't consider it a gift at all. You need to work on that, and fast. She gave that a few seconds to settle, then smiled. Now, how about those skirts, doll baby? I may just take them all. Chapter 20 She did end up buying every last one of them that fit, and then I set the wards on the booth. I sat back down, sipping my Coke, and thinking about what she'd said as the sound of the race trickled out through the window of the trailer. The only problem was that she hadn't said much. I was going to have to wait till I got home to talk to the fam and the council. I thrust it to the back of my mind and sent a text to Shelby. She took a few minutes to answer, and when she did, she said they were slammed at the restaurant, but that Ranger still hadn't turned up. Frowning, I tried to imagine where he might have gone. There were several different farms around us, but none as big as ours. Surely if somebody had found him, they'd have come looking. Growling in frustration and kicking myself for the thousandth time for not getting the chair guy's number, I poked my head inside to see if Hunter wanted to go with me to snoop and watch Justin. He shut off the TV and followed me out. Too many crashes anyway, took out almost every guy in the run for points, so it's pretty much over anyway, he said. I'd never been a huge NASCAR fan, so I just nodded. Oh, wait, I said. Let me leave a card in case that guy comes looking for the stools. I pulled one out of my purse and taped it to the back of one of the chairs after scribbling a quick note on the back asking him to call me. Now, let's just hope he shows, I said, rejoining him. Did you get the names of the guys who won with Earl's and Jimbo's recipes? He nodded and pulled out his phone to check the time as we strolled up the grassy aisle between craft booths. I was just thinking that. We have a few minutes before we need to be there for Justin, he said, slinging an arm over my shoulders. Fancy a little barbecue? I bumped him with my hip. You read my mind. Jeff Akers, the one who'd used Jimbo's bean and sausage recipes, owned a truck called Smokin' Hot. We stood back and examined the menu while a couple others in line placed their orders. There was sausage and beans on the menu, so I decided to take a shot in the dark and order them both, though I didn't figure he'd be ballsy enough or stupid enough to serve the food he'd made with the recipes to the public. I stepped to the window when it was my turn and placed my order. The guy looked to be in his early 30s and was just starting to get a gut. Are you the owner? My sister came here yesterday and said y'all just had the best food ever. He turned on his thousand-watt smile, and I couldn't help but notice he had a chipped front tooth, no doubt from stealing from somebody else. I sure am. Jeff Akers, miss. Glad y'all are here enjoying my food. Matter of fact, I won my first awards with him yesterday my grandpappy's recipes. Okay, so he was a thief and a liar, unless Jimbo had kids he didn't know about. I gave him my best witchy smile when I paid him because I couldn't resist just a little payback. 
I flicked my wrist and the fresh pan of beans his partner had just set on the counter slipped to the floor, upside down. Gosh, I said, as he jumped back to avoid the splash. That's a shame. All them award-winning beans wasted. Hunter waited till his back was turned to smile. You're a little evil sometimes. I like it. He reached for the sausage, and I pulled it out of his reach. No way. This is research. Now, what's the name of the other place? Grillin' and Chillin', owned by some tool named Al Cassidy. If the guy's actions hadn't already given him away, just his name sounded like it had belonged to somebody who should have 316 stamped on his forehead. There, I just ordered the sausage, and when I tried to engage the guy, a classy-looking dude wearing a wife-beater and a grungy cowboy hat just grunted and shoved the sausage at me with one hand and snatched my cash with the other. Though he did take the time to try to look down my shirt. Armed with our potential evidence, we hurried to Bobby Sue's. Justin's eyes about popped out of his head when he saw what I was carrying. You ordered barbecue from somewhere else? I scoffed and ruffled his hair. Cool your jets, brat. This isn't lunch. It's research. Where's Earl? And aren't you supposed to be making steak? Earl's over at Jimbo's for a minute. He jerked his head toward a prep table set up by the grill. There were three massive steaks wrapped in plastic lying there. They can't go on the grill cold, else they won't cook right, he said, checking the temperature on the grill. Okay, then. How much longer? I won't be putting them on for another 15 minutes or so, he said, puffing up his chest like a little banty rooster. You got time to go talk before you watch The Master. He grinned, which was a good thing, because I was about to give him a boot for getting too big for his britches. I rolled my eyes. Phew, thank goodness for small favors. I'll be back in a couple. Earl and Jimbo were heavy in conversation when we approached. Earl narrowed his eyes and nodded toward the food. What you got there? Well, Hunter said, if you go by what the first guy said, we got us some award-winning sausage and beans. Figured we'd come share. While he was talking, I handed Earl the sausage from the guy who'd supposedly used his recipe and Jimbo the sausage and beans that may have been made from his. Picking at the bun on his, Earl said, Hmm, potato bread. Way too soft to hold up to sausage. Lesson it's so dry there ain't no juice to sop the bread. He took a tentative bite of the sausage sticking out the end, and even from there, I could tell he was right about the juice. The look on his face as he mashed the meat around on his palate became freaking terrifying. I was afraid maybe I'd gone too far. That's my recipe, all right. Though he cooked it plumb to death. Where'd you say this came from? I held up my hand. In a minute. Uh, Jimbo? He'd just been off the end of his sausage, but spit it out, grimacing. It's my recipe, all right, but same as Earl's, it's cooked to death. He took a nibble of the beans and scowled. That's mine, too, and they're actually cooked decent. Wow, not just one of them, but both of them had been either brave enough or dumb enough to sell it outright. Looking at the two grizzlies in front of me, I decided it had to be stupidity, at least if they knew who they were stealing from. Chapter 21 So now what? I said. Earl pulled in a deep breath and blew it slowly out his mouth in an effort to get a hold of himself. Well, now nothing. This ain't nothing we didn't already know. All we did was confirm it. A connection between the two of them would be good, though. Justin hollered for us to come over, and the tone of his voice told me it wasn't good. He was scrolling furiously through something on his phone, and when we got there, he glanced up from it, fear on his face. Well, what are you caterwauling about, boy? Earl said. I found something in that barbecue forum, and it ain't good at all. 
I was scrolling through trying to figure out if I could find any ISPs or any other way to figure out at least where they're from, and I found something in one of the subtopics. Jimbo rolled his fingers at Justin. Okay, you're speaking computer geek. Hurry up and speak English so we all know what you're talking about. Justin rolled his eyes and sighed, exasperated. I found a comment in a chat room that looks like it was wrote by Earl, except we all know that ain't true. That much I could agree with. Earl wasn't exactly a chat room kind of guy. He still had a flip phone. He handed me the phone, and Hunter read it over my shoulder. Bobby Sood popped out of the trailer while he was explaining it to us. Well, don't just stand there reading to yourself, Bobby Sue said. Spit it out. In the comments section, on a page discussing recipes, one person linked to the recipes for sale page, and a member using the handle BSBBQKLGA replied, It ain't healthy stealing from others. BSBBQKLGA, Bobby Sue's Barbecue, Keyhole Lake, Georgia. Oh, that was so not good. Let me see that, Bobby Sue said, snatching the phone from me before I could scroll through and see if there were any more comments below it. She read it, then thrust it back to Justin. Does it say anything else? I asked. He glanced at the screen. Not from him. A couple questions about how to get the recipes, but that's it. Hunter ran his fingers through his hair and glanced at Bobby Sue. What are you looking at? You know as well as I do, Earl wasn't the one that did that. He don't even mess with computers. Anything needs doing, I'm the one. Oh, she said, a look of comprehension dawning. But I had an alibi. I was right here. Yeah, I said, and Earl wasn't. Hunter scrubbed a hand over his face. Okay. I don't know why somebody's gone out of their way to sabotage you guys, or for that matter why the sheriff hasn't already seen this himself, but he needs to, and it needs to come from us. Earl had been quiet for most of the time. You reckon that's a good idea? Ain't like it was us anyway. Don't they have some way to prove who wrote it? I shook my head. It doesn't work that way. You see it on TV all the time. He'd have to get a subpoena for the site. Then there's all kinds of privacy laws they can claim. She's right, Justin said. Especially in a private group like that one. Our teachers told us that when we were talking about being safe online. You never know who somebody really is. I sent a silent thanks to a teacher who seemed to have some common sense and was trying to keep her kids out of the hands of predators, then a curse on thieves right behind it. Earl cleared his throat but nodded toward the grill. Ain't it about time for you to be seasoning that meat, boy? Justin jumped like he'd been stung, then glanced at the clock on his phone. Oh my gosh, you're right! He shoved past me and started flipping the steaks out of the plastic. I could see his little body shaking, and his hands were fumbling with the plastic. Earl went to him and placed his hand on his shoulder, giving him a little shake. Calm down, son, he said, when Justin finally looked up at him. Slow down. When you hurry is when you make mistakes. It's just a steak. You've cooked a hundred of them, and you put your best into every one. These ain't no different. Justin took a deep breath, then nodded as Earl stepped back. I got this. He muttered it to himself a few times as he turned back to what he was doing, and I smiled. Earl was a good daddy. I was glad all over again that fate had brought us together. While Justin seasoned his meat and dropped it onto the grill with a sizzle, we debated whether or not to call Sheriff Scottsdale. I'm telling you, it'll be better if it comes from you, Hunter said. Earl kept glancing around us at Justin and starting to fidget like he had ants in his pants. He opened his mouth, then slammed it shut again. 
We should probably listen to. I about jumped out of my skin when Jimbo held up a finger and cut me off mid sentence. Don't you dare touch that handle, kiddo. I looked over and sure enough, Justin was frozen with his hand over the wooden handle, getting ready to lift it up. Not that I'm coaching you or anything, Jimbo said, holding up his hands. Just thought I saw a bee on it. Didn't want you to get stung. Earl hid a smile and breathed out something along the lines of thanks. We debated for another few minutes as Justin finished cooking the steaks, then Hunter called the sheriff, but got no answer. After leaving him a voicemail, he turned back, and we all watched as Justin moved the steaks from the grill to the cutting board to rest while he readied the box with a bed of lettuce. He tested each of the steaks by poking them with his finger, then examined them to see which one looked best. Earl tilted his chair back on two legs, arms crossed while he watched him. You nervous? Hunter asked. He shook his head. Nope. He's got it. Almost don't matter which of them steaks he picks. Every one of them is a winner. He nailed it. Justin placed the steak on top of the lettuce, then fussed with it for a few seconds, getting it just right before he added a sprig of parsley and loosely closed the lid. I looked over my shoulder at Bobby Sue, who was standing in the doorway to the truck, leaning her shoulder against it with her arms and legs crossed. She was grinning like possum eating pumpkin seeds as she watched him. He glanced at Earl and Bobby Sue as I got out my phone. Y'all going up with me? Bobby Sue stepped down and Earl pushed out of his chair. Course we are, he said. Justin, grab your box and the three of you stand together, I said, readying my camera. They huddled, with Justin in the middle, holding his very first competition box, and all three of them grinning to beat the band. I snapped a few in a row, just in case somebody's eyes were closed. Then they rushed off to submit his entry. How long will it take? I asked Jimbo. With stakes, not long. Especially considering there probably ain't that many entries since it's the kids. I'd say twenty minutes, maybe. They made it back, and he'd just finished cleaning up his mess and putting away the spices when the announcer called them to the stage. How many entrants were there? I asked Justin, half afraid there'd be too many, but hoping there was enough so that if he won, it wouldn't be by default. Fifteen, he said, and I picked up a small quiver in his voice. Bobby Sue pulled him against her side as they walked. Now you know, win or lose, you did your best. If you don't win this one, listen to what the judges say. Sometimes they give a critique, sometimes not. Cherry pick it, cause some of it's gonna be personal opinion, but some of it'll be right too. He was listening, watching the ground as they walked. And whether you come in first place or last, we're proud of you. You still cook a meaner steak than most grown men do, Earl said. Justin huffed out a breath. Last? Unless they ain't got taste buds, there's no way that steak is coming in dead last. Maybe not first, he said, shaking his head. But not last, that's for sure. I crossed my fingers and hoped to the fates that he was right. Waiting outside the great hall for the judges to appear was sheer torture, and we fidgeted as much as the kid did. Finally, though, they did. After all the platitudes and general pats on the back to all competitors was made, the judge picked up a small trophy and announced the honorable mention, which I learned is only a thing at some competitions, not others. They awarded third to a smiling blonde girl who looked to be about Justin's age, then second to a heavyset boy who beamed with pride. We held our breath. It was make or break time. He won, or he didn't. They were holding a huge trophy, a ribbon, and an envelope. And the winner of this year's youth grilling competition goes to... I looked down at Justin, standing there with his knees locked. His face was so red, I was afraid he was going to pass out if they didn't announce one way or another in the next couple seconds. 
Justin Poling of Bobby Sue's BBQ. Justin, come on up here. The place erupted in cheers. The one thing about get-togethers like those are that everybody wants to see kids do well. But Justin stayed rooted to the spot, then looked up when Earl gave him a shove on the shoulder. Go on, boy, Bobby Sue said, her smile so wide her eyes were crinkled half shut. You did it! Get up there! He stumbled forward, and it must have sunk in because he puffed up like a little banty rooster again, except this time he meant it. He shook hands with the judges and held his trophy aloft, waving to the crowd. He turned back toward us, and the judge said into the mic, Justin, you're forgetting something. I think this envelope has a check with your name on it. Justin turned on his heels, wearing his duh face on top of his grin, and took it, thanking him again. Come on, Justin, I said, slapping him on the back. Let's go find you the biggest Sunday this place has to offer. Chapter 22 We ended up finding an ice cream booth over at the fair, but Justin insisted we swing by and invite Billy, too. Bobby Sue had convinced him to leave the trophy at the truck, but he was wearing the ribbon pinned to his shirt. Sherry Lynn popped in while we were walking and squealed when she saw the ribbon. Oh, sweetie, we just knew you could do it. She was tearing up and fanning her face. I'm so proud of you. Thanks, he said. And I want money, too. Five hundred whole bucks. Mercy, Sherry Lynn said. What are you going to do with it all? Bobby Sue raised an eyebrow. He's going to put some of it back, then hold on to the rest of it a while till he has time to think about it a little. Sherry Lynn nodded, her expression serious. Of course he is. That's definitely the best plan. Justin grinned and said out of the corner of his mouth, Then I'm going to buy some video games and a slingshot. No slingshot, Bobby Sue snapped. Them things ain't nothing but an accident waiting to happen. I'll have to agree with that one, Sherry said. I got hit with a rock flung from one of them when I was a kid. Still got the scar. We told her where we were going and asked her to come along. Her face brightened. I'd love to. Serena and I had a nice chat the other night between clients. She furrowed her brow. You know, I don't know how she does it. Everybody either wants to know if they're going to get married or if their significant other is cheating on them. That'd make me crazy in no time flat. I agreed. I wasn't a fan of dealing with the public in general, but if I had to do her job, I don't think I'd last a week. By that time, we'd made it to the petting zoo, and I was happy to see it was still early enough that there was no line outside of Serena's tent. We could hear video game noise from inside. I stuck my head in and called, hello, and she yelled, Madame Zarina isn't seeing clients yet. I laughed and called back, can Madame Zarina and her delightful offspring stop playing Zelda long enough to make time for some free ice cream? The noise paused, and Billy popped his head out from behind a curtain that separated the back of the tent from the front. When he saw Justin's ribbon, he rushed forward for a closer look. Dude! You won? That's awesome. Serena congratulated him. So, you want ice cream, do you, little one? Yes, Justin said. A huge sundae with caramel and chocolate and strawberry syrup and cherries. Of course, Serena said, fluttering her hand to her chest. You can't forget the cherries. I happen to know just where to get that. She led the way past the booth that we'd found and stopped at one that had waffle cones on display. The woman inside smiled when she saw Serena and slid the glass door open. Hey, Serena, what's up? Serena explained what we were celebrating, and it wasn't long before we all had enough ice cream in front of us to put us into sugar comas. I ordered a banana split, and Hunter asked if I wanted to split it. I snorted and looked at him like he'd lost his mind. He had gotten to know me pretty well, but sometimes I still had to remind him who he was dealing with. 
We plowed through our treats, and Justin regaled us with each and every second, describing everything from how he picked the steaks to how nervous he was waiting to hear the results. Soon, though, Serena had to go open up her booth, and we had to get back to the trailer. I'm going to call the sheriff again, too, Hunter said. It's a little strange, at least from what I've seen from him, that he hasn't called me back. We'd gone over the bare bones of it with Serena, and she ran her tongue along her teeth. I don't like to get involved. You know how I feel about messing with the natural order of things, she said. But I get the feeling you got somebody working against you here. Sherry Lynn rolled her eyes. Do you have any idea how much that sounds like something Madame Zarena would say? Serena huffed in frustration. Yes, young one, I do. And I'm trying to do my best to walk the line between helping and interfering. It's fine most of the time. Let's try it this way. I noticed that the cadence of her honeyed Cajun accent became thicker when she was serious. There's not just one person behind this. Men know I can't see a face or even tell how many, though I do sense a woman. Just watch your backs. They've already shown they're willing to kill. I'd hate to be seeing harm come to any of you. Hunter had stepped away from the table and came back shaking his head. He still didn't answer. That's so odd. If I were in his shoes, I'd be tracking every lead, especially if it was semi-credible. I lifted a shoulder. I guess he's not you. I guess not. He worried his lip. I just hope he hasn't come up with something and he's avoiding me. Now that is something I'd do. That didn't make me feel better at all, and I no longer felt like celebrating. Sherry Lynn, are you down for some snooping? We need to find out what the connection is between the two guys that used Earl's and Jimbo's recipes. Serena nodded. That feels right to me. It's what I do. Just watch out, because when you poke a bit of vipers, you're likely to get bit. Chapter 23 We were cutting up on the way back to their truck when my phone rang. It was Shelby. Hey, tell me something good, I said. Well, I have something sort of good. I could hear the bustle of the restaurant in the background. And sort of bad, too. I sighed. Why did that seem to be my life lately? Okay, start with the something good. There was a note in the mailbox about Ranger, but it, it had rained, and you know how that stupid thing leaks. I did. It was one of those things I didn't think about until it rained, then forgot about till it rained again. I did almost everything online anyway, so it wasn't like it was foremost in my mind to keep the junk mail dry. Okay, so what happened? Hunter had gone quiet, listening. It was written in marker, and it said, I think I have your horse. He's fine, or at least I think it said fine. Then it said, if he's yours, call 377. Then I think the next number was either a zero or an eight, and the rest was completely illegible. I huffed out a breath. Okay, so at least we sort of know he's okay. No name? I think there was, but it was just a blue blur. Couldn't read it at all. That took a load off my mind. Wherever he was at, he was with somebody and was all right, so I could push aside the nightmares of him being stuck on his side in a ditch somewhere. The next trick was to find out who had him. Will doesn't have any idea? Her eye roll was practically audible. Yeah, he knows, but he's keeping it for a surprise. Of course he doesn't. He's called everybody. Twice. None of our existing people have him. Then what's the bad news? Some guy stopped in here asking for Earl from an Atlanta newspaper. He's actually sitting at a table eating right now. Oh, crap. Hang on a second. I'm putting you on speaker. I motioned for everybody to stop and huddle, explaining. An Atlanta reporter is at the restaurant asking questions about Earl. I held the phone out flat between us. Okay, Shell, go ahead. 
Anyway, we're slammed tonight. And this guy comes in asking about Earl and says he understands he's a prime suspect in the murder. Uh, I told him no comment, but now he's over there asking other customers questions. Uh, What do I do? Bobby Sue scowled. Go over there right now and tell him to get out. We have no comment. I'm not good at that, Shelby said. I held up my hand to Bobby Sue. Let me think for a second, sister. Sherry Lynn's eyes lit up. It's Sunday, right? I nodded. Then it's simple, she said, as if I were missing the obvious, which I was. We have a PR person that handles all of the information in Keyhole, and I happen to know that she's at Brew right now, pumping Rayanne for info about that server she hired. It's making her crazy that she can't dig up any information on her before Christmas. Says it's creepy, someone not having a past. My mental light bulb went off. Of course, Cora Lee. Glancing at Sherry Lynn, I said, You're brilliant. How fast can you bring her up to speed on what's going on here? She cocked a brow and shook her head. Sugar, when have you ever known Cora Lee not to be up to speed on anything? Point taken. Will you pop the rays and tell them what's going on? She grinned and gave a little salute. Justin, honey, we're all super proud of you. He smiled and saluted back, and she was gone. Is she on the way yet? Shelby asked. It was getting louder in the background. Old Lady Schumacher just headed to the booth behind him, and you know how batty she can be. She'll say whatever she finds, never mind. I see Coralie crossing the street right now. Sherry Lynn looks like she's talking a mile a minute, so she'll probably fill her in. I gotta go. We are really busy. Justin, congratulations, big guy. Love y'all. She hung up, and I slid my phone back in my pocket. Bobby Sue's lips were pinched together, and Earl's brow was drawn so low I could barely see his eyes. Reporter from Atlanta? What's a reporter from Atlanta doing in my restaurant? That was an excellent question but I just had to trust that Cora Lee would handle it. I could only keep track of so many fires at once. Chapter 24 We were almost back to the truck when a flash of bright yellow caught my eye. I swiveled my head to see what it was and tapped Hunter in the belly with the back of my hand to get his attention. I shushed everybody and pointed. Ain't that the boss lady who runs the fair? Bobby Sue asked, squinting in that direction. The one who was at the murder? Yeah, Gregoria Stanton, I said, thinking to myself that somebody should probably tell her yellow wasn't her best color. She kept glancing around like she was waiting for someone, and by the time we realized who she was, a man walked around the corner of the giant refrigeration unit she was hiding behind. It wasn't long before the conversation seemed to heat up. Both of them were gesticulating and pointing. Who's that she's talking to? Earl asked. That would be Al Cassidy, I said. The owner of Grillin and Chillin. The reason he's able to live up to the name is because he doesn't have to spend any time coming up with his own recipes. Apparently, he does okay with yours. Earl growled and turned in their direction but Bobby Sue grabbed him by the back of the shirt and pulled him back. I'll tell you the same thing you told me, she said. Ain't neither one of us gonna do the other any good, or just either, if we're in jail. It'll work itself out. I was relieved to hear her say it, but one glance at her face told me her resolve might not last forever. If looks could kill, there'd be two folks dropping dead at that moment. Let's go back to the truck. Hunter said, picking up the same vibe I was. Max, who had been so quiet I'd almost forgotten he was with us, spoke up. It occurs to me that it would be good to know what they're saying, he said. No shit, Sherlock, I said, raising a brow. You have some kind of magical listening device? He waggled his ears. As a matter of fact, I do. You may be surprised to hear this, but not many folks suspect that I can carry their conversations back to anybody. 
so they tend to just keep talking like I'm not even there. Every once in a while, he'd say something like that, and it would make my heart ache a little for him. It had to suck for him, but usually he'd keep talking, and the warm and fuzzies would go away. It's not like anybody else has been able to come up with anything. If we're ever going to get out of this giant nightmare of a funhouse, it looks like I'm going to have to take care of it myself. See what I mean? It didn't usually take more than a sentence or two to toughen me right back up toward him. We were less than 50 yards from them. Okay then, donkey genius. Go hear what you can hear. He trotted off and cut between two trailers so he could circle back around and probably pretend to be eating. Or, you know, actually find a trash can with half-eaten candy in it. At any rate, Hunter and I bolted forward to catch up as Earl stomped the rest of the way to his truck. Serena had said a woman was involved, but I hadn't expected it to be that woman. We just sat down and popped the tops on our beers when Max reappeared. He flopped down by Earl and heaved a deep breath. Several seconds passed, and he didn't say anything. Well, I said, not in the mood to deal with his theatrics. What were they talking about? Oh, he said, yawning. You know, just people getting stabbed over recipes. I only caught the tail end of the conversation. For once, Earl was even irritated at him. Come on, Max, quit messing around. We need it, word for word. Another huge donkey sigh. Fine. She said... I can't believe you were stupid enough that you thought you'd get away with using Earl Baker's recipe. Everybody knows that sausage. And he said, So what? Prove it. Hunter had leaned forward and propped his elbows on his knees. That's it? No. Then she said she was only notifying him as a courtesy that the cops knew about the recipe poaching. She said, her words. I'd watch your back if I were you. I've already eliminated one person who wouldn't cooperate and won't hesitate to eliminate another. And she was really growly when she said it, with her finger in her face. Then she spun off and left him standing there. We sat, staring at each other in stunned silence. Looks like Serena was dead on, Bobby Sue said. Now, we just got to prove it. Chapter 25 Sheriff Scottsdale showed up at our trailer the next morning, right after Shelby had told me Ranger was still missing. Not the best start to the day. We told him about the chat. His text had already found the comment that he was up in the air about what to do. Apparently, there were other comments of similar nature, though that one was the only one that was even close to being identifiable. That's actually what's saving his bacon right now, he said, even though my knee-jerk reaction was to lock him up and call it done. That's a little too easy. He may be a lot of things, but I don't think he's stupid. I breathed a sigh of relief, thankful there was a man investigating who had a little common sense. That being said, it doesn't take him off the suspect list. As a matter of fact, the old man he says he talked to doesn't remember talking to him, and Gregoria Stanton swears she saw him in the general area right before the body was found. Hunter shook his head. About that. We saw her having a heated discussion with Al Cassidy last night over behind the carnival's refrigeration units. I assume you know who that is? He nodded. The guy who supposedly used Earl's recipe. I didn't like the way he said supposedly, but I let it slide. Yeah, I said. That's him. She looked angry. At one point, she put her finger in his face. Turning his gaze to me, he said, You saw this? Did any of you hear what they were talking about? Oh, crap. Hunter and I looked at each other. 
We could hardly say what my donkey reported back. That meant we either had to lie or leave the information out. I sighed. I wasn't comfortable fudging the truth, and I didn't want to put Hunter in that position either. No, we didn't. Sheriff Scottsdale took off his hat, ran his fingers through his hair, and shoved it back on. I sure wish you would have. That would have tied up some loose ends. He glanced at Hunter. That woman is one of the least pleasant people I've ever dealt with, and to be honest, she's showing up a bit too much for my liking. You can only have so many coincidences. You know, we found all the meat and the beans that were stolen from Earl's and Jimbo's trailers, right? I asked. What meat? It was obvious from the look on his face that he had no idea what I was talking about, so I filled him in. He scratched his jaw, thinking. So why didn't anybody report this? They did, Hunter said, to the barbecue committee. It wasn't that much in quantity, but it did disqualify them from competing. I don't know where to put all that. We have a dead judge that was supposedly selling the recipes and taking bribes, but we can't prove it. Then we have two guys who supposedly bought recipes that belonged to two men here, whose food was stolen. Then we have a bitchy fair president who y'all say was talking to one of the thieves last night. We're missing the denominator that ties them all together. I bit my tongue to keep from telling him about the conversation, but I couldn't back it up, and I couldn't lie. Ugh, I wished the rest of the world would hurry up and catch up to us magical folks. But no, you always had the extremists who'd either want to study us or burn us at the stake, which completely off-topic, is cruel and unusual punishment. We just have to find a way to prove it without calling the 16th century noble ass to the stand. People were starting to trickle into my booth, so I excused myself. I was a little surprised that people were showing for the last day, considering it was a Monday. But we did enough in business that by the time late morning rolled around, I'd sold pretty much everything we had. Even Anime's jewelry case, which had been stuffed full, was getting bare. Hunter pointed to the vanity. What's up with that? Oh, I said. TJ liked it and considered buying it, but you know, they don't have a ton of money right now. I thought we could drop it off to her on the way home as a birthday gift. She's turning the big 4-0 next week. When I'd first met her, my first thought was that she'd been around my age late twenties, or maybe a little older. But then we found out she was a witch. She just always thought it was due to good genetics and the high-dollar creams she'd slathered on morning and night. Turns out she was half right. Some witches are gifted, or cursed, with longevity, but not all of us. Personally, I was glad the Flynn witches weren't. I'd hate to watch all the people I care about get old and die while I stayed young and healthy. However, TJ was one of those who was blessed with it, and she seemed perfectly happy. Hunter looked at me like I'd lost my mind. No way she is 40. I nodded. She sure is, and Moore is a couple years older than her. He shook his head. I don't know if I'll ever get used to everything that comes with magic. Pushing up to my tiptoes, I gave him a kiss on the chin. You're doing great so far, sweetie. Ghosts, witches, werewolves, even angels. And you've taken it all in stride. He arched a brow at me, and I knew he was thinking back to the minor meltdown he'd had when he found out I was a witch. That doesn't count, I said. It was the first clue you had, and even then... You still asked me out, and here we are. Since we were down to practically nothing in the booth, I decided I was done. There were fireworks going off in the distance, and I wanted to go up and chill out with Bobby Sue and the rest of the gang. They were having their closing celebration, and the smell of wood smoke and cooking meat made my stomach growl. 
Should we load the rest of this stuff up now, or do you want to wait till we get back? Hunter asked, motioning to what little was left. I waved a hand at it. Leave it. It's not going anywhere. I made sure the wards were set, and my card was still taped to the stools, and we left. You coming, Max? Of course I'm coming, he said, climbing to his feet and giving a whole body shake. I'm starving. I hope they have other foods than what we've been eating. I didn't think I'd ever hear myself say this, but I'm sick of candy and barbecue. I raised my eyes, casting a surprised look in his direction. I didn't think I'd ever hear you say that either. What about Glenn LeVay? He snorted. Don't be ridiculous. Laughing, I said. Then come on, faithful sidekick. Let's follow our noses and hope for variety. Hunter swung his arms around my shoulders, and Max fell into step beside us, trotting to catch up. You know, Hunter said, eyes filled with humor, this hasn't been as relaxing as I thought it would be. I snorted. Really? I thought finding a dead body was the goal of every vacation. Can't think of anything I'd rather do in the morning, or in the afternoon, for that matter. <laughs> Nobody likes a smart ass, no. He gave my shoulders a squeeze. Seriously, though, with everything that's gone on, we haven't even taken the bikes off the trailer. I figured for sure we'd get at least some seat time in. Yeah, me too, I said, as the noise of the end-of-competition party grew louder. Maybe we'll take another weekend trip like we did when we first got together. That little cabin was awesome, and now I have my own bike. It was his turn to snort. Yeah, it was great, right up to the point where Max popped in and commanded us to go find his body. Max, as in Max of Wheeler Construction, had been murdered and took matters into his own hands by hunting us down to report it himself post-life. It was the first time Hunter met a ghost, and it was a bit jarring for him. Okay, up to that point then, I said. Plus, it turned out okay. He hummed in sort of agreement, and I wondered what my life looked like from his perspective. Crazy, no doubt. All the food trucks were closed and empty as we strolled up the aisle between them, The grass had been trampled to dirt, but besides that, it was hard to imagine that just a few hours before, the place had been packed with people. I was looking straight ahead and thinking about a thick burger when I caught a flash of color out of the corner of my eye. I whipped my head around to see what it was and laughed. A canary yellow poster board menu was taped to a truck a couple aisles over, and it must have flapped a little in the breeze. What's so funny, he asked, peering in that direction. Murderous menus, I said, shaking my head and taking a deep breath. Man, I'm glad this weekend is almost over. You and me both, sweetie. You and me both. Chapter 26 Justin ran up to us, Billy, close on his heels, when we got to the truck. I was glad he'd found a friend to play with and wondered if they'd ever see each other again. For some reason, I had a strong feeling they would. I was surprised to see Serena at the truck, helping Bobby Sue pack up and tear down the equipment. She smiled when she saw my expression. I may not run a food truck, Cher, but I do my share of moving. I know the process, and I'm grateful for that. Earl's good about helping, but he has a habit of just shoving stuff any which place. Plus, ain't no reason for her to sit over there all by her lonesome when we got all the action over here, Bobby Sue said. I looked toward the giant pavilion where we'd had the kickoff party. Several of the barbecues were in use, which seemed odd considering we had about a million grills around us. I realized Susie Q was all tied down and ready to hitch to the truck and did kind of a mental forehead slap. Four tables up front groaned under the weight of food. 
I could make out pie plates and sure hoped some of them contained actual pies and some deviled eggs. My stomach growled and Serena laughed. Girl, I don't know how you're not the size of a house. I grinned. Fast metabolism, for the most part, I added, smacking my rounded hip. And I'm grateful, at least for Hunter's sake. Speaking of Earl, where is he? He asked, avoiding that particular line of discussion. Over there, cooking, Bobby said. I scanned the crowd, but it took me a few seconds to find him. Usually, his bear of a form was easy to spot, but this weekend, he was the norm rather than the exception. Huh, I wondered if there was some kind of genetic link between large males and grill skills. Bobby Sue snapped the lock closed on the back doors of the truck, but before we walked away, I had a gut check and turned back to set the wards and put one over Susie Q in the trailer, too. With the way the weekend had gone, there was no such thing as too much C-Y-A. Serena noticed what I did and gave me a half smile. Good girl, she said, winking. Par for the course, there was a ton of food. Everybody had contributed, and I felt a little bad that we showed up empty-handed. Bobby Sue gave me her Mama Duck scowl when I said that. Sugar, you're part of BCB, and we contributed plenty. Y'all get up there and get your bellies full, and don't give that another thought. A band started tuning up, and the festive atmosphere was infectious. We spent the afternoon chowing down and mingling, and we even met a few more people who rode. Most of them were coming to the 4th of July competition in Keyhole, so they said they'd bring their bikes so we could get some riding in. My phone jangled as I was mopping the last bit of the bean juice up with my final bite of burger. Finally, the man who bought the chairs had shown up. Hunter went back and helped him load up so I could finish my pie, then returned, smiling, and handed me a 50. What's that for? I asked, taking the bill from him. He said it was a bonus for holding the stuff for him. Plus, he hadn't realized the table he bought was solid oak and that it was worth more than he paid. Nice man. Nice man, indeed. I stuffed the money in my pocket and gave Hunter a quick peck. Thanks for helping me all weekend. You're welcome he said, draping his arm around me and giving me a squeeze. The crowd murmured, and we looked around to see what was going on. The band was on intermission, and Gregoria Stanton had climbed up onto the stage. She tapped on the mic. It was hot, and she cleared her throat. First, let me say thank you to everybody who came together to make this year's competition a success. I looked at Hunter, shocked. Did she really just say that? She sure did. He was watching her with disbelief as she continued. I realized there were some bumps along the way and that some competitors may not have had an ideal experience. And don't forget one of the judges didn't have such a dandy time either. Somebody to my right muttered to his wife. But I've personally seen to those issues, and you can rest assured they won't happen again. Thank you again, and safe travels to you all. She paused for a minute, and there was a delayed spattering of confused, half-hearted applause, accompanied by a low rumble of hushed chatter. When it became clear she wasn't going to get the standing ovation she was expecting, she gave a tight smile and walked away from the microphone. Her paisley yellow pants strained at the seams as she presented us with her backside when she clambered down from the stage, and I thought for the tenth time that somebody really needed to give her a heads up on her fashion choices. She sure is a strange old bird, isn't she? Bobby Sue asked, and I ignored the possible double entendre. You reckon she killed the judge? I don't know, I said but she sure doesn't seem to be too upset at his passing. Hunter was frowning. That was disturbing. I'll say, I replied. I was afraid that seam was going to bust, and we were going to get a full moon. I was shooting for levity, but the creep-out factor remained. 
We hung out for another couple hours, then decided to head out early so we could be home before dark. Even if we visited for an hour or so with TJ and Moira, I wanted to have time to look for Ranger. Shelby has assured me they'd scrubbed every square inch of acreage within a two-mile radius, but I wanted to do it myself, too. Serena pulled me into a big hug, then pushed me back to arm's length. You take care of yourself, Cher, you hear? She slipped a card into my hand. I don't know if I can help any, but if you need anything, call. Her eyes were serious. Take the time to learn what you're capable of. A witch, especially one with your gifts, needs to know what she has. You know, to prevent world wars or not. Whatever the fates determine. I smiled and told her I would, though I had no idea how to go about it. We were packed up and pulling out in less than 15 minutes, and I was glad to put the place behind me. Chapter 27 It took us a little over an hour to get to TJ and Moira's, and we passed the first half of it talking about anything other than the murder. Errands we had to run, calls we had to make. His job as sheriff was usually low-key, especially that time of year. He had to settle disputes between little old ladies fighting over ugly lawn ornaments, talk tough to teenagers partying where they shouldn't be, and deal with the occasional drunk and disorderly, though most folks were good about minding their manners, at least once they left the bar. And when they got out of line, in the bar, the bartenders usually handled it themselves and didn't bother calling in the law. Things were about to pick up because tourist season was coming up, but even then, he'd deal more with lost items and traffic ticket disputes than anything else. And that's exactly how he liked it. He'd had a tough time of it in Indianapolis because of a bad love decision and had taken a deputy job in Keyhole Lake because he wanted to get away from all that. Little did he know that within three months of taking the job, somebody would up and knock off the sheriff, and he'd be left holding the bag. Though, to be fair, it worked out well for the entire town, and we were lucky he showed up when he did. The entire town, especially Anna Mae and Sherry Lynn, had lived under Hank Doolittle's thumb, and the world was a better place without him. And on the flip, Keyhole was a better place with Hunter as sheriff. Complete 180 in a matter of months. Max slept like the dead in the back seat until we pulled up to TJ's, and even then, it took him a few minutes to come around and realize where we were. When he did, though, his ears perked up, and he began clamoring for me to open his door. Give me a minute, Hunter snapped when he repeated himself for the third time. At least wait for the truck to come to a complete stop. Max started to say something else, but Hunter gave him the death stare. He clamped his mouth shut, but kept staring out the window, practically vibrating. He adored the girls, probably because they spoiled him rotten the first time they met him, assuming he was a pet. Whatever the reason, he was making Hunter batty, so as soon as we stopped, I jumped out and opened the door for him. Max was relatively small for a mini donkey, smaller than a Great Dane, but... He liked junk food enough that he was well over 200 pounds. When he jumped out without waiting for help, he landed right on my foot. I howled, leaning against the truck and holding it, and if Hunter had been shooting him dirty looks before, the one he was giving him then would have melted plastic. For his part, Max muttered an apology, then something about how I should have been standing back, then trotted toward the front porch. I considered getting back in the truck and leaving him there, but we had to unload the vanity. Moira and TJ were standing on the porch when we arrived, looking confused. I smiled and waved. You forgot something the other night when you left, I told TJ. She tilted her head up. I did? Yep. I unlocked the trailer and swung the door open, then stood back and used a couple of fingers to levitate the vanity up and out. You forgot your vanity. Where do you want it? 
She squealed and ran toward me, and I barely settled it on the ground before she flung her arms around me in a rare display of touchy feeliness. Happy birthday, I said, grinning and untangling myself. Poor Hunter was just standing back, hoping to avoid the crush. I would say you shouldn't have, but I'm glad you did. She motioned toward the house. Can you get it up the stairs? I rolled my eyes, and so did Mora, who joined us at the trailer. If three able-bodied witches and one strapping man can't get that upstairs, we well, may as well give up now, she said. Oh, yeah, good point. TJ's cheeks pinked. She was still so new to being a witch that it wasn't second nature to her yet. Then let's do it, I said. Bedroom at the end of the hall, right? Yep, she said. I'll run up and clear out a spot if y'all have this. Go on, Moira said, shooing her. It'll take a minute because we don't want to rush and risk that finish, Moira said. While she rushed upstairs, I lifted the piece up and told Moira, if you want to concentrate on keeping it stable, I'll move it. She nodded, and we got it to the porch, where Hunter was holding the door wide open. He guided it through so that it didn't bump the frame. The stairs were a bit trickier because I didn't want to angle it for fear of putting too much pressure on the large oval mirror I'd attached to it, but we made it. When we got to the top landing, I let it settle so I could take a breather. It wasn't nearly as physically taxing or finger-crushing as it would have been to move it manually, but it still took effort. There were a few thuds and bumps coming from TJ's room as she cleared a space, but by the time we were ready to move it the rest of the way, she was ready. Hunter guided it through the doorway. It was a tight fit after she showed us where she wanted it. When it settled into place, she ran her hands over it. A rush of pride hit me as she did. It was one of my better efforts, and seeing how much she liked it made my heart smile. That's a great place for it, I told her, and it even matches the rest of your furniture in here. It was meant for you. It was, she said. You have no idea how much I love it. Thank you. You're welcome. Happy birthday, even though we'll see you for it, too. I brushed my hands together. Now, do you have any tea? If I didn't, I'd make a jug. We headed to the kitchen, talking about what all had happened after they'd left Saturday night. And the lady who was running the fair, the one we saw talking to that guy, got up and gave this weird thank you speech. It was weird. Hunter said as he pulled out a chair at their table and reiterated what she'd said. Moira crinkled her brow as she poured us all a glass of tea. She pulled a bottle of scotch out of the cabinet and splashed a couple fingers into a salsa bowl for Max, who practically rubbed around her legs like a cat. That is odd. I wonder what her purpose was. I lifted a shoulder. I don't know, but it sure didn't make her look good. There's something not right with that woman. So, what's with the table? I asked. The last time I'd been there, they'd had a cute glass-topped one, but they'd replaced it with a long farm-style one, similar to the one I had at my place. They looked at each other, then Mora nodded. We've kind of become Switzerland, TJ said. Hunter dropped his brows. Switzerland? Yeah, Mora said. Apparently, since she was a healer, Nora sort of played the role of a remediator between, well, everybody, and now they expect me to fill her shoes. Wait, I said. Who's they? TJ shrugged. Everybody, the werewolves, other witches, whoever. Hunter leaned forward with his elbows on the table, and I could see him thinking. So, you just let them meet here to settle disputes on neutral ground, or you act sort of like the magical sheriff? Moira heaved a sigh. We're not sure yet. All we know is that so far, we've had a couple of squabbles, 
and people have asked for our help resolving it. It's not really a formal thing yet, so we're trying to figure out how we want to steer it. Just speaking from experience here, he said. So do with it what you will. Be careful getting between two people or groups. You may end up having to pick a side at one point. Then things will get ugly. TJ considered his words. I'm glad you spoke up. I hadn't considered that, but I can see it becoming an issue. I already feel like I'm running the cliff's notes on the whole magic thing, and the extra pressure isn't helping. Her Aunt Nora, the direct opposite of Addie in both appearance and personality, but not sass, popped in right then, almost directly in front of me, and I sloshed my tea. And that's what I've been telling her too, sugar, she said, floating over to Hunter. She looked at me over her readers as I grabbed a paper towel off the counter and sopped up my tea. It's not like you haven't seen a ghost before. You should be used to that by now. I scowled at her. I'll tell you the same thing I tell Addie every time she pops in and I spill something or about jab my eye out with my mascara wand. There's no way to get rid of the startle reflex. It's called a reflex for a reason. Y'all could be nicer and do like Sherry Lynn does most of the time. Fade in so we know you're coming. Phew, she scoffed, flapping her wrist at me. What would be the fun in that? She turned to TJ. Anyway, dear, the handsome sheriff here has a point. You need to consider your alliances carefully. And to do that, you need to get to know them and learn all you can about their histories, both locally and in general. Don't make any decisions until you know what you're getting yourself into. Moira nodded. I agree. Right now, we don't have many answers. Hell, I'm not even sure what questions to ask. That sounded like a hot mess to me. So I just told them good luck and offered my help should they need it. I had to wonder what I'd gotten myself into when I did, though. I'd be asking myself that same question a few months down the road. But of course, I didn't realize that then. Chapter 28 Since it was getting late afternoon and we were still an hour from home, we didn't dawdle long. As we were pulling out of her driveway, I thought I caught sight of a huge dog running through the tall grass on the other side of the road. Prejudiced though it may seem, the idea of werewolves sent a little tingle of fear, or maybe foreboding, down my spine. That was a being that could turn lethal fast, and I worried that TJ and Moira would be in something up to their elbows before they even realized they were standing in a swamp. I pushed it from my mind. There wasn't anything I could do about it, and I had plenty of other things on my mind that were more pressing. We were about halfway home when Hunter's phone rang. He motioned to it, and I picked it up out of the cup holder. Blaine Scottsdale, I told him, then answered it because he asked me to. Hey, Sheriff, everything okay? I asked. Uh, is this Sh Sheriff Woods' number? I laughed. <laughs> it is. He's just driving and asked me to answer when he saw it was you. This is Noel. I'm going to put you on speaker, unless you need to speak privately. It's just the two of us here, I said. When Max glared at me, I shrugged and mouthed, what? Well, except for my ass, that is. I made a face at him, and then Hunter glared at me. I cringed when the sheriff said, beg pardon, in a tone an octave higher than normal. Sorry, I meant my miniature donkey. Oh, yeah, I forgot about him. He rides in the truck? Sometimes I forgot how it probably looked to other people, but it just didn't feel right making him ride in the back. Not that he'd go for it anyway. Yeah, he's a bit of a diva. Another glare from the peanut gallery, and I gave him my most smarmy grin. Okay, then, and speaker's fine, because if Keyhole Lake is anything like Coatesville, the rest of the town probably already knows anyway. Knows what? Hunter asked, leaning closer to the phone. We had another murder. 
He sounded exhausted, and I could almost picture him running a hand over his face. Al Cassidy, the man who everybody said used Earl's recipe, was found shot dead in his food truck. Looks like it happened sometime right before the party got swinging. I glanced at Hunter, who looked as worried as I did. So what do you need me to do? He asked. Sheriff Scottsdale said, Just make sure Earl stays in town until I can get over there to question him and Bobby Sue. I was at the party and saw him, but they've put the time of death at around mid-morning, which means it could have been just about anybody. He took a deep breath. Truth be told, I don't know what to do with any of this. It's now spread to three counties. I didn't have enough on anybody to make an arrest stick for more than 24 hours, and now every suspect I have is scattered hither and yon. Did you hear the weird speech Gregorius Stanton gave? I asked. It was creepy. Creepy? She just thanked everybody and apologized for what had happened. Hunter looked at me and shook his head. We were viewing the speech through a different lens than the sheriff was. We knew she'd threatened the Cassidy guy, so the speech looked much darker from our perspective, but had no way to share that information without outing Max, and that wasn't even a possibility. Still, I said, it seemed like there was more to it than the usual thanks for coming, see you next year message. The way she said, She took care of it was unusual, don't you think? He lifted a shoulder. I didn't find it strange, but I did follow through. Miss Stanton said she disqualified both men and canceled the checks. Oh, I felt silly now that he put it in that light. I know you want to clear your friend, but I've already cleared her. Anyway, Hunter, would you please make sure Earl doesn't leave? I barely have enough staff to cover my shifts, let alone send somebody over there. It's no problem, Blaine. Earl's not going anywhere. He's got his family and his business. I'll make sure of it. They said their goodbyes after Sheriff Scottsdale promised to keep him posted, and I ended the call. My word's no good, but why didn't you tell him about the flash of yellow you saw? Max asked, still pouting. What flash of yellow? I asked. All I'd mentioned at the time was that it had been a menu. I hadn't said anything about it being a yellow one. I saw it too, out of the corner of my eye. Except from my angle, it wasn't the menu. It was farther from us than the menu was. Considering that made sense. Something that would have blended with the poster, because... It was at the same eye level to me would have been two different movements to Max. One lower, one higher. Then why didn't you say anything? I asked. He shrugged a furry shoulder. I didn't think any more of it than you did. But now that we know Alley Boy was murdered, it's a little more relevant. After all, we just passed his truck when we saw it. I concentrated trying to remember how close to it we'd been, and he was right. Then I tried to compare the yellow to what Gregoria Stanton had been wearing. It could definitely have been her. I glanced at Hunter. Now what do I do? He already thinks I'm trying to throw her under the bus. If I call back now, he'll think I'm crazy, especially since I didn't actually see anything other than a flash of yellow. He pressed his lips together and thought for a minute. Honestly, if it were me, I'd think you were making it up. I hate to say that, but considering he probably believes that's what they were talking about when we saw them together, then it would seem to me that you were grasping at straws to save Earl's butt, or to deflect attention away from yourself. He doesn't know us. I don't think any good would come of it. What a mess! I racked my brain, trying to figure out a way to prove she did it. It's just my opinion, but she seemed familiar with him, Max said. How so? Hunter asked. If they didn't know each other, I wouldn't think they would have been so clandestine. And the way she spoke to him wasn't exactly professional. He has a point. Hunter glanced at me out of the corner of his eye. 
I wouldn't perform any sort of official business like that. It was kind of shady. Since that was about all there was left to say about it, conversation drifted toward more personal topics, but my subconscious was still trying to cram all the pieces into a neat little puzzle that made sense. Not that it worked. Chapter 29 It was almost dark when we got home. Gabby ran out to greet us when we got there, excited to show me the check she'd made at the show that weekend. They'd placed in a couple different classes and took first in another, so even though it had barely covered her entry fees and travel, she was proud of herself. And you should have seen Mayhem, she said as she helped us carry boxes out of the trailer. He was like a prince among men. By the end of the weekend, he had half the folks there eating out of the palm of his hand. Or, to be more precise, he was eating out of theirs. I slid Anna May's two boxes into the back seat of my truck to return to her the next day and grinned. I'm happy you had such a good time and won some cash to boot. She looked down and puckered her mouth. Yeah but I didn't feel right leaving when Ranger was missing, especially since it was my fault he was gone. Your fault? I thought Mayhem let everybody out. Gabby always felt personally responsible for his shenanigans, even though it only took one forgetful moment to give him a window. For example, the morning he'd let everybody out, Shelby had fed, but she must have forgotten to latch the extra clip on the gate. Before Mayhem had come to us, we'd always just looped a rope around the post, and that had been fine. Mayhem figured that out in the first two days he was there, so we'd had to start clipping it. He really did earn his name. Yeah, I know. But still, she said. But still, nothing. I've thought about installing a gate at the end of the drive, and should have done that the first time he opened the gates. I made her look at me. This is not your fault. Got it? Hunter was unhooking the trailer. Speaking of, has anybody heard anything else from whoever it is that left the note? She shook her head. Not a peep. Shelby went through all of Will's current patients, and none of the numbers start with 337. None of the farms around here have any idea who it may be either. I'll have Marissa run it in the newspaper tomorrow. Maybe whoever it is will see it. Marissa ran the Keyhole Lake Tribune, a weekly paper that featured local goings-on, along with an Ask Marissa column where people could ask advice about anything from their love lives to their health conditions. We'd gone to school together, though she'd been a couple years behind me, and she'd inherited the paper from her parents. The income from the trader that accompanied it made her a nice living, but she told me more than once that the advice column bored her to tears. I guess she could only phrase exercise more and leave his or her cheating ass so many ways. She'd probably put us on the front page to help us get the word out. We headed into the farm just as Shelby made it home. Hey, brat, I said as she pulled her hair out of her ponytail and grabbed a Coke out of the fridge. How'd work go? She flopped into the chair beside me and rolled her eyes. I have no idea how they do that, day in and day out. Just one weekend was enough to send me over the deep end. People are so whiny. There were a dozen times when I wanted to tell somebody we were a restaurant, not a frickin' soup kitchen. They find the dumbest things trying to get their meals free. Cheapskates. I smiled. Being the boss ain't all it's cracked up to be, huh? Not by a long shot, she said, taking a swig of her Coke. Max popped his head up from where he'd been napping and looked toward the front door. Incoming, he said, then plopped his head back down when an old Ford truck rattled up the driveway and stopped in front of the house. By the time a grizzled old man managed to open the door and climb out, we'd made it outside to greet him. He had a full head of snow-white hair and a face that spoke of years spent outdoors. A plump lady with smiling eyes and the soft-looking skin that comes with age 
climbed out the other side. Holding my hand out, I introduced myself, then Shelby and Hunter. Harry Stewart, and this here's my wife Stella. Mr. and Mrs. Stewart, I nodded. It's a pleasure. How can we help you? Actually, he said, I think we can help you. That is, if you own a big old red gelding. We do, I said. Please tell me you're the one who left us a note. He rubbed his ear. I did. But if you got the note, why didn't you call? Shelby reached into her pocket and pulled out a piece of paper torn from a pocket notebook. The whole bottom half of it was a blue smudge. Sorry about that. Our mailbox leaks, and by the time I got it, it had rained. Harry, Stella said, her brows drawn. If I told you once, I've told you a hundred times to get rid of that blue marker and use a pen, like grown-ups do. Even when she was scolding him, she looked too kind for it to be anything other than the mild sniping of a couple who'd been together for many years. His face pinked. Sorry about that. I guess I never gave no thought to what would happen if an it got wet. Well, we've caught each other now, and that's all that matters, I said. We have an escape artist here, and he amuses himself by letting himself and all his pasture buddies out every chance he gets, along with any other havoc he can reach. The old man's eyes twinkled. I used to have a critter just like him. Called him Trouble. Gabby, who must have heard us and was standing on the porch, said, Mine's name is Mayhem. You don't say. Harry glanced toward the barn, wistful. Would you mind showing him to me? Stella swatted him on the arm and gave him a pointed look. He cleared his throat. Oh, yeah, he said. She knows how distracted I get around critters. Really, it's no problem, Gabby said, and his face lit up. Stella's softened, and she shooed him toward the barn. Go on, then. Gabby grinned and motioned for him to follow, and the rest of us trailed behind. Ma'am's stall was at the end. We'd moved him from the left to the right a few months ago when we'd found a body in the left one, and none of us were quite up to messing with that just yet. Harry held his palm out flat so Ma'am could sniff him, then ran his hand across his nose and cheek, once the horse okayed it with a snuffle. The old man grinned like a kid in a candy store when Mayhem stretched his black and white face toward his pocket and started lipping him. You are a smart one, aren't you? Harry asked, fishing a sugar cube out of the pocket. He glanced at Gabby. May I? She laughed. If you don't, he'll figure out a way to come out and get it himself. Harry held his palm out with the sugar cube on it, and his smile was nostalgic as Ma'am lipped it off and crunched it up. We had a farm up in Kentucky for years. I worked as an exercise groom at one of the bigger tracks, but then I got old and just kept a handful at home and did a little training. Ma'am nuzzled his pocket. You want another one, boy? he asked, and when Ma'am nodded his head up and down, he laughed and hooked another cube out of his pocket. My mama got sick several years ago, and we had to move over to the other side of Keyhole Lake to take care of her. Had to sell the farm along with all my critters to pay for her treatments. It never leaves you, though. The horse fever. The sad, faraway look on his face as he rubbed Mayhem's crooked blaze made my heart hurt, and I moved to change the subject to something happier for him. So... Where did you find Ranger? Oh, is that his name? Stella asked. We've been calling him Red for lack of anything else. Ranger's the name he came with when we adopted him, Shelby said. Adopted? Harry asked. Yeah, I replied. We got him a little over a year ago. He was a rack of bones, and his feet were so bad he was almost crippled. Head shy, and you couldn't pick up his feet. Scared to death of a saddle. It was sad, 
and I haven't had the time to do much more than fatten him up and get him healthy. Things with horses like that, Harry said, is you gotta convince them it's their idea and just give them time. To answer your question, we went out Saturday night and he was grazing in our side pasture. We bought what you probably know as the old Svensson farm a few months back. Of course, ain't nothing now but a house and ten acres. Still got the barn, though it needs some work. Anyway, Stella said, rubbing my little mare's nose when she poked her head over her stall. We tried to catch him, but he wasn't having none of it, so we just pulled the gate shut and left him there. Then we started asking around, and the lady at the grocery store said he was likely yours. Wait, the Svensson farm? I remembered the place from when I was a kid. That's three or four miles from here. Harry dipped his head. It is. I was surprised when folks said to check here, and I found out how far away you were. He chuckled. No explaining, because he ain't talking. I smiled. No, he's not. I shifted my weight as I noted it was almost fully dark. I can hook the trailer up and come take him off your hands now. He held up a hand. No rush. If you want to wait till tomorrow, that's fine. He gave me a half smile. It's nice looking out and seeing a horse in the field again, and the pasture needs mowing. I glanced at Gabby and Shelby, who shrugged. No hassle at all, Stella said, motioning to Harry. He spent the day yesterday playing with him and stayed out of my hair so I could get some quilting done. I should pay you a babysitter fee. She smiled and looked at him, a tender smile that comes from a bond built from many years of going through the ups and downs together. Sides, he said. The way our place is situated, you have an easier time navigating your rig in the daytime. All right, then. Tomorrow it is. They stayed for some dessert. I'd brought home a death by chocolate cake one of the women at the party had given us, and he told us stories about his time spent exercising thoroughbreds. Before they left, we exchanged numbers in pen, and I told him I'd give him a call the next afternoon. It was a nice evening, and one I was grateful for, when everything hit the fan over the next couple days. Chapter 30 I spent half the night baking pastries, because Ray had gone through most of what I'd made up before I left, and I needed to take her a batch so she'd have something for the following day. When she'd first opened Brew For You, we'd both been straight out of college and broke. It only seemed logical to pair my pastries with her coffees. She's a Flynn witch too, but is an ace herbalist, a skill I was inept in at best. Ray used her magic to make special blends, much like most coffee houses do. She had ones for just about anything. Energy, happiness, Headaches, anxiety, even memory. She advertised them on a board, just like my other coffee place did. The only difference is that hers worked much better than most. As I settled into the rhythm of kneading and stirring and rolling, the magic flowed through me, soothing the tension of the last few days away. Though I didn't fall into bed until almost two, I was exhausted but happy. I lost a lot of the happy when my alarm went off three hours later. Ray opened at six, and in addition to wanting to get the pastries to her, I just wanted to see her. I'd missed her. I stumbled toward the bathroom about killing myself when I tripped over my shoes and rushed through getting ready. Twenty minutes later, I was headed toward town with several boxes of muffins, turnovers, and cinnamon rolls, craving a triple dose of her lively latte. It only took me 15 minutes or so to get there, so we still had almost half an hour before opening time, especially since it was Tuesday. Of course, being the early bird that she was, Ray was already there. 
She must have heard me pull up because as soon as I walked in the door, she took the boxes from me and shoved a cup of coffee into my hands. I took a huge whiff of it, and the magical scent of coffee and chocolate and whipped cream, the real stuff, swirled through my brain. I felt more awake already. She was smiling, but keeping her distance. We were total opposites when it came to the whole early morning thing. She hit the floor smiling and chipper, no matter what time it was. And I didn't do smiling or chipper, regardless of what time it was, until I'd had my coffee. I was kind of nice doing this, though, and my morning grumps passed faster than usual. Ray and I used to open up together a few times a week, back when she couldn't afford help and I couldn't afford not to work two jobs. Now we did it mostly just to give her staff a day off. She opened a box of pastries and pulled out two mixed berry turnovers and floated one to me. As it settled in front of me, she took a big bite of hers. Oh my gosh, she said around a mouthful. We ran out of these Saturday, and I didn't eat any the whole time you were gone because they're the biggest sellers. Man, I'm glad you're home, sweetie. I pulled off the corner of mine and popped it in my mouth, savoring the pastry as it melted on my tongue. If I didn't know better, I'd think you only love me for my pastries, I said, chasing the deliciousness with a drink of chocolatey caffeine. Both, she said. Now, tell me all about how you managed to trip into another murder. I swear, girl, you've had a year. Tell me about it. This one had nothing to do with me, though. I just happened to be there. I twirled my finger, and the pastry shuffled themselves into the pie case up front while I gave her the Reader's Digest version of the situation. But do they really think Earl could have done it? Shrugging, I said, I don't know. The sheriff over there seems fair, but when he called Hunter on our way home, he asked him to keep an eye on Earl and make sure he doesn't leave town. She humped. Like he's going anywhere. Between the restaurant and the family, he's about as likely to leave as the lake is. What about this Gregoria Stanton? I shook my head. I don't know. There's something squirrely about her for sure. I'd love to know what the connection is between her and Al Cassidy. There has to be one. You should have seen the way they were interacting. They didn't look like strangers to me. And what about all this recipe selling stuff? She popped the last bite of turnover into her mouth and folded her napkin. That's tripping everything up a little. Nobody knows for sure what to make of it, except... Everybody's certain it was more selling them. Rumor has it he took bribes, too. Except he didn't always follow through. Sometimes he took the money and didn't rig the competition. Wow, she said. The guy was asking for somebody to make him dead. That just ain't done. Even on the wrong side, a deal's a deal. Yeah, and they couldn't even complain to anybody. I glanced at the clock. It was six. I flicked the front sign to open and turned on the lights. Just as I suspected, nobody was waiting. You wouldn't think that would be surprising, but there was usually at least one or two regulars who liked their special blends waiting. Ray's coffee was just that good. The floodgates opened 20 minutes later, though, and we were swamped most of the morning. I fielded about a million variations of what happened at the competition, and I realized that explained the unusual Tuesday traffic. People wanted the first-hand scoop. Ray smiled and winked at me as Miss Schumacher, a little blue hair, just asked me straight up if they thought Earl up and killed that recipe-thieving crook that called himself a judge. Folks in our parts were loyal to him, and I had no doubt anybody who said that in front of her risked a solid poke with the umbrella she carried, rain or shine. By the time two rolled around, I was whipped and still had to go get Ranger. I texted Shelby to see if she wanted to go with me. She was still in school, but was just about out, and said she and Cody would meet me at the farm. 
I finished cleaning and restocking so the majority of the work would be done when Ray closed at four and then headed home. The kids were waiting for me when I got there, and we had the trailer hitched in no time. Had it been any other horse, I would have been tempted to toss a saddle in the back of the truck and ride him home, but it was Ranger. That wasn't an option. I was so distracted I almost passed their driveway, and would have if Shelby hadn't warned me, not just once, but three times. It was a sharp curve, and I barely had room to make the swing, then had to go slow because it was steep. Holy cow, Shelby said as we pulled down the drive. I wonder if the whole place is overgrown like this. She got her answer in just a few feet when the foliage opened up, and several acres of cleared and fenced land dotted with big oaks and marples sprawled before us. The place was nice, but in desperate need of some upkeep. I could see where somebody had replaced fence panels, and there was a big pile of brush and a clearing waiting, I suspected, to be turned into a bonfire. We pulled up in front of an old barn. It had seen better days, but looked to be structurally sound. Most of the problems were simple, just as broken latches and peeling paint. Harry was already in the pasture messing with Ranger. He was kneeling down, and the horse was watching him with a leery eye while he grazed. The curiosity was killing him, though, and he wandered over to Harry. I about fell out of the truck when the old guy stood up slowly and patted him on the muzzle, then slid his hand up to the halter. The Ranger I knew would have bolted the minute he reached his hand out to catch him. I'd learned the hard way. When we hopped out of the truck, he raised his hand to us, smiling, and clucked to Ranger to follow him. Like it was just natural as sunshine, the big red horse dropped his head and plodded along beside the old man. It was almost something out of a painting. Stella poked her head out the screen door on the side of the house. Hey, y'all, would you like some tea? Or I just made some fresh lemonade. That'd be great, Stella, I said. Lemonade for me. Come on inside before you load the horse up then. Too hot outside already to be sitting on the porch with no shade. She was right. My shirt was starting to stick to me. Without a doubt, spring was about to leave us in the dust, and summer was ready to settle over us in all its humid glory. The side door led straight into the kitchen, and though there was a strawberry pie sitting on the stove, the overhead fan was blowing cool air. I introduced Cody, then we moved to the kitchen table. So, I said, as we settled in, after Stella poured us a drink and joined us. It seems Ranger's taken a shine to you, Harry. I glanced at Shelby to see if her train of thought was in the same station as mine. She gave me a half-smile and nodded her head. This was such a no-brainer, we didn't even need to use our mental link. I don't know so much about that, but he's a good horse under it all. He just ain't got faith in people. Somebody's mishandled him bad, but he just needs some time. He'll come around. I cleared my throat and Shelby nodded, supporting me. The problem is... We don't have the time to mess with him. I feel bad, but Shelby works and goes to school, and I'm just a few months into starting a new business. Harry nodded. I remember those days. You got a million things you want to do, but the things you have to do just don't allow for it. Yeah, Shelby said, but that's not fair to Ranger. It's not like he's old and ready to put out to pasture. He's got a lot of good years left in him, and he shouldn't go through life scared of people. He needs work to keep him healthy, and he needs somebody to love on him. Cody was smiling. He hadn't picked up the look between Shell and me earlier, but I could see his mind was turning in the right direction. Harry considered for a minute. If you don't mind, I'd love to come up and work with him and mess with any of the other horses you want. It's not like I have much to do with my time other than pester poor Stella here to distraction. 
I was thinking more along the lines of you just keeping him here, I said, watching his face for a reaction. I was 99% sure it was something he'd want, but I didn't know all the circumstances and didn't want to push him into it if he didn't want to or couldn't. He kept his eyes on his tea glass and wiped a condensation drip off the side. Then his eyes became watery. Do you mean, like, permanent? Or just till I get him trained up again? Oh, no, I rushed to assure him. We mean for good. I've already got six others that don't always get the exercise they need. I think I've done what I was supposed to do, put some meat on him and got him healthy again. Now, I think it's time for him to go to somebody who has the time he needs to bring him back the rest of the way. He pulled a faded blue bandana out of his shirt pocket and dabbed at his eyes. I looked away, pretending not to notice. The silence stretched until Stella finally spoke up. Yes, she said. He'd love to have him. She reached across the table and put her hand on his. Wouldn't you, honey? He nodded his head, emphatic. Yes, yes, I would. He'll have a good home here. I grinned. If we didn't know that for a fact, we wouldn't have offered. Right, Shell? She beamed. Nope. And to be honest, it's a weight off my chest. Because when we got him, I swore I'd help bring him along. And it breaks my heart every time I bring him in or turn him out that I haven't. Stella smiled at all of us. See, honey, I told you things happen for a reason. It wasn't no accident. He wandered three miles into our pasture. He was just coming home. Chapter 31 When she put it that way, I teared up. We made arrangements for him to come and grab a saddle and some gear, and told them both they were welcome at the farm any time they wanted to stop by for a visit. I made a mental note to invite them to our next cookout. He was right about it being tricky to maneuver the trailer, but I managed to get it turned around, and the last I saw in the rear view, Stella was waving, and Harry was heading out to the pasture to play with his new horse. Y'all did a good thing here, Cody said. I'm proud of both of you. Though, I have to say, if you knew you were going to do it, why bring the trailer? I didn't know, I said. It just popped into my head when I saw him squatting there in the grass, patient as can be, just waiting for Ranger to come to him. Shelby laughed. I think we're going to have to get used to calling him Red now. I think it's already stuck. I can live with that, I said, smiling. Ranger wasn't a name I was particularly stuck on anyway. At least, not near as much as I'm attached to the idea of him having a home with somebody who will take care of him like he deserves. My butt was dragging by the time we got home. That three hours of sleep seemed long ago and far away, so I decided on a power nap until Hunter got off work. He and Ray were coming over that evening, and I groaned when I realized I hadn't told either her or Shelby about the whole slowing time thing. Shelby volunteered to feed, even though it was my turn, and I was surprised again by how much she'd matured since her Christmas incident. She'd always been a good kid, but we'd coddled her, and she'd grown spoiled. Her lesson had been hard learned, but she'd learned it, and gotten a magical mark from an angel on top of it. We still weren't sure what that meant, but she did put a serious magical beat down on somebody who'd tried to kill me a few months earlier. Now we'd added a new element with the time thing, and I got the feeling that we needed to know what it all meant. I shuffled to my room, and all of those worries disappeared into the other as soon as my head hit the pillow. The next thing I knew, Hunter was rubbing my back and telling me to wake up. It was still daylight out, so I couldn't have slept more than an hour, but my head was fuzzy from sleeping like the dead. 
And what time is it? I asked. About six. I would have let you sleep, but if you don't get up now, you'll never sleep tonight. The smell of pizza wafted to me. Tell me you brought ducks. He smiled. Of course I did. Where else would I get pizza? Ray's here, too. Ducks was the best pizza parlor in town. He used a brick oven, and the combination of crisp crust and real cheese was heaven. Throw on some ham, mushrooms, and pineapple, and you had the best pizza I'd ever eaten. Ray was setting out paper plates when I floated down the stairs, led by my nose. Just for clarification, I wasn't really floating, though if I ever developed the ability to fly, it would be the best gift ever. I'd have to join a gym at that point. Shelby and Cody had gone to a movie, so it was just the three of us, and I thought it was a good time to tell her about the whole time thing. After pouring myself and Ray a glass of wine and grabbing a beer for Hunter, I slid into my chair and pulled a slice of pizza from the box. They did the same. I did some checking on some things this afternoon, Ray said. What kind of things? I took a huge bite of pizza, getting a slice of ham, mushroom, and pineapple all at once. I was thinking about what we talked about this morning, how you said this Gregoria Stanton had to be connected to them somehow. So I started to do some digging. She paused to take a bite of the pizza before it got cold. Hunter swallowed. I thought the same thing. I tried to find some sort of connection between the two men, but all I can see is the same thing Blaine sees, the recipes. Right now, it seems that the only thing they have in common is they both must have bought recipes from the forum, a.k.a. the judge, and we can't even prove that. I scrunched my forehead. There has to be some connection somewhere. I mean, he didn't just up and stab himself in the back, and at this point, I'm thinking it probably wasn't Al either. What are the odds of having two murderers in the same spot at once? Ray lifted a shoulder. It wouldn't be the strangest thing to ever happen, but I agree, it'd be a stretch. So, did you find anything? I asked Ray when she didn't follow up right away. Oh, sorry. I did find that she and Mac Moore may have had a thing a few years back. I about choked on my pizza. She certainly hadn't looked like a woman who'd just run smack dab into her lover's, or ex-lover's, murder scene. Of course, I guess that could be different for everybody, but I'd still think she'd have been either laughing or crying. Maybe you should have led with that. What makes you think so? She wiped her fingers on her paper towel, then pulled out her phone and scrolled through her gallery. She handed the phone to me, and I scooted around so Hunter could see, too. The pics were a little grainy because they were from newspaper clippings, but there were three different competition PR photos that showed the judges and winners. In all three, the judge was standing with his arm around Gregoria, and they were both smiling. I raised my brows and looked at Hunter. Yeah, he said. That's much better than what I found. Yeah, but again... We're swinging at Gregoria, and we've already established that I shouldn't go to Sheriff Scottsdale with anything else about her that isn't concrete evidence. I mean, what if these pics turn out to be perfectly legitimate? Do you think this is enough yet? No, he shook his head. But I think it's enough that we need to do some digging on our own. Uh, what paper did that come from, Ray? I assume you got the dates and all that stuff? Sure did, she said. I have it all written on a note in my phone, but those were all taken three summers ago. If you scroll through again, I'm sure you'll recognize our very own Bobby Sue's in one of them. It was during our 4th of July cook-off that year. Chapter 32 I had to go to my shop the next day, if for no other reason than to check on Errol and his pet rat, Norman. Errol was the former owner of my building and was now using it as his post-life hangout, which was okay with me. He was great company, and Norman, who'd turned up unexpectedly a few months ago, was even starting to grow on me. When we'd taken down his killer, we'd gotten quite a few of his possessions back, one of which was a big-screen smart TV, 
he'd asked me to hang it in the shop because he loved the cooking shows and had a thing for reality TV. Coralie had been in charge of keeping the channels changed for him and feeding the rat since my shop was right next door to hers. I called to Errol as I pushed through the front door but got no answer. The TV was on, but he wasn't watching it. I stepped back outside and headed over to the clip and curl, Coralie's beauty parlor. Sure enough, there he was, hanging out with Belle, the shop's resident ghost. She and Errol had that in common. They were both carrying on in their former establishments, though my place was a sandwich shop when he owned it. Watching them debate style was hilarious. Belle was a small-town southern gal, circa 1940s, and Errol was a modern Dockers and Deck Shoes gay guy. So to say some of their opinions of style differed was an understatement, though, strangely enough, they usually agreed on the classics. Currently, they were arguing over a girl sitting in Coralie's chair getting a haircut. Errol had his chin in his hand, resting his elbow on the arm crossed over his chest. Belle was scowling. Bangs would make that nose even more pronounced, and there's never a case for short bangs. She humphed. Them things are hideous. Reminds me of when I was five and my sister cut my hair for me. Errol rolled his eyes. You need to step into this century, or at least the last couple decades of the last one. Short bangs are great if you have the face. He motioned to the girl in the seat, and she has the face. Belle scrubbed her hand over her face. I just... You're the sandwich man. I wouldn't tell you how to make that special sauce you made for them bologna sandwiches, would I? No, but if you offered an idea to improve my original version, I'd surely give it a shot. If looks could kill, he'd be heading for his second death. I'm sure he didn't mean to hi-hat her, but she was sure taking it that way. I cleared my throat before she went for his. Coralie gave me an oh-thank-God look I couldn't imagine how stressful it must be to try to work while also ignoring two ghosts who were sniping at each other and at me, while the person in the chair had no idea what was going on. I'd have indigestion by ten every morning. The girl in the chair smiled and waved, and I said hello. Personally, I didn't think bangs would look that hot on her, but then I didn't really like them on anybody. I wouldn't voice an opinion one way or the other for love nor money, though. Another thing Belle and Errol had in common was that they could hold a grudge. No thank you. Errol finally caught on to the dark looks Belle was firing at him. I think I'll just go see what's on Food Network, he muttered, before floating through the wall between our buildings. Yeah, Belle said. I think that's a good idea. Maybe you'll learn something about how nobody should wear bangs. Now you're just being difficult, he said. She just crossed her arms and humped as he popped out of sight. So, what you doing today, sugar? Belle asked me, as if nothing had happened. It's good to see you. Welcome home. Well, there was no way I was going to tell her I was only there looking for Errol. And since I couldn't speak directly to her because of the clueless girl in the chair, I kept my gaze on her and said, Hey, ladies. I just figured I'd stop in to say hi and to see if Elise had time to squeeze me in for a pedicure. Elise, Coralie's nail girl, popped out of the back. I sure do, sweetie. Let me finish up my lunch and I'll be right out. Take your time, I called as she pulled her head back into their break room. Have a seat, Coralie said. Tell us all about the craft show you went to this weekend. The way she smiled and referred to it as a craft show rather than the barbecue competition or fair let me know that she wanted to hear about how I did, but that the good stories weren't for public consumption. That was a hard and fast rule. What happened in Keyhole Lake, or to Keyhole folks, stayed in Keyhole Lake, no talking dirt in front of strangers. 
So I told her all about it, and then mentioned I'd stopped at TJ and Moira's on the way back. She raised a brow at that and said to remind her that she had something for her. I wasn't positive, but I was pretty sure that was code for, I heard something about them, too. Of course, with Coralie, it could just as easily be that she picked her up a birthday present. I'd stopped trying to guess what was going through her head years ago. Within just a few minutes, Elise came out and flipped on the pedicure well, adding a few drops of sweet, floral-scented oil to the water. It wasn't long before the relaxing smell had permeated the room, and she patted the seat, motioning for me to climb up. I slid my feet into the tub and sighed. I hadn't intended to do anything other than say hi and see if Errol was there, but I was glad I'd changed gears. The tension drained from me as the eddies of water massaged my feet. There was just something about even a mini spa day that was good for the soul. Coralie finished up the girl's haircut, sands, bangs, and sold her a couple products before ushering her out the front door. The echo from the bell above it still hung in the air as she spun toward me and settled into her barber chair. Good, I have the next hour free. We need to powwow. What did you learn about the suspects? I closed my eyes and leaned back in the chair, then told her everything we'd learned. Make no mistake, Cora Lee was head of Keyhole Lake's gossip community, but that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. She had connections and could ferret out information faster than a Google search, depending on what you needed. So, the main suspects right now are all barbecue competitors, she said. That makes sense except for one thing. It's too broad. I could see a man giving him a beat down, but killing him seems a little, well, overkill. Elise snapped her gum, earning her a glare from Coralie. She cringed. Sorry. It was one of the few things that drove the older woman batty, and in one quick gulp, the gum was gone. How many times do I have to tell you not to do that? Coralie asked, drawing her brows together. You're gonna glue your intestines together. I don't think that's really a thing, I said, before I could stop myself. Yeah? Well, since you're thinking, put it to use. Tell me more about this Gregorian woman and why you think it was her. Elise was massaging the arch of my foot, and I would have paid a hundred dollars to be able to relax and forget about the murder and everything that went with it just long enough to get through the next fifteen minutes in peace. But that wasn't to be. Resistance was futile. Well, the first time I ran into her was at the murder. She seemed cold, I guess. Then I saw her giving Al the what for, and based on what Max heard, she threatened him to boot. Then Max and I both saw the flash of yellow close enough to the murder scene to, at the very least, open the possibility to her being there. There wasn't another bright yellow anything at the barbecue. I checked. I groaned when Elise wrapped my foot in a towel, indicating the good part of the pedicure was over. And that's it, she said, as she dried my toes and stuffed the little styrofoam separators between them. Oh, I almost forgot. Rayanne found pictures of them getting cozy at a few different barbecue competitions a couple years ago. Aha, Coralie said. Now we're getting somewhere. Scorned women will have left a bloody trail through history. I arched a brow at the drama, but couldn't deny that she was right. That was at least as viable as a man killing him for money. And no offense, Elise said, but stabbing him in the back is something I'd think a woman would be more likely to do. I may be way off, but it seems to me a man would do it face to face, especially a man like Earl. Yeah, I said, thinking about the comment Hunter had made in passing. And she's the right height. The sheriff told Hunter that the killer was likely a man because of the height and angle of the wound. Approximate height would be about 5'11", 
That's about how tall I'd guess she is. Good Lord, Elise said. The woman was that tall and wore bright yellow? Yeah, I said, holding up a hand. And she has orangey-yellow hair and junk in the trunk. Coralie heaved a big breath, and I knew what was about to come out of her mouth, but she snapped it shut. I'm not even going to say it. Just keep digging, and I'll ask around. See what I can learn. Buddy's sister lives in Coatesville, so maybe she knows them. Thank you. I almost forgot. Uh, What did the reporter want? Was he looking for dirt on Earl, or what? Coralie giggled. He may have been in the beginning, but he started by asking me to tell him what I knew about Earl. By the time I made it through when he got his front baby tooth knocked out when he fell out of a tire swing, he was ready to leave. I couldn't help it. I burst out laughing. Never let it be said, there wasn't more than one way to skin a cat. Proverbially speaking, of course. I love cats. Uh, You said you had something for TJ, I said. Oh, Coralie replied, waving her hand. I just wanted to give you a gift certificate for a salon day. I know it's her birthday, and I've heard she's been having some trouble settling in over there, too. Yeah, she is, I said. She touched on it briefly, but I don't know what's really going on. Elise finished painting my toes, and by then, the whole murder conversation was exhausted. I told her about Ranger, and she was a little surprised. I hadn't heard anybody moved into the old Svensson place. I grinned. It wasn't often I got one over on her. Well, don't feel too bad. They're older, and they seem relatively low-key, but I get a great vibe from them. I hope to see more of them. Next time you see the missus, you tell her to come in for a free girly day. Hair, mani-pedi, the works. I feel bad I ain't rolled out the welcome mat for him yet. I'll do that, I told her, thinking how much Stella would enjoy that. She seemed like one of those women who was a giver, but rarely took the time to take anything for herself. Both of them did, for that matter. And Noel, she said on my way out the door. I turned with my hand on the door. Yeah? Gum really will glue your intestines shut. My mouth twitched. Noted. Chapter 33 I headed back over to my shop, thinking about the effects of gum on your insides, and almost dropped my bag on Norman. He was on the counter, pilfering a marble out of my pen holder. Hey, big guy, I said as he looked up at me with his bright little eyes. I swear he was trying to smile at me, sitting there holding the round piece of blue glass in his paws. He'd been Errol's pet before the murder, and had managed to survive for almost a year on his own before we discovered him a couple months ago. He'd scared the daylights out of me one night by rushing up against my legs, and I'd almost taken a broom to him before Errol stopped me. Since then, he'd managed to change my opinion about some rats. I still wasn't a fan of the ones that managed to get in the dark bottoms of my feed barrels in the barn, but Norm was okay. I pulled a cheese cracker out of a box I had on a shelf and offered him one, laughing when he looked back and forth between the cracker and the marble. It was a quandary for him, for sure. Give me the marble and take the cracker. I'll make sure it doesn't roll away while you eat, and you can have it back when you're finished. He dropped the marble in my hand and took the cracker. Errol was watching Pickers on TV, one of the inspirations behind my shop. No, look at this, he said. The guys were in a large barn surrounded by great furniture, But since that wasn't really their thing, the camera panned over it to get the cars in the background. I tried to take a closer look at the furniture in the background, but had no clue what he was talking about. What? I asked. Have you ever considered making something for a man cave using the bench seats out of old cars? I bet those would sell like hotcakes. I considered it. Huh, you may be onto something there. 
I'll keep an eye out, and if I come across any, I'll try to work out the technicalities to see if I could make it work. You could, and I'm telling you, they'd sell. You know what else would be funny? Making some kind of clothes rack out of exercise by candle bars. That'd be a hoot. Rolling my eyes, I just kept walking to the back, where I had several different pieces and various stages of completion. I hadn't been in any hurry because I'd finally built up a little surplus, but since I sold everything at the craft show, I was going to have to get cracking again. My stomach growled as I was pulling out the sander to get to work on a set of old school desks that I planned to refurbish and sell as they were intended. Desks to put in a kid's room for them to do homework at. I figured I'd paint them funky colors and maybe do something fancy with the top, then lacquer over it. But first, food. Since it was Tuesday, that meant Ray had chicken Waldorf sandwiches on special, and that sounded like the perfect light cool meal after five days of heavy barbecue and junk food. I was pretty sure I'd gained a couple pounds over the weekend. Her shop was only a few blocks down from mine, so I figured I'd go grab a couple sandwiches and go have lunch with Hunter. I'd pick up some pastries for Peggy Sue, too. On paper, she was the clerk for the KLPD, but in reality, she was the cog that kept the entire county running. She had her fingers in pretty much every pie over there, and there wasn't a question you could ask that she couldn't find the answer to. Most of the time, she didn't even have to look. She'd taken good care of me right after Hank was killed, and I was about to lose the farm to taxes, and again when I bought the shop, and the only way I could repay her was in pastry. Lucky for me, she considered that a good trade. The day was beautiful, not too hot yet, and I decided to walk. Hey, guys, I told Errol and Norman, I'm going down to Ray's, then to the courthouse, I'll be back in a bit. Errol took a glance at the time. Sure, it's not like you're running a business or anything. He was a stickler for keeping strict business hours, and it drove him nuts that I came and went as I pleased. To appease him, I'd bought one of those be back by signs for the door, and I made a big deal of setting the hands for an hour later. I locked the door behind me and reminded myself to take Coralie something for watching the place for me while I was gone. She'd changed the channels for Errol and made sure Norman had food and water, so I figured I'd make her one of her favorites, strawberry cupcakes, when I got back. There was a nice kitchen area left from when Errol ran the place, and it served me well when I wanted to bake and work at the same time. The sun on my face felt great as I strolled down the sidewalk and I smiled when a familiar voice called my name. Hey, Noel, what's doing? Angus, one of the best-hearted people I'd ever known, floated along in front of me, holding hands with his lifelong love, Trouble. In life, Angus had been known to prefer a liquid lunch, and breakfast and dinner for that matter, and he kept the benches warm in the park. I'm not saying he was the town drunk because he was way too kind and community-oriented for me to ever be that mean. Trouble had been his first love, but he'd lost her when they were young. She'd found him again after he'd passed, and it had turned his post-life around. I felt sad that they'd both waited a lifetime, literally, to find each other again, but he said everything worked out the way it was supposed to. He was happy as a pig in a puddle, so I took his word for it. Hey, Angus. Trouble. Have you two been? Haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, he said. We did a little traveling to celebrate finding each other again. Decided to take a tour of the world and visit the most haunted places on earth. Trouble, wearing her standard cutoffs and tie-dyed t-shirt, snorted causing the daisy she had tucked behind her ear to wobble. Three-quarters of the places weren't all haunted, and most of the ones that were had downright snobs living there. All Victorian manners and stuffy airs. The castles were cool, though. And we gotta spend time catching up. It had been fifty years, you know, Angus said, giving her hand a squeeze. 
Trouble and Angus were proof positive that true love did indeed exist, at least for some people. You heading to Ray Ann's? she asked. We just came from there. That new girl she hired a few months ago. Lavana? I asked. Yeah, yeah, her, she said. She's kind of an odd duck, ain't she? Did you talk to her? I asked. I hadn't realized the ghosts had decided to come out to her yet. No, of course not, Angus said. We don't know her from Adam. That's part of the problem. Nobody does. She said she just got to town right before Christmas, I told them, and she's never been anything but nice as far as I've seen. Ray says she busts her butt. Yeah, Trouble said, unconvinced. But something's just not right. She shook her head. No, that's not necessarily the right word. Angus said, I just feel like there's more to her than what she lets on. Considering she's new and hasn't really made any friends yet, I'm sure there is, I said. Give her a chance. I'm sure she'll settle right in. You'll see. I reckon, Angus said, as they floated on down the sidewalk. Anyway, have a good one. It was great to see you. You too. Y'all, pop out to the farm later this week. We're having a cookout. In trouble. I'm going to try to get together a girls' night tomorrow night. She scrunched her forehead. I thought those were Mondays. They are, but I was out of town till late in the afternoon and everybody else was busy. Oh, okay. Well, I'll pop in on one of you tomorrow and see. Will Sherry Lynn be there? The two of them had become kind of tight, and I was glad to see it. Sherry had had nobody when she'd been alive, and Trouble hadn't had any girl company since she'd died, so it was nice to see them bonding. I'd lay money on it. She hasn't missed one yet. I was smiling as I pushed my way through the door into Brew. Chapter 34 Lavana was wiping down a table when I came in and smiled when she saw me. I didn't understand what the fuss was about. She had always been wonderful to me. She was a little quiet, and even I had to admit she acted sort of odd the day she was hired, but since then, she'd been open and kind. I'd watched her interact with the customers, and she always went out of her way to make things easy for them, especially the older ones. Coralie had tried to get me to use my mental mojo, as she called it, to take a peek and learn more about her, but I'd refused. The poor woman had turned into an itch Coralie couldn't scratch, and I felt bad for her. Hello, Noelle. I understand you did well at the fair this weekend, she said. Her speech patterns were refined. She wasn't Southern, but I couldn't place where exactly she was from. Sometimes I almost caught a hint of Irish, or maybe Scottish, in her voice, but it was so faint that it whisked away before I could place it. I did, thank you. I sold almost everything I took, and so did Anna Mae. That's wonderful, she said, her smile fading. It's a pity the time was marred with a murder, especially one in which Earl may be implicated. It is. I said, I just wish they'd hurry up and figure it out so that we can put it behind us. Did you, perchance, read any of the suspects? My head swiveled to her. Pardon? Her face flushed, and she concentrated on scrubbing a sticky spot off the table. I simply meant, did you meet anybody you suspected more than others? You know, intuition. I had a feeling that wasn't what she meant at all, but for the life of me, I couldn't pick up a hint of deception or ill will from her. I did, but I didn't get the chance to talk to her myself. I only saw her from a distance. She was the one running the fair and made it to the body right after we did. Pity, she said. It may have been helpful had you spoken with her. I'd thought the same thing myself, so I just nodded in agreement. Is Rayanne around? 
She's in her office settling the till, she said. Noel? Yes? I know people are curious about my origins, and truly, there's nothing to hide. It's just, it's my story to tell, and it's somewhat convoluted and painful. My heart went out to her. As long as you aren't out to cause harm to me or mine, and you're not wanted for some horrible crime somewhere, then your story is your business, sugar. You tell it when you want, or not. She gave me a small smile. Thank you. I nodded and went behind the counter to make myself a latte, then poked my head in to say hi to Ray. She looked up from her laptop and smiled. Hey, I thought you'd be hard at work building more masterpieces. Yeah, that didn't work out quite like I thought it would. I ended up getting a pedicure instead. She laughed. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. I assume you got the third degree while you were there. Of course, but she's going to check around and see what she can find out. Buddy's sister lives over there. That's good, then. If she knows half as much about Coatesville as Coralie does about Keyhole, then the murder should be solved by dinner. For real. I'm grabbing a couple sandwiches and some pastries and heading over to have lunch with Hunter. Want to put together a girls' night for tomorrow? She nodded emphatically. Yes, I could use some time out. Since you were gone all weekend, I worked, except for Sunday. I spent the day with Mama. Speaking of family time, we've got to get together and figure out the whole time thing. Maybe this evening? I'll let you know. I'm not sure what Shelby's got planned. I paused. Uh, let's invite Lavana to go with us tomorrow night. She raised a shoulder. Okay, that's fine with me. I think it would do her good to get out and meet some people. Me too. Talk to you later. I grabbed the sandwiches and pastries and waved to Lavana, who was taking care of a young couple sitting at a high top. As I headed back toward the courthouse, I sifted through everything I knew— and realized I still didn't know anything. Chapter 35 My boots echoed off the marble floors as I made my way across the grand entryway of the courthouse. The sheriff's office headquarters was in the back of the building, and I couldn't help but look around every time I went through it. Our founding fathers had built that puppy to last— and I had no doubt it'd still be standing long after the rest of us were gone. Peggy Sue was sitting at her desk reviewing a stack of papers when I walked through the door to their offices. She glanced up at me over her readers, her blue eyes sparkling when she saw me. Noel, sweetie, how are you? How was the fair? She quirked her mouth a little, besides another crooked official getting stuck like the pig he was. Peggy Sue had worked under Hank for years because she had no choice. Keyhole was small, and she needed the money, the pension, and the insurance. But the deplorable deeds that Hank had ordered her to do on a regular basis almost killed her. She'd been miserable, and that had translated as mean to the rest of the world. Once Hank kicked it, she did a complete turnaround— and was now one of the most lovable people you could ever hope to meet. That didn't mean she didn't have an iron spine, though. She had no pity on anybody who twisted their power and used it to harm good people. Yeah, I said, pulling the door shut behind me. Besides that, it was good. I hated that Earl and Bobby Sue lost the final competitions, but I think for the most part we had a good time. I feel bad for the sheriff over there, though. It's about on par with Hank's murder, and if something don't give, he's not going to solve it. She cast me a sideways glance. What you got in the bag? I held it in front of me and shook it a little. Oh, you mean this? Just, you know, stuff. She flapped her hand at me. You go on, I'll sick the sheriff on you. Lordy, don't do that, I said, handing her the bag. I hear he's a bear when he wants to be. 
She gave a little snort as she looked at her haul. You got that right, sugar. He's a sweetheart the other 95% of the time, though, so I guess we'll keep him. Smiling, I said, I guess we will. For a little while, anyway. I motioned down the hall behind her. He's in his office? Oh, sure, sure, she said, waving me through. Go on back and make yourself at home, honey. You know the way. She held up a raspberry turnover she'd pulled from the back. And thank you. I held my hand up, walking backward toward Hunter's office while I talked. Hey, I told you I owed you a lifetime supply of pastries. That's the deal. You better hope you go before me, though, because Ray don't have the skills I do, and I'm passing all my debt to her. She laughed, and I turned just in time to see Hunter sitting at his desk, scrolling through something on his laptop. I pecked on his doorframe, and he glanced up, smiling. I held up the other bag I'd brought. He furrowed his brow. There better be a bear claw in there. I heard you giving away the goodies out there. Of course, there's a bear claw in there. And a Waldorf sandwich, too. He pushed his arms over his head and leaned back in a stretch. What say we take it outside and eat in the park? I've been staring at paperwork too long. That sounds awesome. What's so important you're going blind over it? My sanity, that's what, he said, pushing to his feet. Ned Neely and Bart Skidmore are fighting over their property line. I shrugged a shoulder. So? Shouldn't that be easy to figure? Just by having it surveyed? You'd think so, he sighed. But two different surveyors said two different things. And, of course, Bart paid for one, and Ned paid for the other. I scratched my head as he stacked the papers and shoved them back in a file. How far off were they? Six inches. You're kidding me, right? Oh, how I wish I were. He shook his head. It would seem that Ms. Neely and Ms. Skidmore had a problem in high school, namely Mr. Neely. Ms. Skidmore was apparently his girlfriend and Ms. Neely's best friend through most of their sophomore and junior years. Now it seems that nothing would make Ms. Neely happier than if Ms. Skidmore just killed over dead. But they're like 50, I said, waving goodbye to Peggy Sue as we passed her desk. And if it was such a problem, why are they living next to each other? Aha, he said, raising a finger in the air. I knew there was something special that attracted me to you. You seem to be one of the few logical people I've talked to today. Okay, I said. This sounds like the lead-in to a horrible joke, but why does six inches matter? Because that particular six inches will determine whether or not the greenhouse where Miss Skidmore grows her prize roses is on her side of the property or not, and we both know what's going to happen if they're not. We skipped down the courthouse steps and made our way to the same little pavilion Angus used to call home. I pulled his sandwich out and handed it to him. That takes ridiculous to a whole new level, I said. Isn't there something you can do to settle it? Yeah, he said. Request a redistrict of the county to trim a two-acre strip off the north side. Then all my problems would go away. He unwrapped a sandwich and took a bite. Or at least, my most irritating ones anyway. Good luck with that. I peeled off a piece of my crust and tossed it to a little bird waiting for us to drop something. How did your morning go? Did you get anything accomplished? I didn't hit a lick. Instead, I got a pedicure. I went to Coralie's looking for Errol and ended up having to stay to relay the whole story. And how did it go with the reporter? Well, he made the mistake of asking Coralie to tell him what she knew about Earl. He raised a brow at me. And? And she opted to start from birth. He honest to goodness threw back his head and laughed. Uh, if nothing else, she does know how to protect her own, and in a way that caused zero grounds to make him even more curious. That's some feat. I wouldn't argue with that. Coralie was no dummy. 
an inaccurate assumption people often made when dealing with her. Underneath that huge pile of 80s hair was a brain as sharp as a scalpel, and she wouldn't hesitate to cut you with it if you ended up on her bad side either. Did you hear anything from Sheriff Scottsdale? I asked, tossing the bird another crumb. Yeah, I did, he said. The gun used to kill Cassidy was a nine mil. So that takes Earl out of the running then, right? He has a forty-five. Yep, but Bobby Sue don't. Ah, oh, crap. I had forgotten about that. Chapter 36 So now what? I asked, worried that somebody was on the way to cart them both off to the Coatesville Iron Bar Hotel. So now I have to go collect her weapon, and he's sending somebody over to get it so they can test it, he said. That wasn't so bad. Bobby Sue wasn't unreasonable. And how long will that take? Two, maybe three days. Meanwhile, he's now asked me to keep them both in town. He tossed the last bit of his bread to the bird and reached into the bag for his bear claw. I waved him off when he offered me mine. For once in my life, I was sick of sweets and junk food. Instead, I pulled out an apple and took a big bite out of it. When are you going to Bobby Sue's? I asked. Does she carry it on her? I shook my head. Nope. She keeps it at home for target practice. He sighed. This would have been so much easier had we known about this before they left the campground then, he said. Why? Because they could have searched her and it wouldn't have been on her, he said, biting halfway through his pastry. True, but maybe she would have. I don't know if she takes it with her when she travels or not. My first guess would be not, but you never know. At any rate, he said, I called Earl already and he said it's at the house. They're both working but Bobby Sue's going to go get it in a bit, then I'm picking it up from her at the restaurant. My phone dinged with a text. It was Anna Mae asking if I'd brought her stuff with me. She had a wedding planner coming in later to look at the gowns. I fired a quick text back and told her I'd bring them right over. I have to take Anna Mae's stuff over to her. Are you coming over tonight? I'll cook Addie's spaghetti. And the garlic bread? I rolled my eyes. Of course, the garlic bread. You can't have one without the other. She'd come unglued. Plus, why would we? He laughed and pulled me in for a quick kiss, then headed back to the courthouse. I cut across the square toward Reimagined, waving at Coralie and Belle as they stared out the window, probably plotting who was going to win their stupid bet. The ladies kept some running side wagers on everything from when somebody was going to die to when the tree in Old Man Whitaker's yard was finally going to fall on his house because he was too cheap to have it cut down. That was the latest one I'd heard. They had one running on when Hunter and I would get hitched. From the hard hints I'd gotten from Addie and Belle, they were running on the assumption it was just a matter of when, not if. I shook my head. They were going to be waiting for a while yet. After I poked in and got the stink eye from Errol for cutting out again, I jumped in the truck and drove the couple blocks to Anna Mae's shop. She met me out front, swinging the back door open once I was stopped. Since she only had three bins of stuff left, she pulled out two of them and stacked them, leaving me to grab the last. When she moved, the sun slanted in and splashed across the floor mat, and something glinted up at me. It was the pretty little purple heart necklace. I looped it over my hand, then grabbed the last box and followed her inside. After heaving the box up on the counter, I held the necklace out to her. She scrunched her forehead. That little thing's getting to be a pain in my butt, she said. I'm all the time dropping it, or else it falls out of the case. Anna Mae wasn't particularly dingy, but she wasn't experienced with magic either. That was the third time the thing had shown itself to me, 
and I wanted to know why. Where'd you get it from? I asked, holding it up for a closer look. I found it in a box of costume jewelry at an auction on the other side of town. They were liquidating a little junk store over there because the owner had died. I picked up quite a bit of inventory that day. She tilted her head, watching as the pendant caught and prismed the light filtering in through the window. Keyhole Lake, our entire region for that matter, had more than its share of natural magic and some suspected we were on some kind of ley line or something. But that wasn't it. We just happened to settle here in greater concentration than in some other places. There were pockets of magical areas everywhere in the world, and most people never had a clue. Still, I wasn't a huge believer in coincidence, and had already gotten one magically messed with necklace from Anna Mae. You mind if I take it to have Camille look at it? I asked. Camille would be able to test it just to make sure everything was copacetic. Sure, sugar. Be my guest. I don't want anything carrying some kind of magical cooties on it in here. And even if it's fine, keep it. It matches your complexion and will look nice on you. I pushed a stray red curl off my forehead. Purple was my color and if the heart didn't want to kill me or suck out my magic or make all my toenails fall off, especially since I'd just gotten them painted, then I'd love to have it. Dropping it into my bag, I turned to go, but then remembered, girls' night. Since we didn't get to go out Monday, how about we do it tomorrow? I asked. She grinned. That sounds awesome. I missed everybody while we were gone. Maybe you can get TJ and Mora over here, too. Those girls are kind of growing on me. Yeah, me too, I said, pulling my keys out of my pocket. And we're inviting Lavana too. Anna Mae crinkled her nose. I don't know what to think of her. She seems nice, but there's something odd about her. I think she's just had a tough past. And besides, like you said, she seems nice. I pick up a bit of a strange vibe from her, but I don't sense a lick of bad. Let's pull her in. It's kind of what we do, right? She pinched her lips together and her cheeks pinked. You're right. I'm sorry. I was being mean, and she's done nothing to deserve it. Now I feel bad. Like Sherry Lynn, Anna May hadn't had the easiest of lives being hitched to Hank. She'd had her reasons for staying, but he'd kept her cut off from anybody who may have wanted to be her friend. And carrying his last name, those folks had been few and far between anyway. She knew what it felt like to be excluded, and being the softy she was, she would never willingly do it to someone else. Don't feel bad, I said nudging her with my hip. Let's just get to know her a little. Who knows? She may just be backwards and we'll love her once we get to know her. Then bring her along, she said, smiling. Lord knows we can always use one more friend in the group. There was the anime I loved. I just hoped I didn't blow so much smoke up her backside it was going to come out her ears. Chapter 37 in order to avoid the wrath of Errol, I went in and worked for a few hours, then looked online to find some estate sales for that weekend. I was low on everything, even signs, and I'd stocked up on those at an auction just a few weeks ago. Once I hit on the clock idea, they flew out the door. Shelby had stopped by to give Bobby Sue her keys back that afternoon after Hunter talked to her. Bobby Sue was upset and worried that even if neither of them were arrested, people would attach the shadow of the murder to the restaurant if it wasn't solved. The least I could do was look. I decided to dig for more pictures of barbecue competitions to see if I could find Gregoria getting cozy with the judge and any more of them, but came up empty. Then I googled just their names and hit pay dirt. There was a formal event in Georgia that showed them both dressed in formal attire, dining at a little cafe table, and they were most certainly not just colleagues in that one. His hand was on her knee, 
She was leaning into him, and the bubbly was flowing. Oh, and neither one of them were shaped like any sort of bird. The picture was several years old, 2008, and the caption read, One of the crown couples of the Atlanta food scene, Gregoria Stanton and Mac Moore, paint the town after an invite-only food tasting at the grand opening of the much-anticipated... I copied the link and sent it to Hunter's phone. I dug a little more, but didn't find much else. Of course, that particular one was sheer gold as far as I was concerned, so it didn't bother me much that nothing else turned up. While I was messing around, I decided to Google the two restaurants, Grillin' and Chillin' and Smokin' Hot, that ripped off the recipes. I was pretty good at wordplay, and those two guys hadn't seemed like the brightest bulbs on the string. Maybe there was a way I could match them to some of the names in the recipe thread in the forum. I don't know what good that would do, but I didn't have any other way to link the whole mess together, and it was driving me crazy. I banged my forehead on my desk when I realized most of the recipe seekers used generic names and numbers, BBQ345, Want Recipes, Help 12345, not helpful. Have you checked the restaurants themselves or done a search on the owners? Errol asked. Maybe you can find something that ties them together. Group events or sponsorships, maybe. I checked Smokin' Hot first. Sole proprietor, Jeff Akers. None of the faces stood out. Then I ran some searches for him and found him on Facebook. He had dozens of selfies with women, none of whom looked too pleased to have their faces forever linked to his in the land of social media. His page said he was single, and his motto was, So many ladies, so little time. What a tool. No wonder he was single. The second one, Grillin' and Chillin', had a little more meat on the bone, so to speak. I'd expected to find that Al, or arrogant jerk face number two, as I'd begun to think of him, owned it, like he said he did. But a Geraldine Cassidy was listed as a co-owner. I chewed on my lip and tapped my finger, thinking. The name didn't ring a bell. Al didn't even have a Facebook page, or if he did, it wasn't under that name. Neither did Geraldine, and there wasn't one for the restaurant either. That was weird, Almost everyone had a Facebook page. Shoot, Addie had one, and so did Aunt Beth. I looked through LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Nada. Zero social presence. I narrowed my eyes and thought. I got three hits on Geraldine. One lived in East Africa. One was a lady who looked to be about 90 and lived in Portland. And the other was local, but she was a tween, though... She was trying hard to hide it. I didn't even own as much makeup as that kid was wearing. Where was the parental guidance? After doing a quick check for reviews, hoping to find pictures or some kind of link, all I learned was that neither place rated more than three stars until a couple of months prior, when the recipes were sold. Several commented that the taste of the food had improved, but the meat was still poorly cooked. That was something, though. It was another link between them and the sale of the recipes. Folding my laptop closed, I sighed. Errol had been making suggestions as I went and was as discouraged as I was. It just doesn't make sense, he said. Even small businesses have some kind of social footprint. I mean, they have a handful of reviews, but look what happened when we pulled up Bobby Sue's. There were pages of info on the place. Even if the business doesn't create anything, the travel review sites do. I couldn't even go to McDonald's without my phone asking me to review it, which means the managers and staff names will likely be listed, eventually. Bam. Footprint. Not them, though. I lifted a shoulder. You're preaching to the choir. I don't get it either even though I'd only been open a few months, reimagined where the farm popped up when you googled my name. There's nothing else I can do tonight. I'm heading to the farm, but I gotta stop and get some groceries. You have plans tonight?
I asked. Yep, he said. There's a Master Chef marathon on. That's it. Norm and I are chilling and watching some cutthroat cooking. All righty then, I said, picking up the remote. I flipped it to the right channel and grabbed my bag. Lights on or off? Off, please. No need to waste the electric, and it puts a glare on the TV. I flipped them off and dug my keys from my purse. See you tomorrow. Night, sweetie. I locked up behind myself that time and thought to myself how crazy my life had gotten. I'd gone from serving at Bobby Sue's and having only a handful of people to call friends, almost all of whom were family, to owning a business and having more friends than I'd had in my entire life. Things were good in Noel land, except that two of the people closest to me were suspects in a double murder. Chapter 38 I stopped on the way home and grabbed the fixins for the spaghetti. Hunter had texted back that he'd forwarded the info to Sheriff Scottsdale. He also said he was running a little late because the Coatesville deputy still hadn't shown up to pick up Bobby Sue's gun. That worked because the fam was getting together for a little Flynn Witch's powwow, and it would be better if it was a closed event. Shelby was already there, and so were Ray and Aunt Beth. Ray had brought her box of herbs and was mixing some of her coffee blends while Addie and Aunt Beth hovered, Addie literally, over her, offering advice. She looked ready to poke them both in the eye. Ray smacked at Aunt Beth's hand when she tried to add an extra pinch of something. Stop! If I add any more ginseng, they'll be bouncing off the walls and won't be able to focus. Besides, it messes with the flavor of the coffee. Huffing in frustration, she scraped the ingredients into a baggie, then tossed it in the box along with the rest of her ingredients and shoved the lid on it. Hey, ladies. I said, lifting the plastic grocery bags and plopping them down on the counter. Ready for some spaghetti? Yes, Shelby said, jumping up from the table. Let me help. You're just trying to avoid the conversation, Beth said. Shelby tapped the end of her nose. Ding, ding. Nailed it in one. I do not need love advice. And if you remember, we had the talk when I was twelve. I'm good. Besides, I'm 17. Cody and I are good. This isn't the 70s. We're both going to college before we move on to the whole settling down part of life. Addie scowled at her. We just want what's best for you. And I appreciate it. No, pass me the tomatoes. I smiled as I handed the bag of Romas to her. She'd come a long way since her snow globe experience, and I was proud of the woman she was becoming. I felt a little bad because being the baby came with some baggage, namely two overprotective, bossy aunts who still saw her as a child rather than a young woman. For that matter, Ray and I still defaulted to that sometimes, too. Ray joined us, and in a few minutes, the wonderful smell of roasting onions and garlic permeated the kitchen. Shell finished chopping the tomatoes and tossed them into the skillet, and in no time at all, the sauce was bubbling. Shelby had put the rolls in the warm oven to quick-proof before I'd gotten home, and all there was left to do was talk. I refilled everybody's tea, then took a seat at the table. I glanced back and forth between Addie and Aunt Beth, and both looked as nervous as long-tailed cats in a room full of rocking chairs. Okay, ladies, it's time to spill. What's going on? First, you need to know that we never thought any of this would happen. We just figured the three of you would grow up and be normal. We knew you'd have strong magic, but... Didn't expect it to be anything extraordinary, Aunt Beth said. But, Ray said, so far she hadn't gained anything new. But she came from the same bloodline as we did and had plenty of mojo, even though none of us tended to overuse it. We liked being average, for the most part. But Flynn witches are different, Addie said. 
back in the day, before the council was formed and became the ruling power, it was us. At least in this part of the world. We've always had extraordinary gifts, way back to the beginning of time. She took a deep breath, then continued. Our parents helped create the council and were happy to hand over the reins. Times had changed, and witches, most witches, just wanted to live ordinary lives. We made the decision when y'all were born that we were going to raise you away from all the politics, so we withdrew from the everyday functioning of the council. Things were starting to make a little more sense. The council tended to steer clear of us, with the exception of Shelby. She'd had problems with her magic when she was young. She hadn't come into her gifts like the rest of us had, and her control was practically non-existent, at least until she'd hit her head the summer before. After that, she was right as rain, except she had some problem adapting to having all that power dumped on her at once. Okay, then. Obviously something went wrong somewhere with that plan, Shelby said. My powers were blocked, and you, she motioned to Aunt Beth, had some kind of a run-in that took most of your power away. Aunt Beth dipped her head. There was a faction that didn't want to live under the council. They'd lived on the peripheral of the covens, but sometimes ran afoul of the rules. Rather than living in harmony with the rest of the planet, they wanted to take over from us. I cringed. That sounds like something you'd read in some kind of urban fantasy, post-apocalyptic book. Not something that happens in real life. Aunt Addie gave a small smile. It does, but that's exactly why the council was formed. First and foremost, 99% of us view ourselves as regular humans with a little extra oomph. They viewed themselves as above all that, though most of them had very little power. Maybe that's what the problem was. They already felt too normal and didn't want to lose what little identity they had. Who knows? Aunt Beth shrugged. Whatever their reasons, they decided to take over the council, but knew they couldn't do it all at once. We'd have crushed them. So, one night, after we'd had one of the final meetings, they came to my place. They knew they had to take out the Flins, because at that point, we still had the following of most of the East Coast witches. I was babysitting Shelby because Noel had a recital at school the next day. She paused and took a deep breath. Eight of them came and jumped me while I was out back hanging out laundry. Broad daylight and my back was turned. She was staring off with a small smile. Shelby was sitting in the basket playing with a kitten, and it was one of those beautiful spring days. Something hit me in the back. Then I was being attacked from all directions. She closed her eyes, and her face was pale. I managed to ward them off long enough to cast a bubble over the baby, but I must not have done it soon enough. The look on her face when she glanced at Shelby was agonized. It's the only explanation for why your powers were blocked. Their plan was to immobilize me, then kill me, then move on to Addie and your mom. The only thing they hadn't counted on, mainly because we kept it a secret, was that the three of us shared the same mental bond you three do. I called to them, and they came, but not before I was almost dead. Addie had been quiet for most of the telling, but Aunt Beth looked exhausted. When we got there, Beth was on unease, shielding Shelby. She was hamstrung because she was terrified to move away from her. After all, she was the next generation of Flynn's. Your mom had the rare power of teleportation. 
Ray rolled her eyes. You gotta be kidding me. Seriously. You guys realize how sci-fi this sounds, right? Scowling, Addie said, We do, but it was different times. It was the reason we wanted the council to begin with. Imagine, Olivia and crew. My arch enemy and overall bully and mean girl. With magic. When she explained it that way, it made more sense. Anyway, she continued, it didn't take us long to clean house once she got there, and we gathered the council and corralled the rest of their clan the next day. I wasn't sure I wanted to know what she meant by clean house, but I was so pissed at the thought of somebody attacking my family that I had to ask. Beth shook her head at the question. We didn't kill them because we didn't have to. That's what separates us from them, just like with all law enforcement. But we did strip their powers and kept a close eye on them. That's why we formed the Magical Oversight Committee. Shelby had been under their observation before she had access to her magic, unhindered. Erratic magic and teenage hormones were a terrible combination. I never completely recovered, Aunt Beth said, and we had no idea Shelby had been affected until her gifts didn't materialize when she was a preteen like they should have. The guilt in her gaze when she looked at Shelby made me mad. Don't you dare take what happened to her onto your shoulders, I said. She probably wouldn't be alive if it weren't for you. Shelby nodded in agreement. And besides, everything worked out. She held out her arms. I'm just fine. That's what I've told her for years, Addie grumbled. Aunt Beth gave us a half smile. Well, I do have to say that when everything righted itself when you hit your head, it was a huge load off my shoulders. I had a sudden thought. And Mama's death? Addie shook her head. Just a horrible accident. And before you ask, we have no idea why your dad left, but we do know it was planned. He left a note and the bank account information so we could access your college funds. The smell of rising bread and Italian seasonings jerked me out of my thoughts, and I jumped up to stir the sauce. So what does this have to do with our new gifts, Specifically, the time thing. Beth shrugged. That's a new one for us, at least in recent generations. But I suppose it's not surprising that it's cropped up. Your great, great... She shut one eye and tried to do the mental math. However many greats, grandmother had that. But she only used it once, and she didn't say what for. Just that if it ever popped up again that it should never be used. Well, I said, rolling my eyes. Thanks, Graham. That's helpful. Seriously, honey, we don't know what to tell you about it, other than to do your best to control it. Talk to Camille. Maybe the council has more information than we do. And what about me? Shelby asked. I mean, uh, a couple months ago, I broke bad in a big way when Tweedledum and Tweedlebimbo tried to kill Noel. Now that, we think, is a combination of Flynn power and a little angel magic. Uh, we don't know for sure what happened when she gave you that mark, but she said you were meant for great things. Beth shrugged. My guess? Time will tell. Addie turned to Ray. Don't be surprised if something pops up for you, too. She motioned toward Beth. Your dear old mama there was at least as powerful as the rest of us. She gave Beth a speculative look, but continued talking to Ray. Personally, I think she still has at least some of her mojo, but she's drowning it in guilt. Hunter pulled up right then, but that was okay. The story was told, 
and I was ready to step back into reality and out of the Flynn Witches of Lore world. I did feel bad for Aunt Beth, though. He clomped across the porch, followed by Matt and Max. The sound of the screen door slapping shut broke the spell, and things were back to normal. We ate ourselves into a food coma, then watched some TV and went to bed. Just another day in the Flynn household. Chapter 39 I had lots to think about the next day. Namely, how to not stop time and cause world wars or zombie apocalypses. But the more I thought about it, the more frustrated I became. By the end of the day, I was ready for a girl's night. Our regular haunt was called Fancy's, a little dive bar on the outskirts of town. They had ten-dollar buckets of cold beer for us and a handful of other regulars. Everybody else paid by the beer because she said it kept the riffraff out and the best wings in town. And the owner slash bartender, Mary Beth, knew how to run a bar. The bucket stayed full and the pool tables were level. As usual, Ray and I met at the farm and Sherry Lynn joined in to help with my wardrobe choices. This time, though, she brought trouble along. That was actually helpful, because while they debated what I should wear, I got to choose for myself. Sherry Lynn had been an exotic dancer pre-death, and Trouble was a 70s hippie, so there was a huge difference of opinion. By the time we got to Fancy's, our friend Camille was already there. So was Bobby Sue. They had a bucket on the table already, and just a few minutes after we sat down, Lavana poked her head in looking around for us, then stepping inside like she wasn't sure she should be there. She looked around as if she'd never been in a bar before, and when we offered her a beer, she fumbled for a minute getting it open. When she took a drink of it, though, she grinned. This is good. Bobby Sue cast her a sideways glance. What? You ain't never had a beer before? Lavana blushed a bit. I have... But where I'm from, it was rarely cold. And where, pray tell, is that, so that I know never to go there? Bobby Sue asked. Lavana surprised us by laughing. Trust me, you don't ever have to worry about that. She didn't elaborate, but I thought back to our earlier conversation and decided to let it slide. The rest of the table must have decided to leave it be, too, because Sherry Lynn changed the subject. Do you think Olivia and her band of nasty misfits will show up? The last time I'd run into Olivia and her backup crew, I'd popped one of them in the nose for saying something bad about Ray. I hope not. I'm not in the mood for her BS tonight. It's been a hell of a week, and the last thing I need is her whiny butt pushing my buttons. Camille smiled and glanced at Bobby Sue. Yeah, besides, I hear we've already had one cat fight this week. Bobby snorted. Shoot, that weren't no cat fight. I poked her in the nose and didn't even put much oomph behind it. Besides, anybody goes around calling themselves cookie and running their mouth like that should be used to taking a punch. What did this person do? Lavana asked. She implied Earl was a murderer, I said, leaning forward to grab another beer from the bucket. The first one had gone down a little too easily, so I decided to baby the next one. When I pulled it out of the bucket, Lavana, who was sitting across from me, gasped. What? I asked. Her gaze was fixed on my throat. May I ask where you got that necklace? I reached up to finger it and was a little surprised to feel that it was warm to the touch. Oh, Anna May gave it to me. Eyes wide, she reached out to touch it. And do you know, perchance, where she procured it? It almost felt as if the necklace was reaching toward her, too. The chain became a little tight on the back of my neck. 
The hair on my nape stood up, and I leaned back. Camille, I noticed, was watching. Her eyes narrowed. At a junk shop that went out of business, I said, wary. Want to tell us why you're so interested? Camille asked. And why it seems to be reacting to you? She sighed and sat back, and I could see the struggle going on in her head. Sherry Lynn and Trouble were both scowling, though they'd had to remain quiet because Lavana hadn't been clued in to the existence of our living-impaired population. Lavana heaved a sigh. I hadn't planned for it to come out this way. Planned for what to come out? Bobby Sue asked, leaning forward with her elbows on the table. So help me. If you've been lying to me, I'm not only going to fire you, I'm going to open up a can of whoop-ass on you like you ain't seen before. I haven't lied, per se, she said, peeling the label off her bottle. I just haven't been as forthcoming as I'd have liked. She glanced around at us, her expression a mix of fear and something akin to pleading. Do you remember the day I filled out my employment packet and Shelby said I looked familiar? I nodded. It was one of the reasons I'd been so curious about her past. Shelby was an ace when it came to faces. Well, the reason I looked so familiar to her is because she'd seen me before. Somewhere else. The label was off the bottle, and she was folding it in neat squares. Spit it out, Bobby Sue said. I'm losing my patience. Me too, Camille said. Sherry Lynn started to speak up, but Trouble put her hand on her arm and shook her head. Lavana tipped one corner of her mouth up. There's no reason to hush her, Trouble. I can see you both, and it's hurt me over the last few months that you've been forced to hide when I could have spoken up and included you. She looked at us again, imploring. Just understand, society was much different before I re-entered it, and I didn't want to put myself or my husband in jeopardy. I cocked a brow, and she continued. The reason I look familiar to Shelby is because I was in the snow globe with her. When she cast the spell to get herself and her love out, we grabbed on— out of sheer desperation. We'd been in there for almost 200 years. I flopped back in my chair, floored. Of all the explanations I was expecting, that one wasn't even on the list. Camille didn't miss a beat, though. And how did you get in there to begin with? My family had been discovered. They were coming for us. The conversation we'd had with Addie and Beth popped into my head. Things had been much different back then. You're a witch. I am, though not nearly as powerful as you are. My aunt was teaching my younger sister some rudimentary spells in a field not far from our home. Some locals were out hunting and saw them. By the time my aunt realized they had been discovered, the riders who were prominent members of the church, were already upon them. She was staring at a point somewhere over my shoulder, her gaze unfocused and far away. As I said, my family had little power, and in her terror, she couldn't summon magic to defend herself. They took her and my little sister away. My mother began slinging provisions into a sack so that we could run, and... I grabbed my snow globe, a gift from my aunt, and remember thinking how safe it looked in there and how Rory, my intended, would never know what happened to me. She looked around the table, meeting each of our eyes in turn. The next thing I know, we were in the snow globe, skating. She shuddered. If I never see another set of skates, it will be too soon. And... The necklace? I asked. My mother's, she replied, passed down from daughter to daughter. Sherry Lynn sniffed. 
That's one of the saddest stories I've ever heard. Yeah, Ray said. And it also explains how you clean the shop up so fast. She gave a little smile. I said my power wasn't as strong as yours. I didn't say I didn't have any, and I deplore sweeping and mopping. I had to laugh a little at that. I always used a little hocus-pocus myself when it was time to do that. Though none of us were sure what to think, Camille was especially suspicious. You know I'm going to have to test you, right? Camille's gifts, or at least the two that served her in her position as head of the Magical Oversight Committee, were mind magic and truth detection. It was a powerful combination because it was nearly impossible to get one over on her, and I suspect she was a little miffed that somebody had. I have no problem with that, she said. You may do it this evening, if you wish. Then when we leave here, we're going straight to the council and get it out of the way. No offense, but I'm not comfortable having an unknown quantity wandering around. Wait, Rayanne said. I've never seen you with a man. He's not still stuck in the globe. Her eyes got wide as realization hit her. Or in the void, is he? No, Lavana said, but it's sweet that you thought of him. He's obtained employment with a local building company, Wheeler Construction, though he would love to learn to work on cars. We have yet to learn to drive. I raised my brows. He worked with Matt. Is he magical? I had to ask, because though it was rare, it happened. Her laugh was low and ladylike. No, he's not. She cast a quick glance at Camille. Though I'm sure he'd be willing to undergo testing as well. Camille examined her, thinking, He can come with us. I'll decide once I meet him. She took a deep breath and looked at me. Would you be willing to return my mother's necklace to me? She asked, then rushed to add, I, I would, of course, pay you for it. I shook my head. As soon as Camille clears you, it's all yours. It belongs to you, and it wouldn't be right to charge you for it. Trouble floated toward us. I have a question about that, though. Knowing what little I know about magic and jewelry, how did the necklace follow you here? Lavana shrugged. I don't know. I have no knowledge of what became of my family. I did hear Shelby mention that she was given the snow globe as a gift, and it had been procured from a junk shop by the previous owner. So, perhaps the necklace and the globe were found together in a box somewhere. Your guess is as good as mine. I reached for a third beer. Though I'd been determined to stop at two, it was turning into a three-drink kind of night. Chapter 40 I was at the shop the next morning, stripping a piece of furniture, when Hunter called. I didn't get my gloves peeled off in time to answer it, so I washed up and called him back. What's up? I sent that picture of Gregoria Stanton and Mac Moore to Blaine Scottsdale yesterday as soon as you sent it to me, and he just got back to me. Because of the way the sheriff had brushed me off the last time I tried to bring Gregoria into the picture, I was almost afraid to hear how he'd responded. What did he say? He said he'd followed up on it, and it seems it ended badly and publicly. He's running a check on her now to see what else he can find. He's also making some calls to the newspaper in Atlanta to see if the columnist still works there. Maybe they know what caused the split and if there were any lingering hard feelings. Isn't he questioning Gregoria herself? It seemed that would be the logical place to start. He sighed. It seems she's disappeared. Disappeared? As in, flew the coop or missing? I was a little pissed that Earl was under the eagle eye of the law, so to speak, but she'd slipped under the radar without so much as a by-your-leave. 
He's not sure. At least, she lives in Coatesville. She moved there a few years ago from Atlanta, and from what he's learned so far, she'd been a food critic up there. But something happened. The judge's name was thrown around, but nobody seems to know the details. That doesn't explain why she'd kill Al Cassidy, though, I said. Not yet it doesn't, but we're working on it. I told him I'd help him research. It made me feel better that there was at least one other person in the crosshairs now, besides Bobby Sue and Earl, but I didn't like that she'd disappeared. It set off my internal alarm system. What are you doing for dinner? I asked. We're just having leftover spaghetti, but you're welcome. He laughed. I didn't bother waiting for an invite. I was just planning on showing up and eating. That had pretty much become the norm, but being polite and issuing the invitation was a hard habit to break. I didn't ever want there to be a miscommunication because I skipped it. Things were comfortable for us, and I liked that we weren't rushing into things just because everybody expected us to have the house, the picket fence, and 2.5 kids within the next 20 minutes. There was no rush as far as we were concerned. I finished up the cabinet I was stripping and was surprised when I realized it was almost four. Deciding I was at a good stopping point, I called it a day and cleaned up. I'd ridden the bike to work and hoped to catch some wind on the way home. I was just turning the channel to lifetime for Errol when my phone beeped with an incoming text from Earl. It seemed Bobby, Sue, and Justin had left over an hour before but hadn't let him know they made it home. Their truck had been acting a little squirrely, but he hadn't had a chance to look at it since they'd gotten home. He couldn't leave because the restaurant was slammed, but he was starting to worry. That feeling I'd gotten earlier when Hunter had told me Gregoria Stanton was on the loose crept back, and icy fingers of dread crawled down my spine. I told him I was leaving right then and would text him as soon as I got there. My next call was to Hunter. Though I had magic on my side, it didn't stop a bullet, and I didn't have eyes in the back of my head. As luck would have it, it went straight to voicemail, so I left him a message, then texted him because I knew he'd get that immediately. The feeling of dread was spreading fast, so I jumped in the truck and pointed it in the direction of Bobby Sue's, moving faster than I should have. The drive that usually took 20 minutes only took me 15, and when I pulled into the drive, I caught a glimpse through the trees of a newer model car sitting beside her truck. The hairs on my arms stood up, and I stopped the truck before I was visible to the house. I'd rather have her laugh at me for sneaking around when she was just bullshitting with a visiting neighbor than give Gregoria Stanton a heads up that I was there. Since my senses were screaming at me, I was putting my money on the latter scenario. Sneaking around to the back of the house, I peered in the windows, but neither she nor Justin were anywhere to be seen. Something pelted me hard on the leg, and I about jumped out of my skin. I looked down to see a small round stone in the grass a few feet from me and rubbed the welt on my leg. Psst! Noel! Over here. Justin's whisper shout reached me from somewhere off to the right, where there was a small outbuilding. I saw him peeking out a small window at me, just the top of his head and his eyes visible. I held up a finger telling him to wait, then put it to my lips. I motioned for him to get back down, then made my way to the end of the house, where I'd have the best chance of making it to the building without being seen. Once inside, I hunkered down next to him. He had a pile of decent-sized stones piled in front of him and was clutching his brand-new slingshot, the one Bobby Sue had said he couldn't have, like it was a lifeline. You're okay, I said. I am, but Bobby Sue's not, he hissed, scowling. We gotta go in and get her. I pulled out my phone and called Hunter. He still didn't pick up. So I sent another text, this time a 911 one. Then I actually called 911, 
because most of the time it routed through to his office. Justin was pulling on me. Come on, we don't have time for that. The woman has a gun, he said, panicking. He was out the door and running across the yard, taking the same path that I had. Making a split-second decision, I stuffed the phone in my back pocket, leaving the line open, then followed him. He was already flattened against the house by the time I made it to him when a voice called out. I know you're out there. Come inside, slowly, or I'll kill her now. Chapter 41 I shot him a look that said I was going to kill him myself if we made it through this alive, then stood and put my hands in the air. Fortunately, she hadn't gotten the drop on me, so I had that going for me, anyway. I closed my eyes and tried to crawl into her head. I met a solid wall. Nice try, she said but Mama taught me how to keep people out of my head before I was 15. Now, do as I say. I have a plane to catch. Go back to the building, I said, handing him my phone. Get a hold of Hunter, or Earl, or anybody. I shoved him back away from the wall, but a bullet zinged out the window, and I managed to divert it just before it nailed him in the leg. I closed my eyes and gave a mental shout-out to Shelby and Ray, explaining the situation in a combination of pictures and words, rather than taking the precious time to verbalize the entire thing. We're on our way, Ray Ann said. She must have already been at the farm. Leaving the middle door cracked a little, I pulled Justin in close to the house and kept my body between him and the window as we made our way to the back door. I slid the door open, and the first thing I saw was Bobby Sue tied to a chair with a lump on her forehead that was starting to turn purple. Yeah, the voice said. I owed her a good punch. I looked up and was surprised to find the girl Cookie something or other that Bobby Sue had punched at the fair, rather than Gregoria Stanton. But... My mind was worrying, trying to put the pieces together. I came up blank. Let me introduce myself, she said. Geraldine, Cookie, Babcock, Cassidy. Most people call me Cookie. That's not what I call you, Bobby Sue muttered, staring daggers at her. Geraldine, Cassidy. I remembered the name for my internet search. So you're married to Al. I saw your name listed as co-owner of the restaurant. I don't get it. Why'd you kill him? For that matter, why'd you kill the judge? She looked at me with disgust. I didn't kill Al. He was my husband. She motioned toward Bobby Sue with the gun. She? killed Al. A friend at the sheriff's office called and told me she did, so now I'm going to kill her. I wanted to the day she hit me when I was trying to set her up. No, I said, trying to think of a way out. She didn't kill Al. Her gun came back clean from ballistics. Considering me for a minute, she said, You're lying. I was. As far as I knew, the test results weren't back yet, but I wasn't going to tell her that. I had the same, if not better, mental walls that she did, and there was no way she was picking anything out of my brain. I'm not. I'm telling the God's honest truth. She didn't kill him. But my question is this. Why'd you kill the judge? She flapped her hand, waving the gun. He'd just taken five grand from Al a week before to throw the contest, then told me he was going to renege. She took a deep breath and shook her head. I told Al it was a bad idea to begin with, but he went behind my back with my idiot brother and did it anyway. 
I glanced at Justin out of the corner of my eye and motioned for him to stay back. I hadn't hatched a solid plan yet, but I was working on it. So he was going to rip you off? I asked, just to keep her talking. Yeah, and he was going to report the recipe scam to boot. Said he was going straight because he wasn't going to lose his judge card for some no-name hacks. She spat the phrase. Honestly, she said, flipping her hair over her shoulder. I didn't go there planning to kill him. I just wanted our money back and I had to wait for almost an hour until he was done playing footsie with the Staten woman. She shuddered. But he called Al a wannabe loser, she said, her eyes going cold, and laughed when I told him I wanted our money back. Then he turned his back on me and started to walk out. His final shot, as he was putting on that god-awful hat, was good luck losing. She curled her nose. It shot through me, and I picked up the closest thing, the fork, and stabbed him with it before I even realized what I was doing. He made it out of the tent before he collapsed on his fat, ugly face, and I started screaming. So you were screaming because you realized what you'd done rather than because you'd found the body? What an idiot. Even if the murder didn't earn her a lifetime in prison, being stupid should have. Yeah, not my finest moment, she said. But when you and your men came rushing around the corner, I made do. She glanced at a cheesy, fake gold watch on her wrist. Now, like I said, I got a plane to catch. And thanks to her, I'm catching it with just my big stupid brother instead of with my husband, like it should be. Ah, that's how the two restaurants tied together. Her first comment about a brother had slipped past me, but it finally clicked into place. Jeff's your brother? She rolled her eyes. It's about time you caught up. Yes, Jeff's my brother. And he's waiting for me, though I should leave him here. The whole stupid recipe thing was his idea to begin with, but I'm not leaving till she pays for what she did. She pivoted the gun toward Bobby Sue, and I could tell she was done talking. I lunged toward her with all my focus on stopping her, but she'd already fired. Then time stood still. Sort of. She was frozen in place, a look of rage and triumph on her face. Bobby Sue had her eyes squeezed closed, and a look of horror on Justin's face, his little mouth open in a scream, terrified me. Just like before, I hadn't stopped time, just slowed it way down. The bullet was still moving toward Bobby Sue, and I grabbed it, not sure what would happen, but positive I'd rather take one through the hand than see Bobby take one to the face. It burned my hand and I let go, then swatted it, changing the trajectory so that it would go several feet to her left. I didn't know how long I had or if time would speed itself back up, so I did the bare minimum. I took the gun from Cookie and pushed her back to the floor. It felt like I was moving her through mud, but I managed then looked around and grabbed Justin's earbuds off the table and tied her hands behind her back. Even they offered resistance as I moved them. Right before I unfroze everything, I remembered her comment about learning to block her mind and decided it was best to gag and blindfold her so she couldn't use any magic if she had any. Once that was done, I closed my eyes and focused on fixing time. Everything whooshed forward as if I'd never slowed it, except now she was on the ground and Bobby Sue was safe. I untied Bobby, and all the while, Cookie was squealing in rage. Bobby Sue took the gun from me. For a minute, I was honestly afraid she was going to shoot her. She rolled her eyes at me and clonked Cookie on the head, knocking her out. Good God, she said. I wasn't going to kill her. 
but wasn't that driving you batty? It was official. There was nothing on the face of the planet that could rattle the woman. Justin was clinging to her and crying, and she bent down and pulled him to her. Hush now, she said, pushing him back a bit and wiping the tears off his cheeks. I ain't killed, and I ain't planning on dying any time soon. He threw his arms around her neck for a few seconds, then pushed back and wiped his nose on his sleeve. I ain't crying, he said. Course you are she replied, wiping a tear from her own cheek. It happens sometimes when you love someone and there ain't nothing wrong with it. Just then, Hunter poked his head around the door, gun drawn. Once he saw everything was okay, he reholstered it and slipped behind Cookie to cuff her while Bobby Sue explained. Though I have no idea what happened at the end, she finished. One minute, she was pointing the gun at me. The next, she was tied up on the ground. Hunter smiled at me. I assume that was you? You assume correctly, I said, dipping my head. As the adrenaline seeped from my system, my legs felt like rubber, and I sat down in the chair Bobby Sue had been tied to. I replayed the events of the last half hour in my head, trying to make sense of everything. The whole mess started and ended with greed. The judge was ripping people off on both ends, stealing and selling secret recipes, though nobody was sure how he'd even gotten his pudgy little nose pickers on all of them to begin with. Then, when he got wind he was going to lose his card, or maybe when he reconnected with Gregoria and decided to go straight, he wasn't willing to give up the last bit of cash he'd collected. A near certain way to get yourself dead, or at least beaten good and proper where we came from. I wondered what Gregoria had been talking about in the conversation Max heard. Maybe she really was innocent. If so, I was way off. But then who killed Al? All I knew was that it wasn't Bobby Sue, and I'd keep digging till I proved it. Hunter had had a deputy follow him, so he stuffed Cookie in the back of the cruiser. She was still groggy. Then it occurred to me that Camille probably needed to be brought in on this, too, just in case the woman really did have magic. I made the call, then Bobby Sue poured us both a glass of wine. Ray and Shelby had made it, and Addie, Belle, and Sherry Lynn were hovering and clucking over us. Bobby Sue had enough of that in about five minutes flat. If and y'all want to hear the story, that's fine. Zip it and we'll tell it, each from our own angles. She took a second to make eye contact all around. But if and you're just gonna fuss and tell us all what we should have done when there ain't no change in it anyway, then there's the door. She fisted her hands on her hips and pointed. Blessed silence fell, and I said, Okay then, Bobby, you go first. Hunter came back inside in time for most of hers and stayed through until Justin and I had given our versions, taking notes as he went. By the time we had all the pieces put together, I felt like I'd run a marathon and just wanted to go home. Bobby must have felt the same way, because she emptied her wine glass and said, Y'all stay as long as you want, but I'm whipped. I'm taking Justin, and we're going to go see Earl. She'd texted him as soon as it was all said and done, and told him not to come because she was fine and the restaurant was slammed. I was shocked to see they actually video chatted, but I'd lay dollars to donuts he wouldn't have stayed there if he hadn't been able to see for himself that she and Justin were okay. Everybody had come in their own vehicles, so that's how we left, but Hunter pulled me into his arms once they'd cleared out. You gotta stop scaring me like this woman, he said into my hair. I didn't know what to say to that, so I just hugged him back, glad that I was still there to do it, and that he was hugging me because he was relieved, and not because we were mourning 
a friend. Epilogue Earl and Bobby Sue closed up shop the next day, and we had a huge cookout at the farm. Louise and her husband Jared came with the baby and her parents, and of course, Gabby, Matt, and Anna Mae were there. Lavana and Rory came. She'd passed the testing with flying colors, and Camille showed up a bit later, after processing Cookie and stripping her of her magic. Hunter had her locked up in the Keyhole Lake Jail until Sheriff Scottsdale could come get her. He caught Gregoria Stanton at the airport, after finding a nine mil at her house. She killed Al, thinking he was the one who killed the judge. Apparently, they'd rekindled their romance. Hunter explained everything while we were sitting around waiting for the food to cook, and when he was done, Bobby Sue shook her head and laughed. What's so funny, he asked. You almost ended up next on the list. Still grinning, she said, I'm just thinking back to the first time we met, and you said this town was crazy. Just think how messed up it'd be if you'd moved one county over either direction. You'd have real nut jobs over there. My gaze roamed over the lines of his face, and I was glad he'd made the choice he had. And speaking of choices, I considered what reaction my interference with time might have caused, then pushed it from my head. There was nothing I could do about it, and I wouldn't change it even if I could. A son had a mother, and a murderer was in jail. I could live with those results. I kicked my chair back on two legs and propped my feet on the rail, looking around at our growing family and enjoying the warm rays of the sun on my face. Earl and Max were sipping scotch and playing porch chess on a giant set I'd had made just for him, while Angus hovered over the board, giving unsolicited advice to both sides. Shelby and Cody were teaching Justin how to play cornhole out back. Matt and Anna Mae were laughing at some story Rory was telling. He was the talkative one of the two. And Bobby Sue, Trouble, Addie, and Sherry Lynn were cooing over the baby, while Louise and Jared were taking a much-needed break, petting the horses over the fence. Ray, who was sitting in a chair next to me, offered a toast. To a dead, body less summer, she said, clinking her tea glass to mine. Hunter heard her and joined in. Here, here, he said. One could always hope, I supposed. For the moment, though, I was happy to have everyone there, happy, healthy, and enjoying each other. It was a good day to be me. This has been Murder and Marinade, written by Tegan Marr, narrated by Merritt North. Copyright 2019 by Tegan Marr. Production copyright 2019 by Tegan Marr. Follow along with Noel and Friends with Hook, Line, and Murder, Book 6 in the Witches of Keyhole Lake series.